Okay, I believe I'm ready to go. Okay, then I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 11th, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll car call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. You'll only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speaker sign ups will be allowed, so please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up and speak and download the Zoom application as needed. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. Okay. Can we have roll call, please? Council member Fair? Here. Council member Silverstein? Present. Council member Yuri? Councilmember Yurin, you're muted. Um, Not anymore. I'm here. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Here. Mayor Pearson? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now have the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. Of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the republic, republic for, which for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you all. Can we have approval of the agenda, please? I move to approve the agenda. Yeah, Bruce. So I have a point of order and then I have an issue about the agenda as well. Uh, I want to begin by apologizing in advance for what are going to be a number of housekeeping objections I'll be making tonight, but I'm compelled to do this because this is because the way the city council meetings are run violates applicable law, city council resolutions, city council policies. We hope we'll get these wrinkles ironed out tonight. We won't need to continue to raise them in future meetings. First one I want to raise, and this is the only thing I'll raise before the agenda, is the Zoom protocol. When city council meetings were conducted at City Hall prior to the pandemic, the protocol for public participation was the speaker would stand at the podium and be shown on the video screen. The speaker would speak for up to eight minutes. Other people attending the meeting were willing to contribute time. City manager and city attorney sat at the dais in view of the public throughout the meeting. Since the Zoom meetings began, public speakers have not been shown on the screen. Public speakers have been limited to three minutes without any right to receive additional minutes from others. City manager and city attorney turn the camera on and off as they please throughout the meeting. There's no technological reason for these changes. I've confirmed that with the city's technological person. City councils never approved these changes, much less determined them in the first instance. Not only should speakers be permitted to be seen when making public comments, they should be required to be seen when making public comments. There should be the ability of speakers to obtain contributed minutes, and the city manager and city attorney should be on camera all the same time as the city council members are on camera. I inquired about these changes of the city manager and she arrogantly, recalcitrantly, and insubordinately refused to provide anything that remotely constitutes a responsive answer. Alex, can you please put up email, Zoom email number one? Yeah, give us one second. Okay. 
Hang on, Paul. Can we, we can't get to. All right, I will. First. First read it. All right, okay. so, so I am. Uh, Bruce, what's the file you, name on that? Um, it's not labeled as Zoom email hold, one. Hold on. Point of order one, Zoom protocol initial request. Would it be more appropriate to do this during your comments? Well, this is a point of order. I think it's appropriate to do it before the meeting starts because it affects the way the meeting is being conducted. Okay, is it is it a long email or what do we got? No, I'm only gonna, it's got two highlighted paragraphs and there are two other emails. Look, I'll cut through it. But I, I think that I think the public and you and the members of council should see this. I asked specifically of the city manager, how did this begin? Who did it? How was it approved by city council? And the response I got was, it was decided when this issue began, when Zoom began to do it this way. I asked, who decided? I have never received an answer. It's been disregarded, ignored. So who did decide that the public was not going to be able to be seen? Who decided that they cannot have minutes as they do when we meet live? And who decided that the city manager and the city attorney can bounce from the screen whenever they choose through the meeting? Can we bring this back as an item? I'd like to understand how that happened. Well, I don't know that this is the form. It's not agendized. I mean, it's a fair question, um, but I think we should get agendized so there's time to prepare a staff report and you know do a little research. I know why some city, I don't know the answer. I mean, I know why some cities don't because they've had people bomb them and it's been all over the press and been embarrassing. But I, I don't, I think it'd be great if we could get answers. Did you make so. the decision, sir? Are you talking to me? My, Mikey, yes. the, this item isn't on the agenda, so there can't be any discussion about it. If you want to see if there's consensus to add it to a future agenda, you can discuss it then, but you can't discuss it because it is not on the agenda. Right. I think it'd be appropriate to bring back as an item, um, Bruce. Can so You'll have to get council consensus on that, Mikey. Take I, understand. I understand. I um, understand. I don't know if I'm frozen or you're frozen. Am I frozen? No. No? You're not frozen to me, Bruce. I see you, I think. Wait, move. Uh-oh, I think he's frozen. Bruce? Bruce? Hello? Uh-oh. Did we just lose him? Oh, no, wait. He's over there. Come back in, maybe. He's popping up in a different place. I don't see him, though. Well, Paul had a question. Want to move to him so we get oh, back? Okay. Oh, wait, but he's frozen. Oh, wait, are you unfrozen? Um, okay. Uh, Paul, in the meantime, you had a you had a my point, question point of was, order, maybe. My, yes, it was a point of order about the point of order, and basically it wasn't agendized, and it sounds like something that should be agendized. Okay. Uh, I think Bruce Chris is are you back, Bruce. Bruce? Oh, yes. Who is that? Was that John? I'm here. Yeah, Mayor Chris Nagreaves. Um, we have Councilmember Silstein back. Okay, good. I'm here. Okay, good. Again, this is not an item that was on the agenda tonight. The city staff is happy to bring this back. With regard to the comment about why city managers and city attorneys are leaving. I can't answer that. You'll see my smiling face throughout the meeting tonight. So again, this is not an agendized item that should be brought back at the appropriate time after staff is able to research the issues and bring it back. Is there consensus to bring this item back? Yes. Okay, I think there's consensus, Bruce. I assume you're voting for it. <laughs> Working on getting a better connection. Oh, okay. Well, the, we have consensus to bring the item back. Did you hear that, Bruce? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Steve? Uh, just one motion for the agenda item. Uh, I'd like to propose that we combine items 7D and 7F uh, when we get to that issue. Uh, and the reason I'm proposing that is those 
when you look at both of those those items, uh, in some areas they appear to conflict with one another. In other areas, there are good ideas on both ends. And I think the most effective way to go through that is to hear them both at the same time so we can sort of decide those items that are going to be most effective and get those on our plate and get those moving forward. And some of the ones where there may be a conflict, we can sort of discuss that and see if we can smooth that out. But I think doing them separately is going to make that much more difficult job. So I'd just like to see them combined when we get to those items. And 7B and 7F? 7D and 7F. And I don't know if we can combine items uh, on the fly. Um, it's an interesting point. Um, yes, yeah, Spruce? Again, I'm sorry I'm going to do this. This is not going to be a frequent occurrence. But are we are we on approval of the agenda? Because I missed We're the trying to get approval of the agenda, yes. We are in approval of so the agenda. So I have a number of objections to the agenda. I believe the agenda violates City Council Resolution number 98-083 for a number of reasons. And I'd like to and I'd like to present them. May I? Um, okay. Um, Article 5, Section B of City Council Resolution 9883-83, the city manager is responsible for placing items on the agenda that are properly submitted by council members, and the city manager also is responsible for placing on the agenda other items, quote, submitted by city staff, consultants, or recommendations from city commissions, boards, or committees, unless otherwise specifically directed by a majority of the city council at a public meeting. I've said this before, and I will say it again. The city manager is arbitrary and capricious in her compliance with her responsibility to place items on the agenda. And I will now explain the city manager also have prepared the agenda in direct violation of city council resolution number 98-083 and city council resolution 99-007. I hope the city attorney has them. First, the boilerplate provision appearing at the end of the agenda includes a statement that city council items are items which individual members of the city council may bring up for action to propose future agenda items or to suggest future staff assignments. No new items will be taken up after 1030 without a two thirds vote of the city council. I cannot find the source of that restriction if it exists. Second, Article 6, Section A of the City Council Resolution 9907 establishes an order of items on the agenda. It's an, it's an order this council set. It provides that ordinances and public hearings shall be placed on the agenda following the consent calendar and prior to old business. Item 70 is a proposal to amend the no camping ordinance. Pursuant to Article 6, Section A of the City Council Resolution 99-007, that proposal should be item 4B. That's how the proposed ordinance to prevent trespass in areas of high fire danger was handled on October 14, 2019. For those who don't recall that ordinance, it was adopted to prevent unhoused individuals from living in areas where they might start a wildfire when cooking or otherwise unlawfully using a fire in public. It's how proposed urgency ordinance to require face coverings was handled on September 14. It is how the proposed ordinary ordinance to require face covering was handled on October 12. It is how the proposed ordinance amending signage statute was handled on September 14. It is how the proposed ordinance establishing an eviction moratorium was handled on April 13. It is how the proposed ordinance requiring locking bins was handled on March 9. It's been brought to my attention that council agenda report for the proposal to amend the no camping ordinance does not expressly call for a hearing in advance of the city council's proposed action and that there was no notice of public hearing. In that connection, I note there was no such notice in connection with the city council's consideration and adoption of the ordinance to prevent trespass in areas of high fire danger on October 14, the ordinance to require face coverings on October 12, or the ordinance to suspend evictions on April 13. Moreover, if it is the case that a notice of public hearing was required for the proposal to amend the no camping ordinance, it was the responsibility of the city manager to ensure that a notice of public hearing was promulgated. She doesn't get a pass from doing so simply because she's opposed the proposed ordinance. To the contrary, if a notice of public hearing was required, the city manager was malfeasant in failing to see that occurred. Either way, however, item 7E should be item 4B. 
if that's pursuant to city council resolution 99-007, Article 6, Section A. Third, under the heading of placement of items on a city council meeting agenda, Article 6, Section B of city council. You're, you're muted, Bruce. Bruce. Bruce, you're muted. I, I see that. I didn't do okay. that, but it's back. Okay. Under resolution 99-083 states, quote, all items to be placed on a city council meeting agenda must be submitted to the city manager not later than 12 days preceding the city council meeting. 12 days prior to today was December 30. According to the council agenda reports, item 3B3 and 3B9 were submitted on January 5. Item 6A was submitted on January 9. Accordingly, each of those items, which is included on the agenda, is in violation of City Council Resolution 9893. Also, there's no indication of when item 3B2 was submitted, so it can't be ascertained whether the item was timely submitted. Fourth, there's nothing in City Council Resolution 9883 that authorizes the city manager to place her own items on the agenda, much less items she creates the final business day prior to the meeting which was Friday. This is another reason that item 6A is improperly on the agenda. If item 6A remains on the agenda, it must be combined with items 7D and 7F because the three items are inextricably intertwined. Indeed, whether or not item 6A is combined with item 7E, item 7, if 7A, 6A remains on the agenda, I'll have no choice but to go through the entirety of the report for 7F in order to explain my position on 6A. Fifth, and this is the last one, neither item 7C nor item 7D was submitted by Mayor Pearson of City Count. I'm sorry, they, they weren't, neither of those two items were submitted in compliance with the requirements of City Council Resolution 9883. As such, neither of the items was properly included in the agenda by the city manager, and they certainly should not have been placed prior to the properly submitted items that the city manager improperly placed last on the agenda. Now we can do this the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is simply to combine 7C and 7A, which are two parts of the same whole, and have them presented together before any action is taken on either, and also combine 7D and 7F for the same reason. If we do that, I'll withdraw my objections to items 7C and 7D being on the agenda at all, as I have no desire to cut off discussion on those items just to make sure that the discussion of items does not cut off, the discussion of those items doesn't cut off discussion of items 7A and 7F because of time. Now the hard way is for me to go through the labor, laborious explanation of why items 7C and 7D are not properly on the agenda in the first place and have been placed in the wrong position even if either of them is properly on the agenda. Then call for a formal vote on those objections. I'm prepared to do it either way. I'd much rather do it the easy way which involves waiving my objections to these items being on the agenda at all. So before I speak about the reasons why 7C and 7D are improperly on the agenda at all, I wonder if we can get consensus on combining 7C and 7E and combining 7D and 7F, and also to the extent 6A stays on the agenda, which it shouldn't, combining that with 7D and 7F. If not, I'm gonna to have to go through the reasons why they're not properly on the agenda at all. That was a, a lot to digest. Um, I heard all your words. Um, I can tell you 7C is an item I wanted on the agenda way more than a month ago. It's not recent by any means. Um, so I'm not sure what the objection is to that. It's a pretty simple item, very quick item. Um, I agree there's a lot of crossover with certain items. I'm not sure I agree on 6A that there's crossover with other items. It's, uh, I mean, really to untangle everything you just said, we'd probably have to recuse and, and, and really get into it. You threw out a lot of stuff very quickly. Um, and I get that you were prepared for that, but it would have been nice if in advance we'd known some of this so we could have taken a look at it. It's a little hard to look about, at. It. I can't speak about these issues. Brown Act requires me not to bring these issues up to you before the meeting. If an item's improperly on the agenda, I don't know if that's a Brown Act violation. It's certainly something you bring up with the city attorney. 
Agreed. It is something that we can address before the meeting. It's difficult to go through the entirety of this resolution at, at present. I would note that the uh, order of the agenda falls within the council's sound discretion. So yes, while 6A does say that it does give an order of items, it does also say that the council can reorder them at a specific meeting. So if you'd like to follow council member Silverstein or council member Uring's requests, council's free to do that. Okay, thank you, John, I appreciate you. Um, Bruce, looked like you had something to say. Waiting for others to weigh in. Like I said, I, I will waive the objections I have to 7C, which I will explain if I need to, and 7D being on the agenda at all, because they do violate city council policy 98-083. But if you want to leave them all, I'll waive that objection if we combine 7C and 7E and combine 7D and 7F. That's separate and apart from the fact that 6A is improper completely. Um, okay. Paul, you have your hand up? I, I just want to say that 7D is a pretty tidy, constrained little thing. It has nothing to do with everything else. And it has, I have lived through it being mischaracterized on social media and, con, and constrained from responding to it because of Assembly Bill 992, which specifically says that social media is a location for Brown Act violations. So if, if you and Steve are going to make an assertion that something is improper, and misdescribe it, I can't respond to it because of the Brown Act. It has nothing to do with the substance. It's got um, to do with process. And I'm happy to go through it laboriously, but I would rather not have to and just combine the items. Uh, Steve? Mikey, I'm not saying anything's wrong. I, I'm, I'm just suggesting that by combining those items when we discuss them, we may end up with a better result when we're done. And that's, I'm just trying to make this thing work better uh, okay. and, and get a result that the residents really want. I agree that my item C and, hang on, and E are certainly in the same area in dealing with homelessness. I have no problem if they're discussed at the same time personally. Personally, I have no, obviously, D and a part of F um, are similar. So we would have to not treat all of F and D the same because they aren't. If we were to go that route, that wouldn't be right. That doesn't make sense. And I want to, I should add one other thing here. Last I saw, we have four and a half hours of public comment tonight. And by, by midnight, we're done. So we're not going to finish this entire agenda. It's impossible. 7F alone would take, could take two days. <laughs> it's over 20 items the way I counted it. Um, and each one does need to be discussed individually. So we can get to that later. So I think we're going to run into a log jam at any rate. But I don't know what anything else things. I'm fine with well, I, I mean, personally, I think that C and, and uh, sorry, I did not have my numbers straight. E. C and E should move to the special meeting. I mean, that's what, that's the agenda change I would make. And so we can actually spend time on this and really, and really give it justice because it's a huge and important issue. It's not a short issue. Yes, Bruce. You have over a hundred submissions in support of 7E. I think it would be grossly derelict for us to disregard the community and take that off the agenda tonight. It was the first agenda item submitted for this meeting two or three weeks ago. The city manager tried to avoid putting this on the agenda altogether. It needs to be discussed. Uh, well, I agree. We should try and get there. I mean, that's, we're going to have to get moving to get there because we have a lot of public comment. So well, I agree. We well, can look, go, I, I, we can discuss C and E together. I'm fine with that. I don't know what everyone else thinks. That that works for me. Uh, Karen, your hand was up. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm okay with Steve's suggestion about combining the um, items seven, 
Excuse me. The policy items. You're talking about DNF? DNF. DNF. Yeah, I, I'm okay with that. So okay. maybe, maybe we can clear that one out of the way. That seems to be a, that seems to be a majority then. Okay. What about C and E? Where are people on that? C and E. That, that's. I think we have me, Bruce, and Steve on C and E. If I'm missing. Right. Okay. I so we, I think we got it. Okay. Um, Let's see if we can get there. Can we take roll call votes, please? Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda hearing items 7C and 7E concurrently and 7D and 7F concurrently? I'll make that motion. Those weren't the right letters. Those weren't the right letters. <laughs> they weren't? Okay. What? 7C and 7F and 7D and 7 yeah. 7F. 7C and 7E and 7D and 7F. And 7 yes. Bruce right. shaking his head. Thank right. you for that concurrence. I'll, I'll make that new motion. I'm sorry, can someone repeat those letters just one more time? <laughs> one D person. D and E together, D and F together, and then we just need to order which one would come first, D and F or C and D, C and E. And one uh, other item. Yes, Bruce. Said, if, if this is going to be the vote on the agenda, there's one other item that needs to be voted on at the same time, which is 6A either needs to be removed or it needs to be placed after what should be 4A at a minimum. The ordinance is supposed to be item four. That's the one so many members of the public have written in about. Mayor, if I could um, jump in for a minute. For I, just, I just want to give some context on that. Um, uh, Bruce submitted an item as a council item. Um, it hasn't been vetted through the city attorney's office. And so adopting an ordinance that is not on the city's work plan that has not gone through any commission or any public discussion um, would normally just come forward as a council item, which is why it's been placed in the number seven. Um, the council certainly can do whatever they want to discuss it. But the first step is to see if the council wants to add it to the city's work plan and move it forward to the city attorney's office. So it's it's where it should be. Where is that written in the resolutions or the code, city manager? Everything doesn't need to be written down. You make things up as you go along? Mayor, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. It's like Fizbin in Star Trek. We just have different rules for different people. I object to the tone this meeting is taking. You know, let, let's, let's try and be civil. We got a lot to do and we haven't gotten past the first 30 seconds yet. Um, Yeah, normally for something to become an ordinance, it has to go through a process. So I get that. Um, this is the process that was followed for all those ordinances I identified. And it my was opinion, not. It, it absolutely is. I, I did the research before this meeting. Did you? I... I really wish you'd checked with the city attorney on some of this stuff first, because you're you're trying to bring in um, stuff that needs at least some sort of research, it looks like, at, at a last minute. So if we have consensus okay, on the agenda, I'm going to move forward with 7C and E together and D and F together, because that's what we have consensus on so far. Right. And there, One last time. Excuse me, John. I really. Which order did you want those in? C and C and E first, or D and F first? I would say probably C and E first, um, but I think I think it's it's a very. I mean, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I appreciate that Bruce is concerned with it too. So uh, I would say that because I really feel that seven F is going to be multiple meetings. Um, and we're not going to get through that as easily. So I think there's we could prioritize that potentially if we can get that far. Um, yes, Bruce. All right. So I just I want to understand because Council Member Farrer said this is taking too long. I mean, am I supposed to wave and give up 
procedural objections to things that are violating city council resolutions? And is it not the city manager's responsibility when she creates the agenda to follow city council resolutions, which identify the manner in which the agenda is to be prepared? Uh, may I respond? Yes. I did not say this was taking too long. You must have heard someone else. I misunderstood then. I apologize. Um, Paul? I I am just, I don't agree that 7F is in a form that can be adopted as, in, as a law. Yeah, I, I, I would agree because there's a, a huge amount of issues there, some that fall within an ordinance potentially, some that don't. So I, I, I would agree with that. Um, and a lot of research would need to be done in certain things and other items aren't an ordinance at all. But still, there's some important items in there. So I, I hope we can at least get started on that. Um, so we, we have, Bruce, we have a motion or a consensus on the agenda and a motion. And uh, I think we're I think we're ready to move forward right now. You, I can't hear you. I know. I said, but, well, I do have a motion. You, we may vote it down, but my motion also is, in addition to the things that have been stated, that 6A is improperly on. How many motions are going to be removed? Uh, so, well, oh, things are moving here. Um, do we have a second on? Point of order. Yes, Paul. We have an existing motion on the floor for, that Steve made, and then... Councilman Silverstein Steen jumped in and made another motion, which I don't believe was seconded. And now he's making a third motion. What's going on? All right, well, let, let's move forward. Um, do we have, okay, you're right. We should do one motion at a time, then we'll come back to your other motion, Bruce. Um, can we have roll call on the motion to combine 7C and E and 7D and F and move C, E to ahead as the first of the two. Can we have a roll call on that, please? Uh, I believe we had that motion from Council Member Uring, and this would otherwise approve the agenda. Was there a second on the motion? I'll second. Yes, I think Karen seconded it. Council Member Uring? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, Bruce, do you want to make a, a second motion? Yes, and I, and I apologize if, there was in, if it seemed like there was improper format, but the motion we just did when it was originally stated was to approve the agenda with those changes. That's why I had asked for other changes. The other motion I have is to remove 6A from the agenda because it was not presented timely and because if you read the resolution of this city council, the city manager does not have the authority to submit her own agenda item, much less the day before the meeting. Okay, is there a second? Steve, is that Bruce, a second? Bruce, uh, Bruce, I would second that, but look, 6A, I think it's worth discussing 6A. So I'm, it, I know I understand that you believe it's on the agenda legally, but I do think it's a topic that we should at least pursue this evening because it's it's relevant and it's timely. So let's get that one done and off our plate if, if it's okay with you. Can I amend the motion to do 6A after 7 C and E? I'll second that. As long as we get to it, as long as we can talk about it. We'll see. It's hard to tell tonight. Um, yeah. can we, okay, can we have roll call on that motion, please? On the motion to reorganize 6A after 7C. Yes, one second. Council Member Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Council Member Fair? No. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? No. Mayor Pearson? No. Okay. Motion fails. Okay. So can I have a report on the posting of the agenda? 
Yes, the agenda for this meeting was properly posted on December 31st, 2020, with the amended agenda posted January 8th, 2021. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving forward, we have no ceremonial presentations. Do we have oral communications from the public would be next. Yes, we have 28 speakers. I'll read their names in order and then call them one by one to speak. Okay, thank you. They are Pamela conley ulick Bill Sampson, Joey Goodman, Lonnie Gordon, Mark Boddy, Dean Grawlick, Deborah Frankel, Lynn Norton, Scott Dietrich, Dana Grawlick, E. Barry Haldeman, Colleen Baum, Lloyd Ahern, John Seibert, Alexis Aria, Josh Spiegel, Marissa Coolin, Craig Hill, uh, Jonathan Friedman, Howard Rudsky, Hamish Patterson, Graham Clifford, John Seibert, Georgia Goldfarb, Andy Lyon, and Ryan Embry. The first speaker will be Pamela conley Ulick. Okay. Hi, Pam, are you there? Yeah, hi everybody. For um, those of you who don't know me, I'm Pamela conley Ulick, and I served as the mayor of Malibu in 2008. And my mom was with me on election night when I was elected to serve Malibu. And my mom taught me what it means to be a role model, what it means to fight for what is right. My mom died from COVID on May 5th. The COVID death count is now over 300,000. A vaccine has been developed, approved, and shipped. Why is it that we in Malibu, and more specifically, those in the most vulnerable populations, still have no idea when or how the vaccine will be administered to them? This past month, I was so disappointed by the back and forth bickering I witnessed at your very first city council meeting and tonight I'm sickened. Bruce, I know what it feels like to be passed over. During my first term on the city council, I too was passed over to be mayor. And that's precisely why when I was reelected in 2008, we changed the selection to make the mayor equally shared so all city council members would be treated with dignity. I hope that tradition of treating each other with dignity and respect will continue. Further, I have faith that our justice system is capable of investigating, prosecuting, and protecting Malibu from everyone. Serving on the city council is an honor and I hope all of you will act honorably as you serve. Once again, it's an honor to be in your seats and I hope you'll act honorably. No one who loves Malibu wants to see this place. Many of us raise our children, takes this toxic path. Our nation has endured enough lies and false accusations, name callings to last a lifetime. Members of the city council have been elected to serve and help and not hurt Malibu. Serving on the city council, well, I'm here and I'm here to support one thing and one thing only, and that's Malibu, the community we all love. We're in the middle of a COVID crisis and many more will suffer from this virus and possibly die before this year is over. Why aren't you talking about that? What will you do to help distribute the vaccine? It's time for you all to roll up your sleeves and work as a team to make Malibu and the planet better, better and to save lives. Godspeed and good luck. Up. We'll be watching and rooting for you to succeed. Thank you, Pam. And I'm so sorry for your loss. Our next speaker is Bill Sampson. Am I on? You're on, Bill. Thank you. I was one of the plurality that voted for Mr. Silverstein. Number two was Mr. Uring. 
it is unfortunate that the other three of you chose to let your personal dislike not give Mr. Silverstein the honor he deserved. Paul, you just started here. You had duties, you took an oath. When you started your real estate career very early, as I recently learned and I read the decision, you failed in your duties to your client. Then you lied on a loan application as so found and you know it, you are repeating that mistake here. I did not bring it up pre-election because it was a long time ago, but you and I both know that you perjured yourself at that, that time. I would have hoped you would have overcome those kinds of character defects and simply rather than choose self-aggrandizement, supported Mr. Silverstein's application to be mayor pro tem. He should have been, if you were honorable, you would have given him your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Joey Goodman. Am I unmuted? You're on, Joey. Okay. Uh, I got to tell you, I, I tuned in late. Uh, I don't want to, I have three minutes, so I'll try and stay on tack. Uh, I did send in a letter. I hope some of you read it. Uh, I'm pretty much going to read that. I, I know I'll never have managed to stay up till you get to really some of the business, but I really would like to share uh, my thoughts. Good evening, council members. What may have originated as a well-intentioned attempt at reform appears to have taken on the tone of an inquisition. After enduring four years of deep state conspiracy theories, lies and deceit, we find ourselves not leaving that insanity behind us, but beginning a new, more localized chapter. Accusations of misconduct and malfeasance in office and persistent innuendo of criminal activities perpetrated by our city manager and a certain and a certain council members will now have the opportunity to be examined. I, that's a good thing especially for ones having nothing to conceal. Mr. Silverstein's behavior and comments suggest he is aware of certain incriminating evidence that validates his position. Perhaps he'll share some of those facts this evening, perhaps at a later date. Hopefully an unbiased review will be undertaken to determine the validity of all complaints presented for investigation. I believe a neutral third party would be a more appropriate choice for leading any investigative endeavors. I'm uh, requesting our newly elected city council to at least seek some common ground for cooperation. Can the incessant barrage of assault of character be halted momentarily? We've heard you, Mr. Silverstein, and admire your tenacity and desire to drain the swamp. Haven't we had enough of bullying behavior? It doesn't mean you're a loser just because you decide to be more courteous and considerate of one another. Can we leave the blame game behind and focus on a more productive and positive approach to our new council's undertakings? Uh, and I just would close with a remark I see on Facebook uh, Bruce, uh, there, there was some confusion as to what a neutral party is. I, I do not see you as uh, one that would qualify. Neutral would be unbiased, and you certainly appear to have a biased opinion of the facts. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Joey. Our next speaker will be Lonnie Gordon. You there, Lonnie? I'm here. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And I'm not talking about 5G or small cells tonight. <laughs> First, I'd like to welcome our new council members, Bruce, Steve, and Paul, and thank our current members for their ongoing service. My sincere and fervent wish is that all of you will be able to get along, honestly. 
I think we've all seen what ego and the quest for power can do to any city, county, state, or country. So I'm going to address the enormous elephant in the room that anyone who is, who is here is aware of, and I think it's been mentioned before. I see what's happening now in this session, and you are divided. The recent events we've all witnessed were witnessed currently were created by dishonesty and division and the corruption of power. I'm not taking a stand politically, just pointing out what lack of integrity and ethics can breed. We all need to put that ego and quest for power aside and do what's in the best interest of the residents of our city. It is difficult to do, but it's certainly not impossible if you work together. Honesty, transparency, ethics, and integrity should be and can be the basic tenets of our city government. I hope this new beginning will be the cornerstone of a new and better Malibu. This is not an easy job and there are many stumbling blocks to overcome, but I hope you will be able to surmount your differences and work together for the highest good of all. We can actually be a beacon of hope for other governmental bodies by coming together. United we stand and divided we fall. I'm giving up my speaking minutes on the other issues I signed up for. As Mikey said, it's a long agenda for because I sent in emails to all the council members and I hope you got them. Please use your highest consciousness to work together and I'll let Nicole McGinley address the wireless issue for us. Thank you so much and please, please, please come together for us. Thank you. Thank you for your words, Lonnie. Our next speaker will be Mark Boddy. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you, Mark. Great. So um, I'm a downtown lawyer, 34 years of practice. I'm representing a witness in the Hezar investigation. Uh, I own three homes in Malibu. I'm deeply invested in the community. Um, I, the first four or five speakers all coming at it from different angles have nailed what it is that Malibu residents are concerned about. We want the five of you to get along as a team, to conduct yourselves like full grown adults, to exchange ideas and to reach consensus. Woolsey and the pandemic have been very hard on the city. Uh, two of you, in my view, are not off to a good start. Councilman Uring, you're new at this, you're a rookie, your colleagues tried to make you the mayor and you turned it down and you conducted yourself in a way that a lot of people think just makes you Bruce Silverstein's errand boy. People didn't vote for you to be someone else's errand boy, even if he does live three houses down the street from you. We want you to function as your own council person with your own vote. Councilman Silverstein. <clears throat> You have already, in public, in your first month, gone on social media, just like Trump, and decided to call someone that you're supposed to work with, the city manager, a single working mom, a fascist, a dictator, a tyrannical leader who is corrupt. How do you expect to work with someone as a teammate if you throw those kind of pathetic, empty adjectives around? You need to open in your first 30 days as a rookie with respect. The Wagner affidavit. Okay, let's get down to that. There needs to be an outside investigation of the Wagner affidavit. Bruce or Bill, whoever that was, is correct. You're a biased interested party because you made a campaign promise to get Reva Feldman fired. So you certainly can't be involved in that investigation because of the content of the Wagner affidavit. As for your 17 page HR complaint, that also can be handled by a traditional investigation. These are not, in my view, significant or major issues, but to be fair to the two new guys, and I guess there's really three of you, I don't consider Paul new because Paul's got 45 years in the city. He's been on multiple committees. He's served for over 25 years. We need you guys to get along. These two things are the only two things that can be investigated out by outsiders. 7E is completely illegal, wouldn't pass muster, won't be enforced. 
it's a good first effort by a rookie, a lawyer who's never drafted an ordinance, and you wouldn't bootstrap onto an unenforceable camping ordinance. That's not how ordinances are done in this context. And you guys are correct to combine 7C Mark, and 7E. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Dean Grolick. Are you there, Dean? Okay. Actually, this is Dana Gralick. Dean is in surgery. Um, do you want me to go now or wait till my turn? Um, so you're, you want She's to switch? She's signed up to speak in about five turns. What's that? Sorry? Dana, Dana's also signed up to speak in about five more speakers. So let's, should we just switch? Okay, let's just switch and move on. Okay, you can, you can skip me. I don't think he's going to be available. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pearson, members of the City Council, and those that are taking the time to participate tonight. My name is Dr. Dana Growlick, and I've been a resident of Malibu and a Malibu business owner for the last 17 years. As an employer in the state of California, I just finished my state-mandated two hours of sexual harassment training. In that training was a very important review of bullying in the workplace. I'm concerned as I read through the many emails and demands in item 6A as agenda tonight uh, from council member Silverstein to city manager Feldman and the voluminous and lengthy attacks on social media platforms of the city manager's character, motivations and behavior by council member Silverstein that the city of Malibu and the council member himself could personally find themselves with a very serious HR complaint should this behavior continue. Councilmember Silverstein, I know you're fairly new to the California bar, but I would suggest you spend some time reviewing California labor law regarding what constitutes a hostile work environment. When the city of Malibu purchased the Malibu Bay Company property that's now Legacy Park, Malibu Coast Animal Hospital became a tenant of the city of Malibu. At that time, Rita Feldman was the assistant city manager. She was tough. She held her ground and she worked hard to protect the city's financial interests. Although that was not to my personal advantage, I respected her commitment to the city and the professionalism with which she executed her duties. We have maintained a healthy working relationship as she transitions to the position of city manager. In council member Silverstein's emails, the terms terse and passive aggressive seemed very unfair to me as these were written communications that inherently lack tone with which those assessments could be made. I question if that would have been your reaction, council member Silverstein, if the city manager were a man. I'm all for transparency within city government, but it's clear that council members Silverstein and Uring have a preconceived notion that they're trying to prove. So for them to appoint themselves to a committee to investigate the misuse of power and corruption within city government seems like a very clear conflict of interest. If I've learned anything from the last week in politics is that this vendetta needs to stop and precious time and resources are being wasted. When the city council, <clears throat> we need the city council to come together and work on the problems that Malibu is facing now. Strategizing vaccine rollout during a pandemic, fire safety and rebuilds, homelessness, PCH safety, the list goes on and on. Let's focus and come together to work toward our common goals and the needs of the community and make the best of use of our city staff during this challenging time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. Our next speaker will be Deborah Frankel. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, Deborah. Hello. First of all, I want to say hello to all of you. You're all my friends, and it's very nice to see you all, <laughs> especially these days. And I just wanted to say a few things. I, I thought that um, since the majority of people in Malibu voted for Bruce, Bruce should have been Mayor Pro Tem. And it's nothing personal. I just want to remind you all that, you know, you're working for this, the city and the most people in the city wanted that. And most of the people in the city want Bruce and Steve to do what they're doing. They, they really want an overhaul and everybody to, to uh, you know, it's a little rough at first, but to get a real clean presentation of our city council and the way the city's run. And Pamela, I am so sorry for your mother and everything you said was really great and um i just we all want malibu to be an exemplary city with people of high moral character and i wanted to read a couple things um 
good leaders have three powers usually that are really good and one is presence and one is communication and one is position so presence is the way we we are when we come into a room communication you know we may come into a room well but if we don't communicate well we're we're not going to be trusted and then we also need to take a stand on our position and have the willingness to let others know where we stand and we might change our mind the next day, but at least they'll know where we stand. And when we know where people stand, we feel safe. Um, and then I wanted to remind people about the heart. And there are four chambers of the heart. And indigenous people talk about the open heart, the clear heart, the strong heart, and the full heart. And then there's the shadows of those. And the full heart would be being half-hearted and the open heart closed. Uh, the unclear heart is confused. And I think a lot of us feel confused about what's going on with the city. And we want, you wanna have the courage to say what is so and to be you know, who you really are when you have a, a weak heart that you, you may not say those things. So you wanna have a strong heart too. So just wanna remind you all that to work on having a full, open, clear and strong heart and go forward and Let's really get some good things done and you can do it. That's it. Thank you for your words, Deborah. Welcome. Our next speaker is Lynn Norton. Lynn, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, just a quick comment, which might help the meeting not go even longer which is that when you get to the uh, homeless item, particularly uh, Mikey's item about, um, my understanding is that the whole item is just about getting something on the agenda, right, Mikey? So maybe yes. people could be advised if they each signed up to speak on that, that they don't need to share all of their ideas of how to solve the homeless issue, because that would keep us here another few hours. <laughs> So it's just, you know, because the comments are just about, well, the agenda item is just really about having a meeting. It's not about solving it tonight. Right? That's, yes, yes, for a special meeting. Right, right. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich. Thank you. Um, I've got to go back to our first speaker, Pam. I think Pam brought up something that overrides everything else we're discussing tonight. We're in the middle of a pandemic, there's vaccine available, it's sitting on shelves. I don't know who's running the distribution, it sounds like the DMV, but we ought to turn our efforts or more elderly people are going to die and we don't want that. So I hope that the council and Reva would deal with that. Let's make that priority. Secondly, Bruce, and Steve ran, they were dealing with the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room in our city is that there's these accusations that things are being done underhanded in secret at the city. We don't know if that's true or not, but the accusations are out there and let's face it. So we need to do everything we can to be transparent. If Bruce wants a meeting recorded with the city manager, why not? Because if you say no, it looks like the city manager's hiding something. And that just is self-defeating. So we have to deal with that. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I get a letter last week saying that, oh, our property needs to be reevaluated because we don't have a permit for our wastewater system. Oh, so I immediately call and say, look, the property has not transferred ownership since 2002 when we bought it. Then I get a letter um, from the city apologizing for this first letter saying that because someone, a person called and complained that all these letters were sent out. I don't know if it's hundreds or how many. That didn't ring true. I'm sorry. One person complains that, and who's going to complain 
that our property has transferred ownership and doesn't have a permit for its wastewater system? That doesn't make any sense. So I would like the city manager to really explain what the heck happened here um, and clear this up because the, the letter didn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is E. Barry Haldeman. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Barry. Great, okay. Um, my name is Barry Haldeman. I've lived in Malibu many years, longer than some who are on the city council. My wife and I moved here before we became a city and I was involved in the formation of the city and what went before as a member of Save Our Coast. I was at the first council meeting. We had a vision for the city. We wanted to, re to rest ourselves from the insidious control of the county. We wanted to take control of our destiny, make our own decisions, and we wanted to get away from the down and dirty politics that is so prevalent in Los Angeles and for that matter on the national scene. And while we're not perfect, I believe we have accomplished a lot. Not that we don't have our own problems, but this election introduced a new and dangerous cancer to Malibu politics, a vendetta against our city and everyone in Malibu city government who, um, who are all accused of, based on accusations in social media, and based on one affidavit that is full of hearsay and unfounded accusations. It's interesting, this morning's New York Times observed that one of the tactics of our current federal administration has been to undermine Americans' confidence in the FBI, the CIA, the military, the Justice Department prosecutors, government scientists, health officials, and more. Well, that's what seems to be the sort of confrontational politics that has been introduced here. All of a sudden, there is a move afoot to distrust our city council, our city manager, our city attorney, the office of the Los Angeles district attorney, and multiple other city staff. And that is being done by innuendo, false accusations based on little facts, claims of bribery, kickbacks, and name calling, even to the point of one now council member referring to our city manager who is Jewish as a fascist a fascist. I'm a practicing lawyer and I believe this type of activity is creating a hostile workplace for which the city could be very liable. We have no place in our city for that kind of politics. I am absolutely in favor of transparency in government and fair treatment for all citizens and the investigation of credible accusations. But we need to solve our problems in a civilized, respectful way without confrontational rhetoric. We should not be undermining the very thing we moved away from. That civilized small town spirit is as much a part of our vision statement as the words themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Our next speaker is Colleen Baum. Are you there, Colleen? Colleen, you are unmuted if you want to try speaking. Maybe Colleen's away. We could uh, try her back in a little bit. We can circle back to her. So our okay. next speaker then would be Lloyd Ahern. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are, Lloyd. Okay. Um, my name is Lloyd Ahern. I have been attending city council meetings since 1997. I'm a resident of Malibu since 1966. I started out at the Hughes Auditorium, moved over to the other city hall, and now to our present city hall. And I have never seen a new council person get conned like, like Bruce did by Jefferson, making, making you his stooge. I'm going to say this again. You got conned by Jefferson 
by writing this affidavit. Je Jefferson got to you to write the phony affidavit that is loaded with lies, rumors, and unproven nonsense. Nonsense. And so you go on, you must have been, it must have been unbelievable the amount of hours you used to charge. You What could be written on two pages, you did 10, and then probably cheated your clients out of the, the, the time on the eight pages. Um, you, uh, lies rumors that Jefferson has Jefferson had a, a way of working with people but and solving problems everybody likes Jefferson but they don't like you Bruce and after tonight it's only going to get worse and then I want I'm going to finish with one little word of advice to my friend Steve Uring who I really like a lot but I don't know what happened to him you better get control over this guy because this is going to only wear off on you, and he's going to turn out to be just like Trump, and you're going to be Pence, and you're going to be gone, and, and you're going to be tarnished by this man. So get him under control, Steve. It's very important for us and the city. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Our next speaker is John Seibert. All right, my unmuted. Uh, I can hear you, John. Okay, thanks. Yeah, my name's John Seibert. I uh, have a bit of a history with this city too. Uh, I was on the township council in the '80s. We, uh, I was the guy who sat in every other Tuesday night when we fought with the county over building a sewer sewage treatment plant and a uh, sewer sewer line down the middle of PCH, and we won that one. Led to us being a city. I was a founding board member of Save Our Coast. I spent five years on the planning commission, uh, eight and a half years on the city council. Uh, I never saw anything of the kinds of things that Bruce and others are accusing uh, the city and Reva of. I never saw a hint. And I worked with Jefferson. We, we worked together very well for four years working. In fact, we were the ones who got, went out and met with all the planning commission or the coastal commission members and got them to uh, actually start to look at Malibu a little more uh, in a little more friendly fashion. Uh, but I've never seen anything like this. I, I know there have, you know, we, when we went through the process of, of hiring a new city attorney when uh, Jim Thorson left, we interviewed some great candidates. And Reva came out far better than all the rest of them. She's a very honorable person who does her job very, very well. We managed in that time I was on the council, and it's not me, but others. Uh, we built four parks. We balanced the budget. We made um, Legacy Park more than pay for itself. We built a city hall without any kind of, um, of uh, underhanded stuff going on. The idea that the city council uh, could influence a decision on a uh, on a call for uh, proposals for a project is just crazy. We don't see it until it comes before us, and it's the low bidder. You know, Malibu is better than this, and it's better than the kind of noise that we've been hearing and the insults and the personal attacks. This kind of innuendo, half-truths, and flat-out lies really needs to end if we want to have a city that we can all be happy with. I don't want to see city replicate what's happened in DC. And I think you also have to remember those of you who are now on the city council that you don't just represent the people who voted for you. You represent every single person in this city. You're at large. So please think about that. Represent everybody in the city. And if you can come around to the way we worked hard to do to get to those four to five council members agreeing on issues, that's where the debate should occur, not not on public media. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Alexis Aria. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, first off, I would like to share that I hope that this council will become synerg synergic and efficient. A lot of us Malibu residents um, volunteered for candidates 
who can help our city become safer as well as um, help improve our quality of life. I would like to share my reason for activism in Malibu, incredible, incredibly important to me. I know that we will discuss this later, but I would like to share this. Uh, there is a very serious issue, which is an absolute plague because of this blight. Many Malibu women cannot sleep at night and are living in sheer terror. Um, extensive research within the past 10 months has acquired the following data. A high number of Malibu women have reported being harmed by homeless men in Malibu. Women in Malibu have experienced the following acts. Please listen very carefully. Death threats, attempted murder, sexual assault, physical assault, kidnapping, carjacking, indecent exposure, stalking, vandalism, showing up outside a woman's bedroom window late at night, um, slashing of tires, breaking and entering, um, burglary, shouting, following, terroristic threats, and many, many more. Um, one woman was so badly stalked that she quit her job and is now living in hiding. She does not sleep at night and she has severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, let's also remember that we have four women who have been murdered in Malibu and Montecito in the past 11 and a half years. And all these murder cases are unsolved, remain unsolved. Let us please, please, create a positive paradigm shift. We need to address this issue. Um, and also, um, as for leadership style, I recommend that you choose servant leadership, altruism, benevolence, and efficiency. We voted for activists. Please listen to the voice of the people. Later on, we will discuss a proposal for provision of protection for women. And I look forward to a safer Malibu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Josh Spiegel. Hi. Hi, Good Josh. Evening. Uh, my name is Josh Spiegel. I'm a third generation resident and I live in Boo West. Um, I'd like to thank the city council members and staff. I appreciate you dedicating your time to the betterment of our community. I felt that it was important to speak tonight for a couple of reasons. First, I want to welcome and congratulate the new members to the council. Next, um, there's been a lot of vitriol, divisiveness, and accusations flying around. Online forums, usually reserved for lost dogs or plumber recommendations, have been hijacked in an effort to slam city staff, fellow council members, and other members of our community. There has been a deliberate effort to DOS attack city staff through countless, quote, information requests. I've been told that it is the right of council members to ask for these things. We simply do not have the resources to satisfy the curiosity of council members doing this. We have a lot of things happening in the city that will require significant use of staff time. Some of these things include the obvious homeless situation, more parks and ball fields on city owned property for our kids, PCH safety is always a top priority. Upcoming fights with the MRCA and Coastal Commission. We have school separation. We need to upgrade our water infrastructure. We have significant staff shortages in all city departments. And protecting our environment and wildlife should be on the forefront of our minds. We still have hundreds of homes that need to be permitted, inspected, and rebuilt. And we expect staff to work efficiently and diligently to do all of these things during a global pandemic. You know, initially I was excited to have a lawyer on our council. I thought we would finally have someone who could fight for us to get things moving in issues involving other cities and agencies. It seems that Bruce has decided the best use of his skills would be to fight with our own city staff. Immediately after the election, the gloves came off and he went on the attack. This scares me because we have a lot of very important things to do and now they won't get done because he wants to investigate whether a city staff member got a gift certificate to Nobu or tickets to Circus Olay. Council, please forgive me if I don't think in 
investigating Reba's 2% yearly salary raise is a top priority. I understand that there are people in this community who feel that this is a top priority. Those people aren't trying to rebuild their homes. I am begging you all to find a way to work with your fellow council members to make a difference. Mikey and Karen, thank you so much again for donating your time to this town. Paul, Steve, and Bruce, congratulations on the election, and I hope to see you all around town. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker is Marissa Coughlin. Hello, good evening. Hi, Marissa. Um, first, I'd like to, uh, I didn't have an opportunity because I was working in another state when the council took their oath of office. So I want to congratulate all the incoming council members. And I do want to thank the previous council members for all the time and diligence that they put in on behalf of our city. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to possibly, um, almost every person who signed up to talk tonight, I know as a 50 year resident of this community, I was involved with on uh, county boards and commissions prior to uh, uh, cityhood. I worked for cityhood one time and then against cityhood when we had the big rock slide because I was hoping the county would pick up those expenses. And uh, now we are where we are. We, our city is a business. We need to generate income. We need to maintain as much of the, our former community as we could, given the fact that we're a city. And with incorporation, we brought all the rules, regulations from federal level to municipal right to our own back door. Um, given that, that uh, view of mine, I also would like to thank the staff, uh, our contract employees, our regular employees. I'm in that city hall more time than I spend with my family, actually. And uh, I know the ins and outs of all the codes, ordinances, and regulations, both for Malibu, the state of California, and I work, as I said, all, all around the country. I think it's important to recognize that in the COVID, not only has our staff gone above and beyond what they normally do, they're very accessible. Believe me, there's a running joke amongst many consultants when they see me go in the city hall, they say, ask me who I'm gonna eat today. And I go, I don't know, maybe a geologist, maybe a planner making a joke. And I think it's really important to know that they're accessible, that they listen, and they work really, really hard. Um, I would also like to make the observation that I'm very, very disappointed. Um, all the people whose names are on the screen tonight, I know personally, I know, I'm, I'm so sorry about Pamela's mom. I met her mom at election time. I supported Pamela and her mother was a sweetheart. I really think that it's important that the tone of our council be the lead for our community. Uh, I don't know how we can expect any other jurisdiction or agencies, state or county, federal to uh, uh, respect us when we act like high school kids. The name calling is totally unacceptable to me. I disagree with other professionals that I work with, but I don't dislike them and I won't call them names. You know, I'm, I'm always learning. I can always be proven incorrect, but I'm a finder of fact. Um, so I really hope that the tone changes, that as another gentleman said, we act as grownups and we move forward from all this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Our next speaker is Craig Hill. Good evening, council and staff. Yeah, please stop the ad hominem stuff on all sides. Yesterday, Arnold Schwarzenegger put out a video that's worth watching. He said, quote, we need public servants that serve something larger than their own power. We need public servants who will serve higher ideals. So everyone, put your egos aside and acknowledge where others have a point. Three substantive things. First, one bottleneck with the vaccine distribution is not enough, is that there's not enough people to administer it. It doesn't take much training to stick a needle in someone's arm. So I would gladly volunteer 10 hours a week to be jabbing others. Could council lobby the county to create a volunteer vax squad? Secondly, SDR permits should be viewable in on base. So if you have a problem with your neighbor's hotel after hours, you can check the permit's current terms and status. 
I've been discussing this with several staff members. So far, the word is that maybe you'll have to fill out an online request and then receive merely a list of active permits. But STRs are commercial businesses. They have less expectation of confidentiality. They serve the public, so the public should be able to review the actual permits. Let's make this happen. Finally, uh, Proposition 19, drafted by the Realtors Association, has a perverse provision designed to churn properties and increase commissions. It's forcing some folks who's lived here a long time, whose property hasn't been reassessed for a while, to have attorneys transfer their family property from parent to child before February 16th, when the proposition takes effect. It's complicated, anyone can ask me for details. Old timers making these family transfers may run up against the rule that says OWTS must be certified when property is transferred, depending on how the city handles it. The intent of that rule is to enforce compliance at the time of sale. Many of these folks may be on fixed incomes. We shouldn't have to tell them that even though their old septic system still works fine, they must spend $100,000 or more on an upgrade. It should be sufficient evidence of compliance that they haven't had to have the tank pump three times in 180 days as per code. Otherwise, some might have to mortgage their houses or sell and move out of town. Now, I've spoken with Trevor and so far have the sense that there may be several potential fixes. So I'd like council to put this on the agenda. It's in the MMC, so you wouldn't need an LCPA. For example, you might order a staff interpretation memo that says interfamily transfers are either exempt or not defined as transfers in the first place or you could frame it in terms of residence. So certification isn't required until the current resident actually moves out, or you could grant a provisional certification effective until the property is sold to a non-family member or until the tank needs excessive pumping, of course. Um, or make the standards be performance-based instead of technology-based. That's five ideas. Let's make sure that longtime friends and neighbors aren't forced to move out of the city. Please agendize it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Our next speaker would be Jonathan Friedman, but we don't see him in the meetings. So we're gonna try circling back at the end. So okay. we'll hear from Howard Rudsky now. Okay, thank you. Are you there, Howard? I have to Howard. unmute myself, I'm sorry. There you go, I can hear you. Okay, sorry. I've yapping away. Okay, good evening City Council, Reva, staff, and welcome to new City Council members. Reading social media of late, this is not the Council members, Reva, staff, I've had the privilege to work with over the past years. The contrary, I found them to be professional, knowledgeable, and more than willing to help. In, in an age where we have pandemic, the city was never set up to work remotely. They had to come up with quite a bit of stuff. Craig George left in the middle of this and Reva pulled an unbelievable miracle. Got somebody that I think everybody agrees is unbelievable and helped hundreds of people. And this is just not who we are as the city. We don't talk to one another like this. We don't act like this. Nobody talks to one another like this that expects to get something from the other. It's, there's politics, there's people, and then there's all us citizens that need a lot from Malibu right now. People that have lost their homes, you, COVID, you know, PCH, the schools, and the list goes on and on. And to take up time in meetings with all this stuff that's important to some, but as a whole, it doesn't get us where we need to go. <clears throat> and acting like this sets this city back years. And we've just gained the respect over the last five years from Sacramento, from coastal, from local legislators. And we need them, whether we like it or not, to get the things we want. There has to be some reality here. And, you know, I, for one, know most of these people that have been talked about, and I've never seen or heard anything even remotely 
And, you know, if there's going to be an investigation, it should be an outside third party or it should be the government agencies that do this for a living. But right now, there's a lot of things this city needs and the people of this city need. And we should come together and work as one and treat one another with the respect and forget about respect. If you want something from somebody, this isn't the way to get it. And at the end of the day, you need three votes. Anybody, any one of the five of you need three votes. Howard, you're talking about that. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. Thank you, Howard. Our next speaker is Hamish Patterson. Hello? I can hear you, Hamish. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to welcome the new council members. And um, I guess I just want to start off right off the bat with, with remind, remembering everybody's oath. You all took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the state of California and the United States of America. That is your priority. And to, and to defend us, the people, from those who would trespass on our constitutional rights. You know, it, it's pretty troubling. Kai, I'm late in the, the rotation. I think that a lot of the people who spoke tonight need to take some reflection on the words they used towards various city council members. I've heard every city council, I've heard everybody up there get besmirched by the public today. And I think the public really needs to look at themselves too and stop pointing the fingers at the politicians. It said, you get the government you deserve. I, I, I know Steve Uring for a long time down at City Hall, and to have him be smirched as, as a rookie is, is totally unacceptable, man. Steve Uring has done more to smooth out things. And I want to also say that one of the major mistakes coming through was how the mayoral rotation was handled. And I applaud Steve Uring for, for being honorable and not co-signing the way that went down. That, that was a bad way to start this thing and and you can say a lot about the uh the legalese going on i don't necessarily like it but i understand it you know i ran my first city council campaign with my uh catchphrase was city hall should be made of plexiglass walls so i'm all for transparency but moving forward i i think our city council needs to have some public forums the uh animosity in the community and in the country is fever pitch. And I've been here warning everybody about this since April. I've been telling you that these unconstitutional mandates were putting people in very bad situations and that people's lives are being destroyed to save others people's lives. I don't know what the balance is, but again, I would say refer to the constitution. I think that this, it behooves the city council to have some public forums where we can all come together with our different ideologies and our different opinions and find common ground because uh, the animosity that I've heard from the public tonight is more shocking than anything that I've heard coming out of the city council. I've heard Paul Grisanti besmirch. That was uncool. I've heard every, that, what went down tonight so far on the city council from the public alarms me more than what's going on in city hall. And what they say is, when you point a finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you. I've been very hard on council members, and I'll always be very hard, but I believe in the civic process. I believe in this country, and it's of the people, by the people, for the people. May we start being of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you for your time. Please bring us together in a public forum. Thank you, Hamish. Our next speaker is Graham Clifford. Hi. Hi, Graham. Hi. Well, I hope <laughs> that you won't be happy to hear that I'm not here to comment on your um, on your character or behavior. I'm here. I'm here to talk about um, fires and specifically Tuna Canyon um, and specifically the fact that the, the two or three, I can't remember, there were two or three fires started recently at the end of last year by homeless encampments on private property in Tuna Canyon were very lucky they didn't burn several houses on the beach as well as straight up into Big Rock. Um, so when you guys are talking about um, well, camping and homeless and everything, which you will be forever, um, uh, please 
address the issue of, of encampments on private property. There has to be some way to make the, you know, I don't know to what extent the owners are aware that there are encampments on their property if they're large chunks of land and they don't live there. But there has to be a way to deal with this and to and to be able to address the city must be able to address and the county must be able to address these issues without um, uh, w the same way they can on on city and public and park lands. Um, so j anyway, don't forget about the private property. It's um it's uh the, the homeless people could have in fact in you know, the, at this time around inflicted severe damage on themselves because there's no way to get out of there in Tuna Canyon. None of them have vehicles. Or, and that, so it could have been a disaster for the homeless community itself. So please address the private property situation and, and how you can get them relocated off of people's private property. Thank you very much. Oh, and I also want to welcome, as I did have done before, but once again, in spite of all the rhetoric going on tonight, I wanted to welcome all of the new guys coming in and the, the new and and, and, sh and Ms. Farah for staying on and and uh, you, you know you all you are all doing a great job and you're all finding a, a very difficult balance here so congratulations and thank you. Thank you Graham. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfarb. Hi can you hear me? I can hear you Georgia. Okay, great. Um, well, I'd just like to welcome the whole council and especially the new council members. Um, uh, my comment tonight is about um, Edison and their tree cutting. Um, so they've taken an even greater uh, aggressive modality than they have in the past. And I know that they are cutting trees in gross excess of the recommendations in the CPUC code. And if anyone wants a connection with some of the codes, I'd be happy to try to help them. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that they do not have the right to come on to your property without your permission. Um, and I will say they have been quite intimidating. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, and I think it might get even worse, but um, I just wanted people to know that. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Our next speaker would be Andy Lyon, but I don't see him in the meetings. We'll try circling back in just a minute. Okay, perfect. So we'll hear from Ryan Embry now. Good evening, City Council. Hey, Ryan. Um, I wanted to go over uh, a couple of different topics, so I hope somebody's please take notes. Um, I sent an email in the middle of December um, about the, hadn't been released yet, the information about the cyber attacks on government uh, database software, which could have made some of the documents and database files that the city has a vulnerable. It's not like the city of Malibu would be a target for any of this information, but the fact that the documents may be vulnerable is something that needs to be determined. I sent this email to um, all the city council and I didn't get any response back from the city, not even that it was really received. So um, I want you to prioritize uh, dealing with this and to assure the public that the vulnerability of the uh, software breach as identified has been corrected and that any backup files that are kept out of state of our digital documents are secure and safe. Uh, the other item I've noticed is that the um, level of traffic law enforcement for the issuance of speeding tickets is way down and it's been down for the last two years. And I do this in comparison to other data that I have saved and compiled. And for instance, in 2015, in a short month of February, there was 368 radar speeding tickets issued. Yet last month, there were only a handful. 
Um, there were actually zero parking tickets reported to have been issued, which I believe is inaccurate. And for some of these reasons, uh, cities Public Safety Commission has chosen not to adopt the reports because they're obviously incorrect. And the same was true on the fire department's reporting of the fires in Tuna Canyon, for instance, as having the even street address of the property that likely reported the fires on the beach on the other side of Pacific Coast Highway. The fire ignition and the barbecues and so forth should be confiscated by law enforcement as evidence for trial. Whether or not you can keep someone arrested and in jail is another thing, but you need to get these fire sources out of the hands of people camping in the hills. On the issue of uh, introspection of the city, I want to have the um, city post the warrant registers prominently on the website for the last three years and make sure that each of those documents is easily searchable so that everything is transparent and in the open. The warrant register on for tonight is not searchable. Ryan, your time is up. Thank you, Ryan. So now we're going to try circling back to a few people we missed earlier. The first of those will be Colleen Baum. Okay. Are you there, Colleen? Oh, yes. I can, can hear, hear you. Me? Yes, I can. I can okay. hear you. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, God, I've changed my comments three times today, but I'm going to get what I can get through. Um, when did the accusations uh, on Reba start? I was thinking about that. Was it 2014 election with uh, Andy and Hamish? Definitely 2016, because the slate run ran on getting rid of Reba. They had a majority for four years. Reba's still here. 2018, the fire happened. Um, you know, not, not a good time for Reba, as we all know. Uh, 2020, 10 million acres burned in the West in 2020. That's a lot of bad mayors, councils, and city managers, yeah? 2020, rebuild, the rebuilds. All I hear are accolades about staff and Reba and how helpful they were in getting their houses rebuilt. Question for you, Bruce, where is the evidence already? I do not support an investigation until there's some evidence. And that affidavit, you know, the district attorney is gonna do nothing with it. Absolutely nothing. Um, my second item, good, I still have a, a minute, is regarding Bruce's 50 page items on the agenda. 7E and 7F. I don't think those should be taken up. That's 55, 55 pages written by one guy. No staff has weighed in, no attorney has weighed in, and I'm not that well versed in, in you know, his, the, the proposals in his camping ordinance, but I know they're completely unenforceable. And the amount of money it would cost um, so I think those items should go to staff. I mean, I mean, you guys decide. You set the agenda. Do not let Bruce control the agenda. I want all five of you to control the agenda with input from me and the rest of the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. We were going to try to circle back to Jonathan Friedman and Andy Lyon as well, but I don't see either of them in the meeting. So that concludes public comment for this item. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. I appreciate um, you taking the time to make comments. Let's see here, sorry, gotta catch back up. So we are at uh, commission updates. Do we have any commission updates? We do, we have two commissioners signed up to speak. They're Chris Frost and Doug Stewart. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, we'll hear so you from Chris first. Okay, thank you. Hello, council members and city staff. Hi, Chris. 
Um, I, I'm going to, I mean, Doug and I are both going to kind of bring you up to date on our commission and what's been going on. Um, I believe that the traffic enforcement that uh, we've been overseeing over the last six months has actually taken a turn for the better at this point uh, by the use of this new LIDAR speed gun that they're using out on the highway. We've had seven cars actually taken into 30 day impounds for racing on the highway, which is that's probably an all time record for the number of cars actually taken off the road. So I'm gonna be bringing something forth with our commission here pretty soon to possibly purchase a couple of these guns because they are actually, uh, they're, they're, they belong to a deputy. They're given to one deputy. They're not like just taken off the shelf and you jump in the car and drive away with them. One deputy controls the gun that he uses. I'd also like to see a uh, some sort of decibel setup too. I know that in the past it 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 was uh, it was tough to to do anything with decibel levels because the guns had to be calibrated once a week and everybody fought the tickets and it became financially unfeasible to to keep trying to do a program like that. But maybe we can look into doing something in the future with it. Um, next comment is on the speed humps on Point Doom. They seem to be doing their job. Uh, I want to thank Rob, Art, and Travis for, for doing a great job of putting them out there. I think they were reasonably placed. Um, they actually removed a couple of them and, and put them in different areas to make it more acceptable to the neighborhood and also to work better. But they did a great job with it. So big shout out to them. I'm going to let Doug take it over from here. He's got uh, some comments he's going to make. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah. Wanted to just bring everybody up to date on uh, what we're trying to do to facilitate getting COVID vaccinations here in Malibu. And, you know, uh, for Pamela, she she put a face and a name with the problem that we hear about. But to know somebody personally in the city just brings the urgency to, to bear. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that the city is working on this. Last week, uh, we had a meeting of the four medical uh, providers here in Malibu. We've got two more are going to meet with us, we think, uh, this week. So a total of six. To uh, The idea was bring them together to see, to make sure that they were working together, and they are very well, and also to make sure the city is getting the resources to them that they need. It really was a back and forth. What do you need? What do you need from us? What can we do to help? Trying to get ready for the date and the time when we actually get the vaccination or the vaccines here in Malibu. Uh, the number of doses and timing uh, those doses is going to decide the level of response that we're going to going to be able to offer here in Malibu. If we only get a few hundred doses at a time, we're probably going to service uh, the local residents out of the individual practitioners' offices. But should we be fortunate enough to get hundreds and hundreds, maybe even a thousand, the number is unknown. Um, we probably turn to a mass uh, vac vaccination program. And the city uh, council, if you remember, in December authorized a drive through program at City Hall similar to the testing facilities. We're also looking right now to see if we can get indoor facilities as well so that we'd be able to do it good weather, bad weather, because it's not going to happen over just a few days. It would be days and days and days. The other thing that we uh, learned is there's no super cold freezers here in Malibu. I didn't realize, by the way, this freezers went down to minus 87 uh, degrees below freeze, below zero. But we do have plenty of ref standard refrigeration that the Moderna vaccine can be used in. And the up and coming Johnson & Johnson, which is expected in uh, uh, early February, is also available for that same refrigeration system. So those are probably the vaccines that we'll be getting when we get them. Um, one of the other things that's, that's happening out of this is we are presuming that the county, with its announcement today, that they're going to have five uh, mass vaccination sites, will also be operating in coordination with UCLA and Kaiser and Cedars and St. John's and all the other major providers where they'll have their own mass vaccination programs. So for Malibu, we're probably going to be one of the last ones to, to see some of these uh, large quantity uh, doses, but we are expecting to get some sometime. But to put very candidly, we're at the uh, behest and benefit of whatever the county and the state sends our way. And we're probably not going to see the 1B group, according to the county, uh, the 1B group being people 75 and older. They're probably not going to be on the uh, calendar to receive the vaccine until 
late January at best and probably early February. And the people that are in 1C, which is the 64 to 75, uh, that group's probably late February, early March. So it's marching along uh, down these various priority groups. But everything I've just said about uh, priority, according to the medical providers, both in Malibu and elsewhere, it all depends on when they cut more va vaccine loose to us and if they change the priorities. So what we're trying to do with the medical providers is to be ready to be ready. That's probably the best way to put it. Both, uh, that was three minutes. I didn't know we were on a three minute time limit. All right. With that, my commissioner comments are done. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you both. Thank you to the Public Safety Commission. Um, city Manager comments, I believe, are next. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year, our first meeting of 2021. Um, I did want to start with an update about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, to date, we have 253 positive cases in Malibu uh, with six deaths now. Um, and in LA County, our testing positivity rate is just over 20%, which means that one in every five per, uh, people um, are testing positive right now. So the, the rate of spread is considerable. Um, I know most people know this, but we do have a stay at home order. We also have a travel ban in effect uh, for California. Um, we continue to update the city's COVID website uh, with uh, current information and uh, did want to thank uh, Doug Stewart um, for everything he's been doing to try and coordinate everything on the vaccine. Um, there is a lot of information about the vaccination uh, process and um, tiers um, on the county's website. We also have a link to that on the city's website. Um, but as, as uh, Doug Stewart touched upon, um, they're rolling it out in phases. We're currently in phase 1A, and there are three tiers in that. Um, and once they uh, get through those tiers, um, and those are primarily healthcare workers and people on the front line, um, then it'll move to phase 1B. And, and again, as Doug said, it is completely dependent on the number of actual vaccinations that are received uh, by the county, and those are being dispersed from the federal government to the state and then down to the county level. So I have been in contact with county public health, um, and as they get information, they are giving it out to cities the best they can. So, um, you know, I know it's uh, something that is important to all of us, and we'll do everything we can uh, to coordinate with our local providers to get that out at the best we can. Um, moving on to our rebuilds, uh, the Woolsey Fire rebuilds, we currently have 284 homes that have been approved through the planning department, um, 166 uh, properties with uh, approved building plans, um, and 20 homes that have been completed as of Friday. So I'm really looking forward to the next few months. I'm, I'm really hoping that number of completed home goes up and we get a lot more people back into their homes. Um, I did want to address the uh, letter that uh, went out about the wastewater and explain what happened there. Um, that was just a pure human error. Uh, the city maintains databases of people who have permits and, and properties that do not have permits for their wastewater system. And uh, we had an employee who unfortunately pulled the wrong database and hit go and did a merge on the letters and mailed them out. And um, it was brought to our attention by a property owner who called and said, you know, I got this. And so as soon as we learned that it was an error, we did uh, reach out to as many people that we could, that we had phone numbers for contact information and did mail corrected letters. So if you got that letter and you're confused, you know, please just call City Hall. Um, and again, it was just, just a blip and these things happen. So apologize uh, on behalf of staff for that. Um, on our short-term rental permit applications, um, that uh, new uh, system goes into effect on Friday, January 15th. Uh, we have been doing everything we can to get the word out. So trying to do a little bit more of that now. Um, to date, we've received uh, about 110 applications and we've approved 30 permits. So uh, definitely not the numbers we are expecting to see. So if you uh, know people who are renting um, as short-term renters, uh, they definitely need to apply to the city for that permit. Um, and the uh, permit application is available on the city's website. Um, I also wanted to touch briefly on some of the gatherings and the problems that we've been having with cars congregating in the Cross Creek area on weekends. Um, obviously something that uh, has been very concerning to us and I uh, wanted to thank the Lost Hill Sheriff Station who has been 
working with us to get us extra deputies. The last few weekends, we've had two extra deputies and a sheriff who are assigned, I'm sorry, a, a sergeant who are assigned specifically to that area. Uh, huge kudos and thanks to our volunteers on patrol who have also been there. Uh, we've had code enforcement out this past weekend, and um, I did reach out to County Public Health and was able to get a County Public Health officer out there last weekend who have cited some of those property owners. Um, so I'm hoping we're starting to get our arms around it. We also have been uh, working with the property owners for them to understand that it falls on them um, to be in contact with whomever is organizing these events. Uh, even though they're not uh, permanent events, they can't be held at those properties. So we're doing everything we can. And I, I know it's been a concern to the community and it's something, uh, you know, I've been, been hands on uh, uh, every weekend on it. So we'll, we'll continue to chase it down and hopefully encourage those people with those cars to go elsewhere to uh, share their, the beauty of their vehicles. Um, I also wanted to make sure everybody knows that the wireless ordinance schedule is available on the city's website. Uh, we have a whole area that's dedicated to that information now, and we're expecting that ordinance um, after it works its way through uh, the public process to go to the council uh, in March. So hoping to move that along uh, as we had promised. And then just a couple things that are coming up at the next uh, city council meeting, which will be January 25th. We will be discussing the mid-year budget. So uh, for those of you who want to uh, hear all about that, we'll be talking about that. And then on January 26, we'll be holding a, a phase two stakeholder meeting for the Civic Center Water Treatment Facility. Um, and that will be a virtual meeting um, held on Zoom. And then lastly, I just wanted to, uh, uh, first of all, thank all the community who came out and spoke tonight, but also really give a big thank you to the city staff. This has been a very long, hard two years uh, in Malibu for everybody and particularly staff who have, you know, risen to the occasion after the fire. And then again, you know, learned how to work remotely and run our city remotely and serve our community during this pandemic. And they continue to do that every day. And for those city staff that are coming into city hall, to be able to serve the residents in person and keep our rebuilds going. Um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you and those who are out in the field, um, you're risking your safety and your health and, and that of your families every day. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank them for that hard work. So that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, city Council comments um, in order, Steve? There we go. There okay. You go. Thank, thank you, Mikey. Of course. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined us this evening to participate in this meeting. Uh, thank you all for your emails and for your comments tonight. Uh, I do take them all seriously, and hopefully as we move forward, we will be able to do a better job. Uh, you know, based upon what I saw in Washington over the last week, uh, it seems to me that, you know, we govern best when we govern through discussion, debate, and collaboration. So I hope we'll be able to accomplish that here in Malibu. Um, I'd like to say hello to John Conti. Uh, I've not ne never met him. I feel a little bit like the Cleveland Browns yesterday. They, they had players out there that introduced themselves to each other in the in the uh, locker room before the game. So John, welcome aboard. Hey, nice to meet you too, Steve. All right. Uh, we got a lot on the agenda tonight, so I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time. Just a couple items I've got my eyes on. I watched a plant or public safety commission meeting last week and the issue of generators and uh, evacuations and power shutoffs and when the generators get used or don't get used came up. Everybody seemed to be fairly confused over the whole idea. So I wanna do some more study on that and maybe bring that back as an item later on just to discuss it, to make sure we're doing the right thing because it seems a little squirrely. I mean, you know, we, we built a plan to deal with evacuations which you only have like, you know, one every 10 years or eight years, whatever the time is, and we got these power cutoffs taking place five or six a year. So if, if we had built the plan to take care of the power cutoffs, we probably could have taken care of the plan for the evacuation, but we'll do that later. Uh, the Prop 19 thing, Craig Hill mentioned, I've got a, a couple calls on that, and I, I'm going to let the city sort of work its way through that with Trevor to figure how that works. Uh, I do think the plan that said, there, the request that says put these short-term rental permits online is a good idea. Uh, you know, somewhere later in the agenda is the item that says, you know, we're, we're uh, overburdening staff by making them go through and do manual pulls 
for data every time somebody wants one. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, you know, the residents are going to be concerned about short-term rentals on a Friday night, a Saturday night when they're going on. They're going to look for information, so they should be able to get that online. It'll make staff's life easier. It'll make the residents' lives better. So I, I hope we can sort of proceed down that line. And with that, and with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mikey. I have more to say as we sort of move down the line and I get a little smarter. Thank Mayor, you if I might, I just wanted to uh, uh, let uh, Steve know that um, part of the mid-year budget will include some information about the cost to roll out those generators um, for every PSPS event. So he'll have the opportunity to discuss it as part of the budget. Um, and then if that doesn't uh, suffice, we can certainly bring it back as a separate item. But uh, we know that it was of interest to the Public Safety Commission and felt that we could just include it as part of the budget discussion. So just want to Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Bruce? Thank you. So um, I had some pre-planned comments, but I want to address some of the comments from the community first. And I, I, I'm, I think this is great that so many people signed up to speak. And I think there's more later, and um, this is what we're here for. We should, we should have the community discussion. Pam, first of all, I, I did not know about your mother. I'm, I'm, you know, there's nothing I can say other than I, my heart is with you for that. Did not know about that. COVID-19. It was good to submit some good information from Doug. Um, I had inquired about statistics from um, Susan Duenas a few weeks ago. Uh, it was interesting that, you know, we, we hear a lot of numbers, but just by way of comparison, we in Malibu have substantially lower percentage of cases per, per population and deaths per population than the county, the city of Los Angeles, Santa Monica, Interestingly, we're about on par with Calabasas, Agoura Hills. Uh, for some reason, Westlake is way better than we are. Assuming the statistics are all accurate, Westlake's doing way better. And all I can speculate is that maybe that's because they're not forced to deal with thousands of tourists that come from, that, from Los Angeles and bring the virus with them. So I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, um, but that, that, that has been a concern of mine. Uh, Mark. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, I, first of all, I, I think there's a misunderstanding among many members of the community as to um, where I am heading or would like to head with an investigation. And, and I wrote this earlier today. I'm going to say it again. For the record, I have no vendetta or desire to find Reva Feldman has committed any crime or is corrupt. And I actually hope that an independent internal investigation clears her of any such misconduct to the extent any has been alleged. And I'm not aware that it has. I said as much on December 14, I meant it then, and I mean it now. And I'm gonna have some other things to say about the city manager later, some complimentary, some not. I do believe, and I'm so, and a lot of people don't like to hear this, but I do believe that Reva Feldman is deceitful, duplicitous, and unethical. That's not criminal, that's not corrupt. And I believe she should be replaced as a matter of the discretion of the city council, not for cause, but because of those things. And I have, I have lots of information I can go into to the extent anyone really cares about the facts. The facts are important, but it's not because of anything in the Wagner affidavit. It's not because of any alleged criminality or corruption of which I'm not even aware, not an allegation even with respect to Reva Feldman. Okay. Um, the comment that I'm a rookie, I should understand that statutes can't be developed the way they are. I have extensive experience drafting statutes. I've, I've drafted, I've been the initial drafter and I've been on many committees drafting statutes that govern the largest corporations in the world. I did that for 15 years. I, I'm not a rookie when it comes to statutory construction, statutory development, just so you understand that. Dana Gralick, I'm sorry you believe that what my con that my conduct constitutes or seems to constitute, constitute sexual discrimination. My feelings about the city manager have zero to do with gender. They've got everything to do with facts. And again, I'll discuss those facts later. Mr. Haldeman, similar, hostile workplace. I, I, I don't believe so, but we can talk about that later. But I will say there have been a number of people that keep saying that I am hard on this, that I'm complaining about the city staff. Not true. Not once, not one word. To the contrary, 
every time I have interacted with the city staff, every time I have mentioned the city staff, it has been complimentary for me. I have twice or three times now publicly complimented Heather Glazer, who I think is a treasure, Kelsey Pettijohn, Alicia Freeman, Alex Montano, Susan Duenas. Every, if, you, if anyone were to look at every email I have written, and I have had no oral communications with the city, if you look at every email I've written, when I've referred to any member of staff, I've been nothing but complimentary. Don't believe that any of these individuals are problematic. I don't know what they would say about me. I'd love to hear it. But I have had nothing but positive things to say about them. I've had nothing but positive experience with them. And I don't even understand what a dox means. So I'm going to, uh, maybe someone can educate that, educate me about that. Craig, I think we do need to learn more about the transfer issues, so I, I hope you can educate us about that and we can figure out whether it's something, there, there's something we can do about it. Graham Clifford, well, um, homeless on private property, that's actually step two in what um, I'm working on with respect to the homeless on public property. And you may recall during the campaign, I actually encouraged every resident in Malibu to sign a letter of agency that would give the sheriff authorization to come onto private property and remove vagrants. Um, I, I sent that to 4,000 people in Malibu because it wasn't otherwise being done. I'd actually like to see as a next step, perhaps the city affirmatively get involved in soliciting those letters, perhaps even penalizing people who do not provide them, um, especially with vacant property. I think the owners of vacant property have a nuisance and I think that they perhaps need to provide security and some other things, but we'll be getting into that down the line. Um, I think that is my comments with respect to the, the, the comments I heard from the public. I mean, if I didn't mention you, I'm sorry, I listened to everything, I took notes. I, everything that everyone said made a lot of sense to me, including the criticisms of me. Now, I wanna say since December 14, I've been working more than 10 hours a day as a city council member. I've been preparing proposals to improve the city for the benefit of the residents. I've been speaking and exchanging emails with residents. I've been reviewing city council policies and resolutions. I've been studying the Malibu Municipal Code, the California Government Code, the Brown Act, and the California Public Records Act. I've been reviewing information I received that I've requested from the city, and I've been communicating my views and answering questions on social media, which I have an absolute First Amendment right to do, and which um, there's an amendment to the Brown Act that's going to explicitly clarify that that's okay under the Brown Act. I've also been forced to spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with the city manager. Just a fact, she's thrown up roadblock after roadblock to my efforts to educate myself so that I can satisfy my responsibility to serve the community. I estimate that I have been forced to waste at least 20 hours a week dealing with problems caused by the city manager's recalcitrance and insubordination. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. And the 20 hour estimate is conservative. It's probably much higher. When the polls closed on November 3rd, I knew that the city manager would be secure in her job unless the three of Andy Lyon, Steve Ewing, and I were elected. I was resigned to accept that fact. I had made a campaign commitment to press for the city manager's replacement. And again, not for cause, as a matter of discretion. And I knew I'd be voted down if anyone other than Steve, Andy, and I were elected. I understood that. I understand how things work. I had no intention of pursuing the matter beyond a straight up or down vote that I was gonna request unless the city manager thereafter did something to provide cause for removal. When the polls closed on November 3rd, I had made a campaign commitment to press to investigate any credible claims of wrongdoing. I had only heard of rumors of criminality and corruption. I didn't think those rumors were sufficient for me at that point in time to press for an investigation and had no intention of doing so at that, on, as of that day. It wasn't until after election day that I did come to appreciate the serious duplicity and deceitfulness of the city manager. And it is not harassment to state true facts. It was also not until after election day that Jefferson Wagner told me for the first time about his personal experience that he later included in his, in his sworn affidavit. I didn't know those facts. Based on my post-election experience with the city manager, I am now convinced that she's a contemptible person 
who should not be running our precious city. Her actions are giving me every reason to believe that she has something to hide, or at least she seems to believe she has something to hide, because honest and innocent people simply do not act the way she's been acting. Based on my post-election interaction with Jefferson Wagner, I am now convinced that an independent internal investigation is required to clear the air by providing the city with either a clean bill of health, which I sincerely hope to be the case. There's an item on that coming up, Bruce. Excuse me? A, we have an item on that, so we should. Okay. That, I think, I I think say, that's I on the agenda. I will not say more about that. I just wanted to make a point. I have been accused of being divisive, including by Mayor Pearson who used his comment time at a city council meeting when I was still a private citizen to berate me for being divisive in his view and for acting in a manner characterized as harassment of the city manager based on, I will say, false information at that time. I have other things I could say about that, but I'm not going, I will just say it takes two to tango. There can't be divisiveness unless there is division. And it doesn't, it doesn't, one person cannot create divisiveness. Now there's an unfortunate human dynamic in national politics today. We all witnessed that on Wednesday in, in, in vivid color. There's a large group of people who are so enamored with Donald Trump that he can't say, say or do anything wrong. And they believe that anyone who opposes him is involved in a criminal conspiracy. Every single thing. There's also a large group of people who so despise Donald Trump that they view him as evil incarnate, incapable of saying or doing anything that's not criminal or immoral. Unsurprisingly, a similar, albeit less dramatic, dynamic exists in Malibu. Just as Malibu is impacted by the international pandemic, climate change, and the effects of the wealth divide that fuels homelessness and other human tragedies, Malibu is impacted by polarizing politi partisan political views. It is a fact of the world we live in today. Now, you may not believe this, but I am not someone who sees things in black and white. I see the world as multicolored and multi-textured in which no person is good or bad, and no, no, no issue is black or white. As William Shakespeare wrote, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. There are some people in Malibu who view me as a bully, a cancer, or worse. I know that because I read it on social media, and I heard Ms. Baum say it a few weeks ago. That perception colors their view of my words and my deeds, like blinders on a horse. That's their problem, not my problem. There also are people who view the city manager that way. I'm not one of them. As I said before, I understand that people are not black or white or entirely good or entirely bad. In the time since the election, I've witnessed some good accomplishments by the city manager, for which I promptly and sincerely complimented her and given her credit. You won't see those emails in anything that she's put into the public record, but they exist, okay? I've also witnessed many acts by the city manager that are deeply problematic, unethical, and may well be unlawful. And I'm not talking about criminality, but which, and which I will not hesitate to call out. Now, throughout this evening and beyond, I'm going to be discussing evidence, facts, that show the city manager has engaged in multiple acts of dishonesty, duplicity, and generally unethical behavior. If council members Pearson, Farrer, and at Ferrer and Grisanti continue to take the side of the city manager no matter what she does, and if they want to continue to view absolutely everything I do as divisive, that's their problem, not mine. I understand I won't get much done, but it's not my problem. I won't back down to extortionate behavior for the sake of getting along. Now, before concluding my remarks, I just want to touch upon a few things that have occurred in the past few weeks that require a little greater discussion later tonight or at some other appropriate time. I have discovered that the city manager has created and maintains an email destruction policy that is at bare minimum the opposite. That's, a, that's agendized too, which I'm, we have I'm, a lot to do. I, so. I'm just trying to get well, us am moving. I, am I being told I can't speak further? You, yeah. you can speak, but if it's on the agenda, let's let's get to the agenda. Well, we're not, we're, I doubt we're going to get to it. Um, but so anyway, that, that, that document destruction policy that's been created by the city manager violates the city's document retention policy adopted by a resolution of the city council and it may violate the California Public Records Act. It also serves to conceal information relevant to ascertaining whether the city manager, city staff, and city council members comply with or violate the Brown Act. After weeks of back and forth, and this is not on the agenda, the city manager finally relented to turning off the city's auto-delete function until this subject can be discussed by city council. 
Nonetheless, she has appeared, someone has turned off the email forwarding function I activated for my own emails so that I can't make sure that they're retained. Over the past month, we're going to talk about documents later. I'll skip that. As I did last time we were gathered, this is my last remarks, I want to repeat my gratitude for the more than 2,400 residents who had sufficient trust and confidence to vote for me. Whatever anyone may think of me, which is not my business, I will continue to honor the many commitments I made during the campaign to those who voted for me. I will not appease the people who opposed my election by backing <clears throat> down on the commitments I made to the people who supported my election. That would be unethical. And if that ruffles feathers and upsets some people, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Thank you. Okay, um, Karen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I too would like to thank all of the speakers. Um, we seem to be on a theme tonight with most of the public speakers on item 2A, and I agree with you. I wanna say what I saw and what we all saw on Wednesday in the nation's capital was the result of one thing, conspiracy theory. This city is not immune. We're seeing that right now. We're not headed in a good place where everything is suspect, everyone is suspect. Um, Bruce, I, I wanna thank you for acknowledging the city staff and the job that they do, and especially in this difficult time. And I'd like you to think about something. Who hired those people? And who's retained them? Yeah, that's Reva Feldman, the city manager. I didn't hear you thank her. So we have seen tragic consequences this week. And I pray to God we never get to the death and destruction that we saw in Washington, D.C., but we're not headed in a good place. Uh, some of the speakers tonight made a list of some of the things that we need to work on. I'd like to remind you what needs to be done here. Uh, let's see. Fire rebuilds. PCH problems, school district separation, upgrading the water infrastructure, protecting our environment. We have so many things going on here. We are now at the point of practically coming to a standstill because so much time is being devoted to addressing your requests, your unilateral demands on the city no single council member gets to tell the city manager or anybody at the city what to do. We decide that as a voting body. So congratulations, you get one of five votes. We, we have an item on that tonight. Great, thank you. I will not belabor that point. So yeah, the Trump reference, obviously we have a similar dynamic here in Malibu. You might wanna look in the mirror. Uh, the talk about the independent investigation I know comes later in the uh, agenda, but those two words, independent internal investigation, that's a contradiction in terms. So I don't know what you're thinking. All right, so um, I'll save my other comments for the agenda items, and that's me. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Oh, you're muted. I want to formally welcome John Cotty. And uh, I don't think I did it last time we met. Uh, and thank him for coming and for answering my questions when, when I leave him an email. Uh, I would also like to thank the people who spoke tonight I'd especially like to thank our, our public safety people who reported to us on what's being done to handle people parking, all the stuff that's going on and what we've got coming. 
which I happen to know is some more no parking signs. And I think that they, we've made great progress on something that's coming up later tonight. And other than that, let's get to the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I wanna start off by one thing I, I forgot earlier. I want to uh, hope that we can adjourn this meeting in the memory of uh, Bill Conacher, who was a fixture in Malibu for many years and a um, little bit of the chaos of getting going. I, I forgot to mention that, so. Um, a great loss for the city of Malibu there. Also, um, I want to echo calls for peace and civility. I, I'm still beyond horrified what happened last week, as I think we all are. Um, I have read the emails we received from uh, Amnesty International. Quite a few people have sent it. And um, we have been in communication with our sheriffs on this. And um, it's just really sad to see our country so divided. And I think so many of us were so hopeful that coming into this new year, we could find that common ground and move forward. And I, and I hope and pray um, that we can do that as a city and I, I vow to be, do everything I can to help push that forward personally and as the mayor and as just a citizen of Malibu. I want to ask the council quickly here, there's something I haven't brought up and I wanna ask if there's consensus to explore it as a council and something I've brought up Last year, I wanna bring it up this year. And I know we're past, we're in the new year, but I wanna ask if there's consensus to discuss, and we can discuss it anyhow, but I wanna bring it up in advance because I'm hoping to get some stats included maybe. If there's consensus to discuss whether we should do another fee waiver for the homes that burned down in Malibu and the people still rebuilding. And the reason I asked that, I, I, I sense there was some burnout in that with the previous city council, but to me, some of the people now that are trying to rebuild are the most impacted. They've had to deal with the most issues. And so I am concerned. I, 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 I talked to quite a few of them. They've had huge insurance issues, lawsuit issues, um, or, or actually some of them have, as I've said before, issues where, you know, just because their home burned down and they were underinsured didn't mean other things happened, like illness in the family, death in the family, loss of a job, it goes on and on. So I would like to see maybe if by a sh show of hands or this consensus to uh, discuss this next next week, our next meeting. Okay. So I, just we make this part of the mid-year budget review? Yeah, that's what I was saying. And the only reason I wanted consensus is I guess, because I feel it's important, <laughs> but also because uh, I would hope to like to see some sort of stats on what it looks like, where we still have to go, and what it what it might cost, and maybe we don't have them by next meeting. But I think it's important we look at the numbers too, because obviously this has not been an inexpensive um, proposition that we've been doing so far. So, um, so thank you, I thank you for the consensus, and uh, I have uh, we have lots to do. So let's get going. Let's keep going. We're on to the consent calendar now. And uh, before I ask which what counselors might want to pull, what what um, Heather, what who what do we have that the uh, public wants to pull? We have four items that have been pulled by the public. They are three A one, three B two, three B eight, and three B nine. Okay. What items do we have by the council that want to be pulled, Bruce? Three, four, six, and seven. Three B three. I'm sorry. Three B four. Three B six. Six and three B seven. I just have a few easy questions about them. Okay. So, um, <laughs> can I get a motion on consent for three B five? Because that's the only one left. Uh, Steve, uh, your mic's off. 
I'll make a motion through three B five. Okay, a uh, second, please. Okay, there, there's what you skipped three A one. Um, I thought I heard it get pulled. No, the three A one was pulled by the public. Oh, A one also. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll second Steve's motion. Okay, fine. Um, can we have roll call on that, please? And then also just to clarify, three D one is a form item. Um, so I believe you wanted to approve that as well. Oh, I am wait sorry. Further reading yes. of ordinances. Thank you for being so on it. Three B one. So then. I guess, can we amend the uh, the yep. motion to 3B1 and 3B5? I will, I will make that amendment. Okay, uh, Bruce, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I just wanna jump in. Do you wanna include 3B3 in that as well? I had it, I circled it as pulled. Did I make a mistake? Oh, no, it was pulled. It was pulled, yeah. Wait, what's 3B1? Um, 3B1 doesn't have a staff report. It's just a form item on the agenda to waive further reading of ordinances so the city attorney can just read the title. Okay, so we have, I think, an amended motion to pass on consent 3B1 and 3B5. Is that correct? That's, yes. that's right. That's my motion. Okay, and your second so good, Bruce? Okay. Sure. So let's have roll call, please. Count, uh, Councilmember Uri? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, uh, 3A1 will be the first item, hang on. Second reading adoption of ordinance number 477. I'm not, I don't have notes on who pulled what. Can we? This was pulled by the public. So would you like to hear from the speaker? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. This was pulled by Jeff Lauks. Okay, Jeff, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, Jeff. Okay, well, thank you all council for your tireless service for our beloved community. I know it's kind of a stressful meeting. So what I like to do in, under these circumstances is just take a really deep breath and then count my blessings and just be grateful for all of our blessings that we have. One of them being living here in Malibu. I mean, I have to pinch myself sometimes. It's just so wonderful here, but thank you because I know you guys do a lot of work and it's, you know, always get appreciation, but you, you know, we all appreciate everything you do. So I was just gonna make one comment on this. Um, first of all, you know, for this wireless ordinance, you know, we we're very grateful for the progress the city's making towards this. Um, we, there's this one amendment, ordinance 477 uh, basically provides a procedure where applications will be processed uh, administratively by a director and the appeals from the application approvals will be reviewed by an appointed hearing officer um, instead of the city council. I talked about this before, but we would really, really feel much, much better that if there's an appeal that the city council makes the final decision on it instead of an independent person that's not an elected official. Um, we just think that, you know, as elected officials, you, you live in Malibu, you have our back, uh, someone else that we don't really know, they may have a different agenda. We just don't want the final decision on appeals for these um, antennas to be from someone else other than our elected officials. So we do really appreciate your consideration, but um, I think during the last meeting, the last two meetings actually, I thought we had a consensus from the council members that they were in favor for that, but maybe it just slipped through the cracks or something, but um, just we just want you to just really Think of that one and see if we could have that. You have enough on your plate, but we do have um, checks and balances for shot clock, shock, shot clock violations and things like that. So it won't be, a, it shouldn't be an issue. But thanks again. And I'll, you know, we're still on meeting, so I'm gonna sign off, but thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you in particular for the deep breath. I appreciate it very much. And we are blessed. Um, do we have any other public speakers? That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, we're, we're back here at council. Um, council comments? Or, or a motion? I, I guess, since you know comments, I would say that Jeff, my, my worry 
was that getting the council together is a, a bigger ordeal. And I was hoping that we could take a look at how having, I can't remember the name now, darn it, the person <laughs> oversee it goes. And if it doesn't go right, let's, we can change it right away. Um, I'm hopeful that that goes well because I don't want to lose a ton of time trying to get this on a council unless I'm reading this wrong. Um, so I guess I would ask Reva, don't we have a, I mean, that it seems like those items could end up taking a while to get to city council if it goes that way. And that was my concern. I mean, it certainly depends on the timing of when it is brought forward and if it's at a time where we wouldn't have time to add it to an agenda, or perhaps it was at the time where maybe it's one of the months when we're dark on a meeting, it could create a problem. Um, so you certainly can amend the ordinance at any time and the city attorney can certainly speak more to that um, if you, you aren't interested in adopting it on second reading tonight and you wanted to make changes that would need to come back for first reading. I, personally, I, I, I was thinking we were, I thought we had sort of voted to try the uh, position whose name I've forgotten entirely um, to see how that went. And I appreciate Jeff's concern and the public's concern. Um, but I worry about, yes, if we get into a situation where we can't get to it in time, that would be a disaster. And I will hear comments from Steve next. Mikey, I think you're right. Let's run it as a pilot program like we got it designed right now, see what happens. You can always modify it quickly if we have to. And, and I would add, thank you, Steve. I would add that, um, and I would hope that uh, that incredible team of residents keeps an eye on this and, and lets us know if, if we've missed the mark in this. Um, and certainly, uh, I think we can all try and make sure that the person reviewing these um, you know, reflects our desires on this. And if not, let, let's change it instantly. Let's let's bring it up immediately. So that would, that's to be where I'm at. And I, maybe it's not what you want to hear, but I, I think it's the safest way not to lose something important that gets caught where we just can't hear it in time. Um, that's my, that's my feelings. And I'm open to a, a motion or other considerations at this point. I, I agree with you, Mikey, and with you, Steve. Uh, and with the shot clock consideration, uh, it's, it's very predictable that we'll miss something. So yeah, as you said, we can change it. Um, and we have a huge partnership with uh, the community members that have been vocal on this. Can I get a, a, a motion unless there's more comments? Stay, uh, Paul, you look like you have a comment. I think you have a motion. I'd like to call oh, we the did? question. I missed. <laughs> I missed the motion. Who made the motion? Steve did, I thought. Okay, sorry. Did you make a motion, Steve? And I just I, I agreed with you. If that's a motion, I'm in. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll second it then. Okay, so sounds like we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Abstain. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We have 3B2 now. And I think, was that pulled by you, Bruce? 3B2 was pulled by the public. Would by you like public. to hear from the speaker? Yes, of course. It was pulled by Ryan Embry. Okay. Ryan, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, this is the uh, warrants, which is basically the check register for the city. And there's, you know, about 24 or 25 of these pay periods every year. This warrant register is one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the city's history with $3,581,000 um, $81, um, being spent. The package is 55 pages long of just these records. And I've spoken to this many times over the years, even when Reva Feldman was the city's, uh, I think, finance director, that this document and all of them need to be uh, readily searchable as designed by the software programmers that create the PDF format. 
Now, I, I fully understand the city can search the native database of this uh, electronic software. That's not the point. But these documents, I was assured, and Reva probably remembers this, and um, yeah, I know there's a videotape for it as well, that we were assured that all of these documents going forward, and this was probably half a dozen years ago, would be in searchable form. And this document is not. I want you to um, either formalize this in some policy that all of this money you're spending on digitization of records, which goes back five years and you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this, that somebody go into the software and change the default program settings that all PDFs that the city creates shall be searchable in the form of the software so that the residents can easily see how our tax dollars are spent in the city. And so therefore people won't come in and say, hey, this, that. It's all public money. There's nothing to be ashamed of or to be hidden. And so in all this renewed emphasis on transparency, please institute that policy. And my earlier request is, since all these documents are readily available, make them easily accessible by a, a easy link on the city's website going back maybe just the last three years. Anybody can download and review these documents, but please have a staff member ensure that every one of them are in searchable form under the basic PDF protocol. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. Are there any more speakers on this item? That was our only speaker for this item. Okay, great. Bruce? Now, I, I thought perhaps we were gonna get a report from the city manager beforehand, but I'll say this. It, it's the responsibility of city council to make sure the city manager is spending the residents' money appropriately and honestly. During the course of the campaign for city council, multiple candidates included fiscal responsibility on their platforms, and I was one of them. This item goes to the heart of that issue. This item requests that the city council approve the expenditure of more than $4 million of the funds of the residents. I have multiple questions about this agenda item. Uh, I had wished to be able to get answers to those questions in a Zoom conference call with the city manager that would be recorded and available for the public to see the answers, but I couldn't get that done because I can only speak to her if I forfeit my legal right to record the meeting. Um, I informed the city manager earlier today that I had a number of questions and that I would hope she'd be prepared at the meeting to answer them. She responded that she'd like to know what the questions were and I promptly sent them to her. So I'm hoping that she's in a position to answer the questions. I can read them. Well, actually, I'll, I'll ask her when she answers them to please identify the words she's responding to so that everyone understands what the question is and then what the answer is. Or I can ask them one at a time and we can get an answer. But I have a number of questions. I would have rather not had to do this tonight. But again, I'm not able to get records without approval from people. I can't speak to the city manager unless I do so privately, which I will not do. And that's just not acceptable. So um, I'd like to hear the answers. So I'm gonna have uh, Assistant City Manager Lisa speak to the questions that he had on a numerous um, uh, checks that were, are represented in the warrant register, but just uh, very quickly, um, the city adopts its annual budget every year. And in that are particular line items that the council approves. Um, many of the checks that uh, he's questioned um, have to do with larger contracts that have been, um, uh, those contracts have been approved by the city council. Um, most of them, or if not all of them, have gone out through a request for proposal process and then those professional services agreements are brought to the city council for approval and in those staff reports um, it always indicates uh, that the funds are available in the adopted budget and then in my role as the city manager um, I have the ability to make sure that those things are appropriately um, uh, expended um, everything is done by a purchase order in our general ledger 
And all of those records are obviously public records, certainly available to anybody who wants to see them. Um, you know, both uh, Paul and Steve uh, on their orientation meeting with me, um, I gave them a quick tour of our accounting records and where things are kept. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that get paid through the city, um, but those records are all certainly available. So I'll let Lisa answer the questions that he had on specific checks. Thank you. Well, Thank before you. we before you answer the questions Good on evening, the specific, Mayor and Council. Before you answer the questions on the specific checks, which don't come up until question number three, I would like answers to questions number one and number two, which have to do with your refer your, your the work you did to confirm that this warrant is accurate. So should I read the question specifically? At least that's gonna answer those questions. That's I, her role as assistant city manager. Thank you. I, I'm prepared to answer the questions. Um, first, I would like to, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, first, I'd like to address Ryan Embry's question about this war and statement that this warrant register is larger than most. And that has to do with the timing of the city council meeting. Uh, we did not have meeting um, for over a month. We didn't have the second meeting in December as we normally do, so we were dark. That doesn't mean that the city doesn't still have to pay its bills. So bills were being paid all along and at our first opportunity, we are presenting them to the council. Um, let me give for council member Silverstein and the rest of you a little bit of history of how these warrant registers are prepared and all the invoices come to the city. So we bring the warrant register to the city council for notification and ratification after the payments have been made. And this is typical process for small cities. Um, everything paid on the warrant register has been included in the city's annual budget um, and has been approved by council as part of the budget process. Additionally, all contracts in excess of $25,000 are brought to the council for approval. And as Reva mentioned, it spells out in those staff reports where the funding is coming from, which line items in the budget, where, and that there is enough money. If there isn't funding included in the budget, typically we would ask the council for an appropriation to pay for something. Um, we haven't been doing that for a long time because we've been in a, in a mode of belt tightening. So the city receives invoices regularly and they're routed to all the departments for coding. The staff reviews the invoices for correctness and codes them appropriately. And staff with direct knowledge of the work performed and the materials provided make sure that the invoice is accurate. Those invoices are then routed to the department heads for review and approval. Then they're sent to the finance department where they are subject to another review. All contracts are given purchase order numbers to track payments to ensure that no payments are made over the approved agreement amount. The invoices are collected into a weekly batch for payment that is first reviewed by the finance manager. I do a final review of the batch to check for accuracy and conformance with the adopted budget. Finally, the city is audited annually by an independent audit firm. The auditors review the city's financial documents twice a year. During these reviews, the auditors test the city payments by pulling a selection of invoices to make sure that the proper procedures are being followed. The city has never had an audit finding regarding these payments. The finance department maintains the original invoices and check stubs, and they can be made available for review at City Hall for anyone who wishes to see them. Um, I do have, um, and certainly Reva, I, I supervise everything. Reva has her hands on a number of invoices directly and also checks the work periodically. Um, I do have specific um, answers to who the various contractors were that uh, Council Member Silverstein mentioned in his email. Um, Burn Specific Construction is the city's street maintenance contractor, um, and they provide a variety of services um, annually. Um, and again, that is a contract that is approved by the Council. 
GMZ Engineering is the contractor for the Civic Center Way improvements. So that's a capital project. Again, why those are large um, dollar amounts. Woodard and Current is the engineering firm that's designing phase two of the Civic Center water treatment facility. Landscape Development Inc. is the landscape maintenance contractor for the city's parks. Cotton Shires and Associates performs geology, coastal engineering, and environmental health reviews of projects submitted to building and safety. And again, all of these vendors have agreements that have been approved by the city council to provide the services and are associated with line items in the city's budget. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that I didn't get. Okay, well, all you answered just now of everything I wrote on a full page was one question. What are these contracts? I still haven't, so let's go through the specifics because you did not give an answer to any of the specifics I asked. You gave a very generic explanation of how things get done. And you know, this is, this is not something I'm unaccustomed to having occur when I ask questions. So the warrant register states, in accordance with government code section 37202, I certify, it's, and it's a certification for the city manager, that the above demands are accurate and that funds are available for payment thereof. It then says, the certification is based on an examination of source documents relating to randomly selected sample of transactions and analysis of cash flow reports. The questions I asked were what source documents were reviewed prior to today? When did that review occur? How long did it take? How were the sample transactions randomly selected? By whom were they selected? What cash flow reports were analyzed? What form did that analysis take? Is there a record of this review and analysis that supports the payment of more than $4 million of Malibu's funds to various payees? Are you able to answer those questions or do I have to have a private conversation, which I hopefully can have recorded to get the answers? So I'll be happy to answer those questions and I certainly appreciate you digging into how uh, we manage our finances. So um, as city manager, I do delegate some of uh, the things that need to get done. I don't have the capacity to do absolutely every task in city hall, though at times I have and um, having been with the city um, as long as I have, I certainly have had the opportunity to do pretty much everything in the finance department. Um, but our finance manager manages our cash flow on a daily basis. That is her, one of her uh, roles. So she um, manages it through our portals with our bank account. Um, and she and the assistant city manager coordinate on making sure that there's sufficient funds uh, in the checking account to keep uh, everything going in terms of the cash flow. And more than happy to go over any of that. If you'd like to come into city hall, we can show you how all of that works. It's uh, something we, we do every single day. Um, and then uh, the city manager, I mean, the assistant city manager, as she explained, does personally go through every single um, accounts payable check um, and, and uh, invoice that comes in um, before the check is cut. Um, and that sometimes can be several hundred documents a week that she's reviewing. If she's not available, it's something that I do personally. Um, and our finance manager also has the authority to do that. So we are double checking, as she said, that everything is um, um, appropriate. And I certainly um, review accounts payable things all the time as well. Um, so that's our random set sampling. And then again, as we mentioned, we do have our independent auditors who do come in and they do a very thorough uh, review. I'm happy to introduce you to them and they can explain their processes and how they do sampling um, and how they uh, ensure that things are, are handled pro properly. So um, I feel completely confident in certifying that the warrant register um, is accurate and that everything has been uh, properly accounted for. Um, in terms of your other questions, um, in terms of other council members, uh, this uh, couple, last week, Mayor Pearson did have a question on a couple um, of the checks and I provided him those answers by email. Um, if I'm not mistaken, when I spoke with Steve, he had a question about the warrant register, if I remembering that correctly. Um, but it's something that uh, council members all the time have asked both me and Lisa. Uh, we welcome the scrutiny. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody is comfortable. Uh, we take uh, spending taxpayer dollars, something uh, that we take very, very seriously and want it to be as open and transparent as, uh, as we can. So I think um, that answers 
all of your questions. I don't know off the top of my head what exact source documents uh, I looked at. This is going back over a month. Again, I look at thousands of documents, so I don't remember that off the top of my head, but if that's something you want going forward, we can certainly make a note of it. Okay, so the record will reflect what you answered compared to the question. I'll move on to other questions that I asked. Um, I asked about a $97,000 and change um, distribution to Best, Best, and Krager. You're more than welcome to I, look at any of the invoices, Bruce. You can, as I said, you're welcome to come to City Hall. Um, the uh, invoices with the city attorney are confidential, so I can't release those as part of, uh, to the members of the public, but all other invoices other than attorney uh, invoices um, are certainly uh, readily available for review. So you're welcome to come and look at them. Okay. So I asked if any other member of city council has seen the invoice prior to that. What is the answer to that? I'm sorry, the invoice to Best, Best and Krieger? No, no one has asked to see that, but I do review that and Lisa does review it and our finance manager does review it as well. And there have been plenty of times, you know, uh, John is, is new to, to us, but um, there's been many, many times where I have called the city attorney and asked for clarification on invoice. Again, uh, we, we look at everything. We're very, very thorough. So, so I, I specifically at your request gave you that question in writing. Why couldn't you have just answered it when I, I the question was, has any other member of the city council seen the I, I was in meetings this afternoon, Bruce. I'm sorry. I, I know you no, sent me an email, but right. I wasn't able to answer it. And I knew we were having a public meeting and, and this is the forum for the discussion. So I hope we've been able to answer what you needed this evening. Okay, I'm gonna go on. And, and I, I really hope that the public is observing the demeanor because I know people don't like my style but this is not how I expect someone who's responsible for this council to be providing information. I, it's not. Just like the, and I'm now gonna say- I'm sorry, I'm unclear. I've answered every single question okay. that you've asked and I'm more than happy to answer any further. Okay. I said Under that the documents are available for review and I've explained our processes and I'm more than happy to show them to you. Um, I, I, I'm asking Mayor, perhaps you can jump in and help me here, uh, Mayor Pearson, because I'm not clear on what I'm not answering. Can I ask the next question that's written down that you asked for? Because it's not been answered. So well, payment of $177,000 to burn specific construction. I asked, is this an hourly contract or a specific, specified payment for a specified project? Is this precisely the amount specific? specified? Can I finish? Is this precisely the amount specified in the contract or were there change orders or overages? Those so I don't, I don't have that document in front of me, but I can tell you that Burns Pacific is our street maintenance contractor. It's approved by contract. They um, have an hourly rate and they also have a rate for certain tasks. Um, Steve, did you have a question? No, go. when you finish, I just I, I may be able to help a little bit. Um, and so, um, you know, we can certainly show you how it's broken down, but um, when they, we go out to bid, they certainly bid on certain things on an hourly rate, on a per person rate. There's also charges that are made for equipment um, that they provide for the city. Um, and then there are special services so that, for example, over the summer, we had burns um, on a special call during the weekends when we had a high number of visitors and they came out and picked up trash. So their invoices for those periods would also include that, but it is uh, very detailed in terms of the hourly rate, the number of personnel, what tasks they were doing, what equipment was used, what materials were purchased. And so uh, we do uh, uh, look at those very, very closely. So again, happy to share them with you. Yes, Steve. Mikey, maybe, maybe I could help here a little bit. And I'm gonna go back to my prior life where I was an auditor for Arthur Anderson and Company before they ran into Enron. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And one of the things you do in an audit, you, 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 the foundation of every audit is to go in and do procedural tests, where you go and you, you test the payroll process system. You know, do we have all the documents when somebody signs up? Can, can we track it to the number of hours they spent? Can we track it to whatever their rate was? And the same thing happens with accounts payable. You go back through a very thorough process of all the steps to make sure that, it, you know, you, you go back to the original contract, you go back to the person who signed off on that contract. You go back to the person who's approving the individual invoices. And that, that is the foundation of, of making an audit work. If you can't get past that step, the, the whole audit program changes because there's some perspective then that, that there's something going wrong and wrong there that you have to check on. You know, and, and 
And I understand that you're right. I mean, as you go through these large uh, warrant registers, doing a review and making sure you've got the big items covered. But boy, I mean, you know, based upon the fact that we've been through this audit a number of times, you've got good results. You, you've got to feel reasonably comfortable that the process of paying these things is working. So for whatever that's worth, that's just experience in a prior lifetime. So an audit does not check into questions such as the ones I'm asking about whether the payments were for the purpose of change orders or overages or were for the purpose of the original contract because the auditors don't care about that. All they care about is whether the work was performed and billed and paid. And I really am trying to dig down into these contracts and understand yeah. whether, for example, in excess of a million dollars that was paid to GMZ in the last month was exactly the amount of money that was originally contracted for under their bid that was accepted under an RFP, or whether it was the result of change orders and overages, which would not be improper. I just want to understand how this came to be. And I think that's part of our responsibility as city council to understand those things. And it's not an answer to tell me when I'm here to vote on whether to approve this warrant that I can find that out later and that you're happy to speak with me because that information should be available to answer these questions now so I can make a decision whether to vote in favor of authorizing the expenditure of $4 million. I'm, I might suggest that I, I had a lot of questions when I was first on city council too, and I wanted to know who these companies were and what, what was going on. And um, it is a bit of a process and it, it takes a little while to get it under your feet, but um, can we maybe agree that these questions get answered so we can at another time so we can move on or do we need to answer them now before we can get on to the people's business? If you're comfortable voting for this without knowing the answers, that's fine. I'm not. Like like Steve said, the reputation of our of our financial department is 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 wonderful. I've never seen anything improper at all. Um, it's always checked out completely. So I am I am comfortable, but you know that's me, and it's maybe not you. I just uh, hoping to find a way that we can get your questions answered, and we have a. A stacked agenda, which we're we're we're, we're falling behind on. we and I'm just seeing if there's a way we can answer your questions and move forward. Mikey, yes, Steve. I can. I mean, and I, you know, I would say, look, Bruce deserves answers to his questions, but I think you're right. What we've got to do is start moving this process forward. So maybe if we can move move this, and you know, Riva and Lisa can agree to provide Bruce with the with detailed examples of what he's looking for. That you know, it won't happen. I don't, I don't know if you get the answers tonight, I'm, I'm, but uh, we'll you know, be happy to send him all of the invoices. He, he deserves asked, the answer, he... but I think you're right. We got to move this thing forward because I'm going to be an old man before this meeting's over. I think we're both old already. But um, Paul, you had a, a point, a question, or a motion? We're ready to move it forward. I'm ready to move it forward. Is that a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we move the question that we okay. pay the, that we pay these. I've, and as an aside, I spent 16 years on public works, and we looked at these contracts as they were coming in, the work that was going to be done. And the city has an excellent record of, the, for example, the paving company coming in below the bid and us being able to utilize the money for additional paving work. So, and as far as the GMZ contract goes, I think if when you look at it, you will find that you are paying for progress payments and hours work for those people towards the total bid amount. And I'm, uh, it's a complex job they're doing and it looks like they're making some progress on it and I'm sure it's gonna come in well, but we'll see. Mikey, I'll second that, assuming that Reva and Lisa will agree that give Bruce the information he's looking for in these invoices. Of course, it's our pleasure. Okay. You got a second. Okay. okay, Can are we okay to move forward to roll call? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Yurin? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Silverstein? Abstain. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. 
All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry, Mikey. Uh, I'd like to request a break. We've been in the meeting three hours and I will note that we're about a third of the way through consent. Uh, yes, okay, I agree. I was gonna try and make the end of uh, the consent calendar, but that looks to be a little bit off. So uh, it is, I can't see my computer clock for some reason because of the- Almost 9.25. 925. So let's try and be back in like seven, eight minutes. Let's try and a little before 935 if we can. 933. How's that? Cool. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You can turn off your cameras and mics if you like.
Okay, it looks like everyone's back. Uh, Alex, are we ready to go? Heather? I believe so, if they are. Okay, so we are back, everyone, at 9.38, and we are on to 3B3, um, meetings, minutes. Uh, was this your item, Bruce, that you pulled, or was it the public's? It was Bruce, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. I would like to request that we agree to, to postpone approving the minutes till next meeting so that I won't waste everyone's time tonight with a bunch of questions and comments on changes. I'll try to work them out with the city clerk and um, they'll either be agreeable or they won't and we can approve the minutes next time. Uh, okay, um, I'm fine with that. Um, does, I guess we have consensus on that. Um, all right, there we go. Now we have consensus on that. Do I guess we need a roll call on that motion? The motion will be to continue those to the next meeting. Okay, so Bruce made the motion. I seconded it. Steve thirded it. Thank you. Um, can we have a roll call on that, please? Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? No. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Uh, Paul, you're muted. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We're on to 3B4. I'm not sure who pulled this. This was pulled by Councilmember Silverstein. Okay, Bruce. I lost okay. my view of you. Hang on. Where'd you go? I got, I got I got gotcha. you. There we go. All right. So I think this will, I think this could be fairly straightforward. As I, as I understand this, it, it's a, a recommendation to approve an increase in an existing contract from twenty four thousand five hundred to forty thousand dollars, which is a sixty three percent increase. And I have two questions. One is, was the original contract subject to an RFP? And the second question is, is there a policy in place that prevents low bid contracts accepted in an RFP from being increased after they're accepted? Um, Yolan, did you want me to answer that or do you want to go ahead? Uh, I can answer the first uh, question. I, um, good evening, City Council. Um, item 3B4 that is before you is an amendment to the professional service for an agreement with Stone Environmental. Stone Environmental is in a specialized service. Um, it's a software that has been used by the city in regards of the um, on-site wastewater treatment system reporting. This includes our operating permits, our pumping uh, or our frequent pumping ordinance, and it facilitates the staff with the information and data so we can uh, send notices. Uh, currently, we are operating, the Environmental Sustainability Department is operating at 78% capacity. When I uh, a year ago, when I was part of the city, uh, 18, I had 18 staff members. I would currently have uh, 14. Uh, this, um, were we asking? Yes, is for for $15,500 in addition to the $24,500 that we um, asked for before. And this will help us facilitate the notices and report it. It will also facilitate that integration uh, that it will include into the city development database. The question from council member Silverstein is in regard if there was an RFP for this project. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is an specialized service. Uh, it wouldn't, it didn't go a year ago in an RFP. This uh, contract has been part of the city for several years before I, I was hired by the city. Um, as far as your second question, I'm sorry, would you please repeat it? Is there a policy in place that prevents low bid contracts accepted in an RFP from being increased after they're accepted? So if I could just jump in here and I uh, might ask the city attorney to assist me with this answer as well. But when you're looking at a pro uh, professional service that's a specialized service, um, you don't have to award the low bid. Um, that's a requirement under the public works uh, bidding 
a contract um, uh, area, but not under specialized services. And John, if you could expand on that for me. That's correct. There is no requirement to award a professional services agreement to the lowest bidder. And I note that all of our contracts contain a provision that any changes to contract term or price have to be approved by the city. So yes, that, that is in, that's written in the contract. It can't be changed without the authority of the city. Okay, so I just, just to be clear then, so there's not a policy that prevents low bid contracts accepted by an RFP from being increased after they're accepted? I'm not aware of a policy. The contract itself states that uh, the contract can't be changed without approval of the city. I'm not aware of a policy to that effect. It's written into the contract. It can, it can be increased after the low bid is accepted. Again, professional services do not require a low bid contract. It can be awarded to, to any that does qualified. I appreciate that you've answered that already. I, I, I got that information and I appreciate the information. All I'm, so I just wanna confirm that based on what I'm hearing, when a contract is accepted pursuant to an RFP, we can talk about the ones that are coming up, it can be increased down the line with the city's permission, notwithstanding the fact that it was accepted as the low bid, right? No, that's not entirely correct because the professional services agreement doesn't necessarily have to be the low bid. So if the, the contract itself cannot be increased, absent approval of the city, that is correct. The contract amount cannot be increased absent approval of the city. I'm, I must just be unclear in my question. I'll, 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 I'll pass. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, do we have a, a motion to move this item or more comments? Paul? I'd like to make a motion that we pay 3B4 or authorize 3B4. I'll second. Okay. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. Yes. Councilmember Uring. Yes. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We thank you. We are at three B six City Hall roof replacement project. Do we have a speaker, or was this uh, pulled by Paul? I mean by Bruce. We don't have any speakers on this item. Okay. Um, Bruce, did you have questions on this? I do. This, th so this one, as I understand it, there were three bids, one, two for approximately $500,000. One was half of that. And I want to understand why the one that's, why the one that is being accepted is half the amount of the other two. What, what accounts for that difference and what investigation has been done about the quality of the one that's being accepted because Usually when you look at three bids and one is that dramatically off from the others, there could be a problem. And I just like to understand what's going on here. So good evening, Council. I, um, I had the same question when, when we received bids. I, I was very um, concerned about the low bid here compared to everyone else. Um, so let me just back up a little bit. When we get bids, we go through a process. We have a checklist that we go through we, we make sure that the contractor has filled out all the required bid documents. They're required to submit in um, recommend or uh, references for past projects that they work on. We make those calls to the references, check on everything, check their licenses and check their bond information and make sure everything was good. Um, the the low bidder 101 roofing, uh, roofing and construction had excellent excellent um, references. We called other cities. They mentioned that they were um, very, very good to work with. Um, we then called them and we also posed the same question, especially when it's low bid and the differences are so much. Uh, we want to make sure that they're comfortable with their bid because, I mean, they're they're leaving about half off, off on, you know, on the table. Their second low bidder is almost double. Um, so, I, I, we we verified the, their their bid with them. They were fully comfortable on doing the project within the scope and their price. Um, they've they've done this work for other municipals um, throughout the area, specifically in Ventura County, and um, they are excited to come work with us and get this project done. So um, I, I was 
once again, too, I, I was very skeptical, but after talking to them and realizing how how they were comfortable with their bid, we also have a bid bond and bonds in, in place that if they don't come through and do the work um, according to our construction documents and contract, um, they have an insurance company that will take over the project and, and do it for the same price as they bid. So um, I'm very comfortable. I'm, I'm very happy to get these guys that they're, they're really looking forward to getting out here and doing this project. They had a lot of good ideas to get this thing going. So I'm fully capable. I'm fully confident in, in these contractors. Thanks, Rob. That's very helpful information. Okay. Appreciate it. Any more comments or a motion? No motion. I'll move to approve that one. Okay. Can I get a second? I'll second it. Okay, I think Steve, Steve beat you by a nanosecond. Steve okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Silverstein. Uh, but so I make one quick comment. Yeah, yes, I approve it. But I, and I neglect to say, hey, Rob, that's great. Congratulations on getting such a great bid on that one. Yes. Councilmember Yering. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Yes. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're on to 3B7, Amendment to Professional Service Agreement with Four Leaf Inc. for Expedited Woolsey Fire Consulting Services. Was this pulled by the public or are there public speakers? We don't have any public speakers on this item. Okay. I'll look uh, through all my pulling that one. Okay. Um, can I ask a, a technical question as it's been with Drawn, do we need a motion on it still since it was with, since it was uh, brought yes, out of consent? Yes, we okay. do since you already voted on the consent calendar. Okay, can I have a motion on this, please? Motion. I'll make a motion, move it. Okay, can I get a second? I second. Okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. 3B8, award agreements for wireless communication facility application review services. Um, I believe we have public speaker. We do. We have three speakers who are signed up for this. They're Great. Ryan Embry, Nicole McGinley, and Jonathan Kramer. Our first speaker will be Ryan Embry. Hi, Ryan. Uh, whenever you're ready. Yes, I want to thank the city uh, council, you, the mayor, and all the council that voted to move this uh, forward. We're starting way behind, so it's good that we're making progress. I wanted to um, say I think I should have submitted under the item that you put uh, earlier for the wireless ordinance, because under the proposal that you're doing under that, the uh, city staff will be approving some of these applications internally. And then the residents within the notice zone or the appealable zone will be told of the decision and their right to appeal. I want to make sure that for all of the work that is being done here, that you're not in that process creating a burden on the residents of this city to have to whip out a checkbook to pay for the city staff to review this stuff or to conduct an appeal for something that was internally approved and not really vetted in public. I think it's very important that uh, the public be involved with this, especially with the number of applications that are bombarding the planning department right now because frankly, Verizon Wireless wants to put in four or five times as many transmitters in the same space as a traditional cell site uh, or micro cell site even. Uh, and so that's, they're creating their own problem. But it, it shouldn't be up to the residents to be monitoring and watching their email for the tiny little yellow postcards, for instance, that, that we've heard have said, you know, or look the same as a film permit notice that comes out or they get stuck in a magazine, you hardly even see it, um, that these are shot clock, quick action items, and people aren't always available, so that the noticing needs to be wide, and it should not be the burden of a resident uh, to have to pay money to have um, an elected body review 
a decision that was made um, by a staff person, whether it's by contract or if it's by delegation or if it's by the planning manager, planning director, um, or this outside contractor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Nicole McGinley. Hi, Nicole, are you there? Hello. Hi, Nicole, I can hear you. Hi, Happy New Year, all. Um, as I've written, we fully support awarding this contract to CMS. And as I emailed last week, we only pull this because on page two in the staff report, it says, the two firms recommended by staff provide a multitude of services, including post-approval compliance, final inspections, RF emissions and noise testing, mapping of existing facilities, and enforcing of unpermitted facilities. Staff is seeking input from the council if staff should return with amendments to the agreements to include some or all of these services. And I say, yes, yes, and yes, all of them. Thank you, staff. Each of these services are directly responsive to issues and concerns raised. This is particularly so for the post-approval compliance and final inspection, topics that we've addressed at the last two meetings with regard to fire safety. Some council members have also expressed an interest in post-construction RF testing. And if and when assigning RF testing, please be specific to include field testing. We believe a project for mapping existing facilities would be useful for permitting issues and for emergency planning and response. We also agree that there should be an effort to identify any unpermitted facilities. The draft contract does not adequately or at least explicitly address non-RF engineering reviews to ensure the applicant has applied adequate design rigor with regard to structural and electrical fire safety. We do not read the draft contract to exclude this type of review, but believe it should be expressly included so it is clear that the consultants will be expected to pay particular attention to these matters and to ensure that all concerned are aware those topics will be an important part of the city's evaluation of and decision on each application. Um, also, uh, this is more of a legal question. Is it possible to include some language that is relatively open-ended that would allow anything that planning department or city council may find important within the parameters of what CMS is able to do? Um, for instance, if a new requirement becomes important and we don't list it now um, in this ever-changing field of telecom, is there some fluid language that we can allow for our consultants, excuse me, scope of services um, to navigate through these changes and continue to meet planning department or the city council's needs in processing these applications? Um, again, just something open-ended and adaptable. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for all the hard work. I mean, staff has been working incredibly hard on this lately. And um, I would just ask that we, you know, uh, approve this item with amendments um, to increase the scope of services. Okay. Thank you very much as always, Nicole. Our final speaker sign up for this item was Jonathan Kramer. He did include a note that he was here for questions only if the item was pulled. Um, so I'm not sure if he was just here for council member questions, but we can unmute him to check if you would like. Okay, great. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. I'm Jonathan Kramer, the senior partner at Telecom Law Firm. And as you move on, we wanna thank you for having us work with the city for so long and we have always enjoyed our relationship with the city. And since there are no questions, I'll just end with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Are there any more speakers? That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, we're back at the council and I see um, Paul's hand. I'd like to ask Ryan, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Nicole for her input, which is very helpful to me. And I'd, I'd like to ask Ryan uh, who, how he expects things to be monitored if, if the citizens are not empowered to, to help us. Is that something he can answer for us? 
Um, I'm not clear on what your question is exactly. Is how do citizens monitor this? No, no. I, my question, Ryan, was that that it seemed like you were saying that that we're doing uh, the yellow envelopes are wrong, and we need the yellow postcards, and we need to be doing something different uh, to to embrace the people. But you you said that they shouldn't have the burden of doing it, and I'm I'm hoping you can enlighten me as what to what you're suggesting. Um, well, or maybe you know, I misunderstood I entirely. I'll, I'll answer it. Can you, you can hear me, right? Yes, Absolutely. we can hear you. Okay. Is the city can send a full sized or a larger postcard. And this was brought up previously. And I, I thought you were in, in that meeting, Paul, but that the city could use a traditional size or a half page or uh, put something in an envelope. Uh, something that gives some more significance that a permanent change is going to occur out in the right of way, which might be in front of their house, and uh, to give it the uh, importance that is due. Richard, can you jump in for a minute and um, explain the change in the mailings that we've done? So, uh, in response to a public comment uh, in November timeframe, there was a concern that the the mailers we were sending out were just a little quarter sheet, just like any other development in the city. So in response to that, we did change the color of the mailers. And we also went to a half sheet size, so doubled the size. And we also worked on some of the changes in the language in there to make sure that folks realized that this was something, just not a house. It had to do with wireless in an attempt to try to solicit more information. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bruce? Yeah, th th this conversation is interesting to me. I, I understand that there's a, there's a cost involved in notices. So, and the more elaborate the notice, the more expensive. So, and, there, and there's a balancing that has to be done. But I, I do have to say, it, it's always been my experience as a, as a resident, anywhere I've lived, that um, Municipalities, when they send out these notices, especially the, the little the little ones on the card, they're doing what's minimally required of them by law so that they can then take the next step. They're not really trying to find out whether the residents care or have objections. They're just doing what the law says is the minimum they're required to do to be able to say they checked the box and they gave notice. You know, and that's fine, I guess, you know, I know that that's what Los Angeles does with Philadelphia, where I live, with Wilmington. You know, I guess there's a question of do we want to be like that or do we really want to be soliciting the input of our residents, not simply saying we complied with the law and they should have known. You know, it's like when you drive by a notice that's on a sign when you're going 40 miles an hour. It's, that's not notice. That's because the law requires that. So, you know, I, I think that's maybe what Ryan's getting at. I think that's what Paul was asking about. And, you know, I'd, I'd be in favor of getting the residents more involved in understanding when something's actually happening that can affect their rights than simply giving them the, the bare legal required notice so that when the thing is then done and no one objected, and then they later object, you say, well, you got the notice in the mail, so, we, you know, your time is up. We're doubling the size of the envelope uh, or the mailer does i'm curious does the does the uh notice direct people to anywhere on the website is there information there um and why did we double the size what other information are we putting out now that we didn't before so yes uh, to your question about directing them to the city's website we have the wireless page and we have been working with uh, folks like nicole and lonnie uh, Gordon, to take in their input so that we are trying to make this a little bit more friendly to the public. And in addition to doubling the size, like I mentioned, it, it's bigger and it's more colorful. It's a different color. That was one of the, the issues raised by a member of the public was, could you do something so this doesn't look like a house? So I, I know it's different. Um, and I, I think we might have gone to a hot pink, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but what we, we've done on there is we've, uh, we're, want a map to show them where it's going. And as I mentioned, direct them to the city's website. At the city's website, we have project status and updates and then also appeal information. 
And so we are actively seeking input. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm sure if you uh, were to uh, query Nicole, Nicole actually sent uh, one of the other staff members and I some other suggestions this weekend of things that perhaps would help with our outreach to uh, solicit these this type of comment from the public. Um, I hope that answers your question. Like I said, we're open to whatever we can do to make it better. And so we have been listening. Thank you. Uh, Paul? I'm sorry, Steve hasn't spoken yet and I saw you just raised his hand. Uh, just two, two questions dealing with money. And one was Ryan's questions, if they want to appeal it, is it the standard appeal form? I mean, appeal 750 bucks to get it appealed? Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. that, that hurts. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, the, the fiscal impact. Now, I think in the in the, the contract someplace, there were one someplace in the document. Yeah, the the guy it's three. They're charging us three hundred bucks an hour, and they're saying they've got to do it on an hourly basis because they don't know how long these reviews are going to take. Uh, and but in the front side, it says, okay, what we're going to do, the services rendered by the consultants will be funded by wireless communication application forms, planning fees. And then the rest of it, if it's over, that will be covered by the budget. So what is the fee going to be that's going to give us the best chance of getting the money from the wireless company versus taking it out of our budget? How do you do that? I just mechanically, that's an issue. You know, I just couldn't figure that out when I was looking at it. So what we do is there is a standard filing fee that uh, these folks pay. And like all city fees uh, in the planning department, our fees are based on a study that was a time and amount of work we look to find a value. And so there is that. So it's not just a, these fees aren't just pulled out of the air. There is some study that was done to them so that we know what the average amount of hours for an application, what that takes. And we based our fees on that. Anything beyond it, if there are revisions that are required to submit, uh, the planning department does have a revised plan submittal fee, and so we would be submitting an invoice to these uh, applicants as to what additional monies are necessary. So, so the applicant is going to pay the entire fees of the consultant? That is the goal of our, our budget, uh, the way it was uh, designed for these. Yeah, that's not what it says here, though, right? Right, but some like all planning fees for all development projects, you know, there is a certain amount of loss that's calculated into the city's. Yeah, I'm saying you're trying. To, what what is the fee for an application? You have an idea? I'd have to look it up for you. So I give the exact amount. I'm sorry. Your ballpark number. I I would have to look it up. If you give me a moment, I'd be glad to do that for you. Keith, maybe um, this is something that we could do an analysis for um, and, and bring that back with some more information for you that that might be helpful on on, on uh, a real analysis of, of what is it's costing us and what we're getting for it. Would that be helpful? Yeah, I mean, if you, I don't know if you want to go through all that work. I'm just trying to get a, you know, a ballpark sense that says the fees we're getting over here are going to cover the vast majority of these reviews we have to do over here. Some may roll over. And we'll, we'll cover that out of the budget, but I'm just wondering what the, the fee is to make me feel comfortable. We got the stuff. Apparently, this guy doesn't think you can do it in an hour, so it's got to be got to be greater than 300 bucks. I don't know what the number is, but I just I just don't want us to misspeak if we don't have the data in front of us. But um, we can certainly run that for you and, and provide it. Um, we can do that um, okay. yeah, for next meeting. And I saw numbers on it, and I can't quite remember them either. I want to say it was. See, I'd be guessing a thousand, twelve hundred, something like that. But I'm told I'm, I might be wrong. And we may want to also think about the seven fifty. I mean, appeal fee. That just you know, I mean, look, if you're building something in front of my house, and uh, I think it's really bad, and you're not going to go back to the city council to do that. You're going to go back to some third party guy, right? Who's uh, we may want to think about reducing that fee for this process. I just seven fifty seemed tied to me. If I'm being forced to wear aluminum helmets or something, whatever they're doing. So when we get into the um, uh, budget uh, discussion for next fiscal year, we do bring forward the fee schedule. And so we can certainly revisit it at that time. Okay. Um, and, and we'll make sure that we uh, keep track of all of the costs so that we can answer that correctly for you. And Steve, I think we should like 
we should look at how many appeals there are because I think if there's a lot of appeals, that's definitely an issue. There are going to be a lot of appeals, I would guess. You think so? And man, you know, what do you think? I, I don't know, actually. I don't know. I don't based know. Upon the, based upon the comments you've gotten so far, you know, and a yeah. number of these things that are going up, I think you're going to see some people, you know, complaining. So that's just, one, you know, it, it's a guess. I have no more yeah. basis for that than anybody else. What, what, a, where do we stand? Um, Nicole brought up great points on adding the additional services to the contract. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I'd like to hear some comments on that. And then, um, no RF reviews. I don't exactly know what that is, but I assume it's a safety review of some sort. And then, um, New language or how to how to craft language as things change or have it come back. I suspect it probably has to come back to us to be redone. I don't know how we would put in vague language successfully, but I, I, those are the three points um, that I heard from her. You know, Mikey, is there a way? I mean, who who's going to make the the FCC or the group that's going to make changes to the the rules that we would have to make new language for? Is that correct? I believe that's likely, or court. Okay. Karen? Karen? Thanks. Um, Reva, could you help us understand how fees are uh, determined? So um, the city uh, can, has to conduct a fee study anytime it uh, puts in a new fee. Um, and we did that several years ago. We did a comprehensive fee study that uh, an outside company came in and they look at all of our overhead administrative costs and staff costs associated with a particular task. Um, and we can't charge a fee that costs more than the cost to provide that service. So, um, you know, unlike in business um, in government, it's not supposed to be a money maker. We're just supposed to recoup uh, the funding um, that it costs us to provide something. And in and, and many times um, we actually don't recoup it. Um, that's something particularly true in the planning department because of the time that it takes uh, to, to do everything uh, associated with our planning rules and regulations. Um, but we do adopt a fee schedule on an annual basis, and um, we can certainly amend fees up and uh, or down. Particularly, we can't go up if it costs uh, less than it than it is. But we can certainly lower them down if that's something the council would like us to do. Karen, you still? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Richard. I believe you'd be the best person to comment on the scope of services. Certainly. Uh, it, it, as we mentioned in our last paragraph in the staff report, as Nicole referenced, the, the folks that we had a, conversations with, the four different consulting firms, um, some of them did offer services beyond the scope of the RFP that was approved by the city council, and that those services included some post-inspection, after the approval type inspections, where they would go out and actually verify that the right equipment was installed. Uh, for example, as the mayor had brought up about the RF energy that comes out of these sites, uh, CMS explained to us that, you know, they've ran into situations where it's say, we'll throw out a number, say a 20 watt transmitter on the plans, but they end up installing a 40 watt transmitter. So those are in types of inspections that we could include if the council so chooses to expand the scope of services that were requested. We could have those types of services provided to the city where these folks will go out post inspection and verify that the equipment is the, the correct equipment performing at the expectation levels of the approval. And then also look to see if something changes in the future. Uh, and we do understand from Malibu from Sa Malibu for Safe Tech, I hope I got that correct, that that is something that, you know, they're really hopeful the city will adopt. And then also I did a little bit of research real quick and just to get to uh, Councilmember Uring's uh, question, uh, it costs, the applicant pays right now uh, $3,500 per application for these WCF uh, type projects. And in some cases, it's a little higher if there's some re-reviews that have to take place. 
Okay, cool. Good thing we didn't go with my guess. Yeah, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. And, and this may be something we do when we get to the budget side over there. But, okay, so if the if this, a resident wants to appeal, they got to appeal to this third party, another guy we're paying, right? We're paying this other guy. The hearing officer. Yeah, we're going to have to pay him something. So I'm just wondering if, if there are enough appeals and we have to pay this guy on a per, per appeal basis, can that be included in, to increase the permit fee someplace down the line? Does that make sense? I mean, it's additional cost we're going to have. And if we can get, get the cost out of the telecom versus the resident, reduce the resident's permit appeal fee, we may be making everybody that we'll do that when we get to the budget. Don't worry about it. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> you answered we'll your own question. We'll be happy to explain and go through all that with you. Exactly. That's, I was just I was getting late. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. And the field testing would also include any un unpermitted additions as well, correct? Yes, that is correct. They would be making certain that what the city approves is what's actually in the field. And uh, to me, it sounds like a and I think it's what the public wants, because uh, these folks, one of the big items, which I really appreciated about CMS was that they explain they have checklists when they go out there, and that would just be the documentation for the city. And I, I would agree with the public. I would join the public, so to speak, on that. I think that makes sense at this point with an evolving world that we're all trying to keep track of right now and understand and and control the impact on our neighborhoods. I'm not sure if we got us. I, I would I would make a motion on that. And see if we can get a second on that. That part of it. And the oh, motion second. motion includes incorporating the the recommendations from the coal, right? Yes. Okay. You got a second. All right. Okay. Uh, Paul, is that what you're doing? You're seconding. Okay. I'm thirty. You're thirty. Okay. Could we have it recapped, please? So it's my understanding that you're going to adopt the recommended action, but that we'll bring back an amendment that would include those additional services. Okay, thank you. Yes, exactly. That was my, that was my motion. Don't think I missed anything there. I think that's it. Okay. And we have a second. And can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We're on to 3B9 utility easement acceptance. Was there public speakers? Yes, we have two speakers on this item. If you'd like to hear them now. Yes. Uh, well, unless uh, we need a report first. Uh, good evening, Council. I, I don't have anything more than what's in the staff report. This is just a um, public utility easement that um, we are going to be granting Edison and the gas company to uh, other cities' uh, new parcel over at the La Paz development. And I'll be at, I'll be available to answer, answer questions after public comment and if council has questions too. Thank you, Rob. Um, can we get to the public speakers, please? Yes, we have two speakers, Scott Dietrich and Ryan Embry. We'll hear from Scott first. Okay, great. You there, Scott? Thank you. Yeah, it took me uh, a minute. Um, you know, I just had a thought. If we're granting Southern California Edison or gas company and Edison anything, we ought to impose something whereby they have to start undergrounding any poles that need replacement. We've talked about this forever. And uh, now might be a good time to tack this on to this authorization that they want. Thank you. That's, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess Ryan is next. Correct. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, the utilities are not for the city's use. This is for the adjacent use of a huge uh, La Paz um, commercial development. And 
why the city keeps getting spanked with with all the negative impacts of that development on this portion that was supposed to be uh, usable and yet now would be encumbered by these easements is just backwards. All of the electric and the gas is for the office building and these things, which will need to be dug up in the future, for instance, and maybe the landscaping or the driveway will have to be dug up. But this is the city's parcel and portion. And this is totally unnecessary and is uh, an exaction of value by putting this burden on the city's portion. And there are certain things maybe you can't build on top of these easements or do or make it unsafe if the city wanted to do something with this public purpose that it's entitled to of this portion, which was um, it, the city gave up a lot of densification for the La Paz project. So I think you should not adopt this and that these easements should be um, designed to occur on the parcel for which they're really uh, benefiting. Um, it's not essential that you do this. It was offered up and the city's apparently, um, I don't know if the staff gives, uh, cares much about uh, whether it's there or not, but it's not really in the city's best interest to be doing this. And therefore, I don't think you should. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and that's, is that the end of our public speakers? That was our final speaker on this item. Okay, excellent. We're back here at Council for Questions and uh, Bruce. Yeah, so I, I, I actually appreciate the comments of both speakers, um, Scott and Ryan. Uh, I don't understand why the city, unless it's legally obliged to do this, and maybe the city lawyer will tell us we're legally obliged to do this, but unless we're legally obliged to do this, I don't know why we would do it unless we get something in return from both um, the utilities and the property owner that's benefited by doing this. I also didn't understand why this was added to the agenda at 4.30 p.m. on Friday. I, I wonder when this issue first arose and why we need to make this decision on one business day's notice as opposed to at a future time when we have more information. But those are my questions is, are we legally obliged to do this? And if not, why would we do it? So uh, um, first, the, the first question, let me answer the first question. Um, Kind of a little bit, if you look in the actual staff report, you can kind of see what the shape of the of the city parcel is. It's, it's kind of a flag lot. And there's a driveway that's going to go from Civic Center way all the way up to the city's parcel. And within that skinny portion of the parcel, we have several utilities in there. One of them, uh, we have a storm drain, we have a wastewater line, we have a recycled water line that's going to feed all of our uh, um, uses up, up at the potential up at our city site. Um, La Paz, we conditioned them to, to actually put that in and we were able to use those utilities for, for the city's purposes to do the drainage, to actually uh, um, collect the wastewater and, and get it out to um, the, the treatment plant over on, on Civic Center Way. So, um, this whole section, this little skinny section, the, this driveway section was all uh, um, looked at, planned out. It, it was a section where we're going to put all the utilities. Yes, it, it's part of it is going to be for the, um, the, the little positive development, but they're also going to actually stub out um, utilities for um, the city's parcel if, if, if they so need it later on. So, um, that's kind of a little bit of the background on how we got there and how we, uh, uh, why this um, this uh, this easement or these easements are, are being requested at this time. So, um, are we legally obliged to provide it? So, I'll have John kind of, or or you want me to? I mean, well, you, why don't you want to start and then I'll jump in. Well, I, um, are we legally obliged? I no, I, I don't think so. I, I think if if we wanted to um, have the have the property or, or have the developer go put their utilities at a different location, yes, we can do that. Um, eventually, we will have to if we develop that parcel, have to put in 
um, we'll have to put in our Edison line and our gas line at the city's expense. And here, here it's at the at the developer's expense to put it up to the city's property. So are we obliged? No, but I, I think we're getting some benefit from them placing all, all the utilities up, up to our parcel and um, at no really expense for the city. And, and, and have we done a, assess, a cost assessment or value assessment of whether we get more value from that or the property owner gets more value from that? Mm, good, good question. I, um, no, I no, I haven't done a, a cost association with that. Um, I would think that if they put in the utilities in there at their own expense, the storm drain, the wastewater line, the recycled water line, uh, that's a pretty big expense that they're putting in there. But I haven't really done a, a cost benefit on, on that. But that's that's a good question. Councilmember Silverstein, I would concur. We're not legally required to um, grant the easement, but again, as, as um, Public Works Director mentioned, we would not have the ability to get free gas and electric stubs at our city property on the north end of the project. So, Paul? I just want to direct everybody's attention to page 6 of 13 of the resolution. You can see a depiction of where that, that uh, water line and gas line and electric line is all going in there. And if we ever get around to actually using the city's parcel, which we're hoping to be able to use someday, we would be responsible for putting all that stuff in ourselves. And we would have no choice to put, put it, but in that driveway, if we force the owner of the parcel A to put it on their property. So I, I think that it's, we're t I don't, see a total length of that strip there, but it looks like it's close to seven, 800 feet. And uh, that's a significant amount of money and a significant benefit to us, I think. And it'll make life much easier if we get around to building one of the amenities that we talked about building back when the deal was cut for the city to get this piece in the first place. Okay. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah. So, you know, when I've been involved in negotiating deals, it's often the case that somebody wants something that actually benefits the other party that's providing it, but it benefits the one that wants it more. I mean, they would not be doing this this way if it didn't cost them more to do it the other way. And when you negotiate, in my experience, a deal, where you're going to facilitate the saving of money, you find a way to share the cost saving. So you, you get a portion of what's the synergy from the transaction. It, you don't just give them that free benefit in exchange for the fact that we get benefit because our benefit's worth less than their benefit, or at least it may well be. We haven't done any analysis of it. And to me, that's just, that's, that's sloppy. You, you, we need to know before, at least I need to know before I agree to this kind of thing, whether we're getting more value than we're sacrificing, or would the other party be willing to pay something in addition to just getting this, in addition to giving us the benefit, would they pay something on top of that because it's saving them more money? Hypothetically, it would cost them $200,000 to do it one way, 100,000 to do it another way, we're saving 100, but they're saving, whatever. I, I need to know the details. That's that's all I'm saying. I could see where I mean, obviously, there's a benefit to the other property, the La Paz property. But if we so, unless they agreed to pay us, then we would be putting out money either way. It seems so. Uh, yeah, Paul. Mm -hmm. I will remind the council that um, the La Paz development agreement did provide for a donation of two acres and a present thousand dollars. It's already water over the dam, right? The two yeah. acres is a pretty good benefit. And some cash, wasn't it, Riva? But we, we get those things correct. whether we approve this or not, correct? Yes, it was $500,000. Yeah, Bruce, you're right. We get a no matter what happens. 
All right, so what's, what's the relevance of the fact that we have some legal entitlements when we're making a decision whether to give up something? I, I'm in favor of uh, taking access to utilities stubbed out on the property and not having to install them ourselves later. That's what I'm in favor of. At no cost and, to the city. And this deal was made a long time ago by a city council that I can't even exactly be sure which one. Um, no, I, I think this was, this is long before I was even on the planning commission. So this is old, right? I mean, I don't even know what year this is. It's gotta be 10 plus years old. This deal has not been made. We're being asked to make this deal right now. We're being asked to record the necessary easement so that SCE will, will put their wires in the conduit. And if you're more comfortable with having them put this entirely on their property and us have no access to it and have to pay for it to do it later, then you should make that motion. Not what I'm saying. I, th I think that if this is saving them more money than this is benefit benefiting us, that they should be willing to pay something additional to get it done. I would think a rational business person would readily agree to that. It's hard to beat free. Well, let me ask you a question, Rob. Did Why did this uh, come up late? Was it just finished with time to get it on this agenda or is there, well, what's the timing on this? Um, the assistant city attorney, um, Trevor Rissen, was working on this with the La Paz developers and it wasn't ready. They had asked for it to go on this agenda and it wasn't ready to go as part of the regular packet. And uh, so they had asked if there was a way to get it on since we were amending the agenda. Uh, the assistant city attorney asked us to put it on as an amended item. So the, the pause needs to hear this because they need to get this done early right now, right? They're in some rush to get this approved. Is that a fair statement? That's my understanding that it's uh, their construction schedule is dependent upon this. Rob, how long would it take to do that cost analysis that Bruce mentioned? Any idea? Is that a, is that a huge task? Is that a, can you do it on the back of an envelope? Yeah. A day or two. I mean, if there's a question, we got to look at that. Yeah, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering legally how we could ask them for additional funds after, or, or for for that item not being in the development agreement. So I don't, I, I don't know that question. Maybe John can. Let me ask a question. Do, do they share that? Do we share that access way or is that just ours? It's ours. It's ours. That's so right. they, in other words, would do. No, the... I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. The drawing shows a driveway that benefits both of us. And it looks like they actually, but it's, it's entirely on the driveway we own until it gets back to where ours splits off and then it goes along their property line. And I also That's want to what point I see. I also want to point out too that in the previous council action, there was a easement, a access easement granted to, from the city over to La Paz to actually use that driveway to access part of their parcels. So it's going to be part of it. It's going to be a common, common driveway to get to our parcel and then portions to of their development too. Okay. I, Does that give them a right to, to put the, their eat the stuff underneath of the driveway then? The fact that they own half of it or they got yeah. right to it? What's that now? It's your... I, I'm just, the fact that it's a shared driveway, does that give them any particular right to put the, the pipes underneath there? No, they would have to get approval from us to actually do it first. Okay. So we would have to say, yes, okay, go ahead and put it in there. And that's why we're asking, that's why this easement is in here right now. Gotcha. And if there's a question, I would suggest let's do a quick back of the envelope cost analysis so we're all happy with what we got. 
I can do that. Karen? Um, I just have a question. A year ago, almost a year ago, the Planning Commission approved an amended CDPA for this property. I assume you were part of that, yes, Steve? Yep. Okay, so a year later, I, I just don't know why we're at this point. Because I, I don't remember this ever coming up when we did that review. This was never mentioned as part of the Planning Commission review. It was omitted? I, I, not if it was omitted, it was never mentioned. I don't know if anybody purposely omitted it. I mean, the problem you had, the pause was already approved, right? The pause wasn't approved prior. 13 years ago, yes? Yeah, well, I mean, if we could have changed it, we would have. Trust me. All right? I mean, you got to, what are you going to do with 120,000 square feet of additional commercial development in Malibu? That is a different <laughs> issue, yeah, you could, you could, obviously. You can set up bowling alleys in there. You're never going to fill that stuff. I well, love a bowling now. Right now. So, yeah, we didn't have much choice in when we, when we it came in front of us. Okay. Well, I mean, personally, at this point, I don't have any problem with the current deal. Um, I understand Bruce's question. I think, uh, I don't know. I don't, I mean, we're deep in here. Yes, Paul. Can I just ask Rob a couple of questions? Uh, what is, what is the sewer line and the return line run a foot in the contracts we're letting now? I, I really have to look it up and see. Okay. Um, it, I, I'm really rusty on, on, on the cost. If you asked me okay. a couple years ago, I would have had it. Oh, um, it, would it be helpful to delay this to the next meeting? Yeah, I, I could. If if that will help council, I could. I can have all those numbers and have that information back to 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 council. That's because you've got you've got some big you've got a big electrical conduit they're going to put in. You're going to they're going to pull wire down the con down that. Thing too, I would imagine. Correct. Do we get a meter for free too? Probably not. Oh darn. Are all the uh, utilities underground? Yes. Correct. Required by law. So that answers, uh, I think, uh, Ryan's issue. That's the issue. And it was Scott Dietrich. Oh, Scott, you're right. Sorry. Yes, Bruce. Yeah, yeah actually, that, that doesn't address Scott's issue. Scott's issue was getting, I'm not saying this could be done here, but just so it's clear, Scott's issue was SCE is getting a benefit here. Maybe they'd be willing to give up something there somewhere else. Not, not that they're undergrounding here, but that we can get them to commit to underground elsewhere. What I would like to ask is if this does get put off and if an analysis is going to be done, is there legal leeway? This is a question for John, I guess, for the city to negotiate with La Paz to extract some greater benefit for the city in exchange for giving this up? Councilmember Silverstein, I, uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to admit that I do not know the answer. I wasn't involved in this deal and I wasn't involved in the drafting of the easements. If this, if this item is brought back, we will certainly address that question for you, if not sooner than that. Well, well it would be helpful. It would, I don't want to put this off. I don't want to make this end up being delayed a month or a month and a half, especially if they, if it's urgent for them to get it done sooner than later. Actually, that's when you strike when the iron is hot. So it would be helpful, I think, for Rob or whoever's going to negotiate to know that if they come to the conclusion that they're like giving La Paz a benefit of a hundred thousand, a half million, I don't know what it is, that he has the legal authority or whoever it is that's going to do the negotiation to see if we can't get some couple hundred thousand dollar benefit in exchange. Again, I, and I'll work with Rob to see if we can make that happen. My understanding is that there's, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, there are easement agreements in place that govern the installation of these utilities. Uh, I'm not the one that's familiar with these uh, easement agreements, unfortunately, but um, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, um, they govern the installation of these utilities. Um, so I'm happy to work with Rob to get that information um, back, I, I don't have an answer to your question tonight, Councilmember Silverstein. That's fair. I, I appreciate that, but I just want to make sure we're not talking at cross purposes here. Sure. 
I asked, I started off by asking, and I thought we got the answer that whether we're legally obliged to give this yeah. to them, and the answer to that was no. Correct. So, so at that point, I'm not talking about changing anything. I'm not talking about whether we can legally change the dynamic. I'm just asking whether we're entitled to be able to ask for additional something else in exchange for saving them money. So I'll be happy to yeah. ask for more stuff from them. That's yeah. one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> to do. So, uh, um, but just just like John said, he, he, him and I will work on and look to see what our legal capacity is to actually do that. And uh, um, after, especially after I do my analysis and look at it too, if we can get something else out of it, I'll be more than happy to ask and, and get that. Um, We're only holding up for two weeks, Bruce. So. Yeah, achievable. Weeks is so let's uh, let's get a motion here and uh, go from there. Do you want to form the motion, Bruce? Paul? Motion to pass on this? Someone no, to uh, bring it back and what we're after. I'll let someone else do it. I'll make a motion that says we go back, bring this back in the next meeting with an analysis that says, you know, what are the cost benefits each party we're having this done? And, and some legal opinion that says, do we really have any any ability to go back and renegotiate anything? I think that's close. I think that's great. Thank you. I think you. it could be crafted and, and perfect, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do well, we have can, can I amend that? Just, I, I wouldn't say go back and renegotiate. I would say, do we have the capacity, the legal ability to negotiate the, the benefit for what we get in exchange for granting something that we're not legally obliged to grant? I'll accept that is better wording than I came up with. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Uri? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes, sure. Motion carries. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Okay, we are on to 4A, ordinance to require electronic filing of campaign disclosure statements and statements of economic interests. Can we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Mayor and City Council. The ordinance before you would facilitate and require electronic filing of uh, fair political practices, conflict of interest, Form 700 filings, um, as well as campaign statement form 460 filings. Um, between government code required positions, the council adopted conflict of interest code filers and contract staff. The city has over 100 unique form 700 filers, which up to this point have been manually managed. Um, electronic filing would streamline that process for staff and the filer and make all filings available to view online at any time. And also assist the city in meeting the new requirement that went into effect January 1st of this year, AB 2151, that requires uh, local government agencies to post redacted copies of campaign statements on its website no later than 72 hours after the filing deadline and maintain that there for at least four years. So the law requires that the Fair Political Practices Commission approve all electronic filing systems in the state. And though it's not expressly tied to this item, staff has worked with NetFile to move over to their approved platform for electronic filing um, should the ordinance be enacted. Uh, Tom Debert from NetFile joins us this evening, and I want to thank him for sticking with us this long to answer any questions you may have about the process. But really, the only action before you tonight is whether to introduce the ordinance on first reading and to direct staff to bring it back to the next meeting for final adoption. That concludes hey. my report. If you have any questions, Tom and I are available. Thank you, Heather. Um, do we have public speakers? We do. We have one public speaker this evening, Hamish Patterson. Okay, great. Hamish, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Hi, 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 Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I'm all in favor for this. I, I just, I chose this ordinance to, uh, cause it's, I, I have something to say on, on a human level here is, 
is what's going on tonight has been real bad. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to defend Riva on a human level. You know, that's that one of the public speakers said, yeah, one in one of my campaigns, I was gunning for, for Riva. I gunned for Jim Thorson. I gunned for the office of city manager. And I'm in support of, of the theory of what Bruce is after. But what I can't support is the dehumanization of Riva. That this is uncalled for. I, I see it in Karen's face. I see it in your face, Mike. I see it in your face too, Paul. And and I know Steve, you you're a badass lawyer, but I, I can see it in you too. Is is there's a line's been crossed tonight of, of dehumanizing someone in a public forum. And I, I defended Scott Dillon when the skateboarding kids dehumanized him in a public forum. I, I've reached out to Mikey because I don't think I was fair to him too much this year. We crossed a big line in the sand recently, and and, and we got to start being human to each other. And, and I think part of the problem is we're all doing this via Zoom, and we're not all sitting in the council chamber looking at each other face to face, because I do know that people don't communicate the same way in the same room. And all I ask Bruce is, is please just, Reba's a, a human being, man. I, I sat with her at a command post in Thousand Oaks as my house burned down and watched her do her best to try to fix something that was unfixable. I've seen Reva be a human being. Yes, she's the city manager and she wears the weight of all the city manager stuff. But if we lose the human aspect of who we all are, because I, I, I don't like what they were doing to you either, Bruce. I don't like anything that's gone down tonight on the human level. We want, I'm all for like playing hardball politics, hardball city council, fighting for what we believe in. But what went on tonight with Reba, it deserves an apology, not only for yourself, but for her, for the community. And you can fight for what you want to fight for. I, I back that. But how you treated Reva, it, everyone deserves an apology on that. It, it wasn't right, Bruce. It really wasn't. And I have to stand up for Reva and everybody else because I, I do care. I really do care. And th this is where we come to do our public service is down at City Hall. And if it turns to this, we're all going to lose everything. So please, let's, be, let's bring our humanity back. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Um, do we have any other public speakers on this item? That was our only speaker signed up for this item. Okay, um, we are back to the council on this ordinance. Do we have any questions or comments? Uh, Paul? I just have a question. It says in this that uh, NetFile is able to receive uploaded data from third party applications that are approved by the Secretary of State for electronic filing purposes. What what software do I have to buy to be able to file electronically? And well, Heather, Heather, can I interject on this? This is uh, Tom Debert with NetFile. Actually, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, what you are provided with, you're actually provided with filing software with the system free. So for your committee, okay. you can use the software at no cost. What that language means is if you're, let's say that you used a professional treasurer that was using third party software that was, um, that was um, approved by the Secretary of State, they can actually use their software like they always do and then just upload it straight into our system. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Okay, great. Uh, Steve? Uh, I use NetFile, so you guys do a good job, but <laughs> the question. <laughs> Heather, I, for years, I mean, I, all the planning commission, I was filing this form 700 and I did it electronically. What's different between is well, you, I, Go ahead, Tom. Uh, you know, what you're probably looking at, were, at the planning commission, were you filing for uh, Los Angeles County? Get the hell out of me. Somebody sent me a thing and said I had to fill it out, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about the FTPC switch over to electronic filing for 87200 filers. Yeah, and fundamentally what happened five years ago, the FPPC, if you're a state uh, level filer, meaning that the filing officer is the Fair Political Practices Commission, as is the council and the mayor, uh, you have to um, file um, your Form 700. And if you're filing on paper, 
the original wet sign copy goes directly to the FPPC. If you're electronically filing, you have an option uh, as of five years ago, you could use the FPPC's e-filing system. Now with NetFile, you can use NetFile's e-filing system and you have a couple of advantages that you don't get with the FPPC system. For example, you could create an expanded statement filing as a filer, add all of your local boards and commissions along with your FPPC filing. So when you push the button, it satisfies the requirement with the FPPC. And depending on whether or not any of those other agencies happen to be net file agencies, those would be paperless file agencies. Uh, LA County, for example, there's 23 other cities in LA County that use our e-filing system. If you happen to be on a border commission on any of those other cities, then that would automatically uh, be paperless with them. If it's not, you could print off a hard copy wet sign it and then just send it out to those outside boards and commissions that are not under the purview of the city of Malibu. Okay. They got me surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any more comments or a motion? I'll make a motion to approve, move the staff recommendation. Okay. Can I, I get a second? I second. Okay. Karen seconds. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Um, first, John, do you want to read the title of the ordinance? Oh, yeah, good call. And Mayor Pearson, members of the council, again, good evening. Before you tonight is Ordinance 479, an ordinance of the Malibu City of Malibu adding Chapter 2.68, Electronic Filing, to Title II, Administration and Personnel of the Malibu Municipal Code, to require electronic filing of campaign statements and statements of economic interests, and finding the same exempt from the California Environmental Quality. Thank you. Go ahead, Kels. Uh, Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. We are on to item 6A. Prioritization of staff resources. Marky, yes. Before we get, when does the the uh, people we're going to appoint? When do they get sworn in? Like for the planning commission, when does that take place? Is that next week? It would be at the next planning commission meeting. Yes. Okay. I just want to, I just want to make sure we get to that tonight because I hope so. We got a ways to go here. We're in deep. Um, you can certainly hear that item if you'd like to, to move that around. John can help you work that through. If you'd like to move those. I I don't know. I think we're in a no-win situation right now is how I see it. Uh, we got way more items that we're going to get to. There's no doubt. Yes, Bruce? Yep. Well, I, I, I would like to make a motion that we at least just right now move up 7A, not, not 7B, but 7A which I think we can get through fairly quickly and make sure that we actually do get to it. Get the appointments in. Yeah, I, I would tend, I would agree with that. Let's get those guys in. I, I would agree with that too. Um, do we need to do a just consensus on that? Do we need a roll call on that? We need a roll call vote to move item okay. 7A up. 7A, okay, to next. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Would you like me to call the roll for that motion from Council Member Silverstein? Yeah. Um, Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, item 7A City Council appointments to city commissions and committees. I don't even know, uh, how do we start this? I guess we go commission by commission. Yeah, there's, um, <laughs> if there's, there's no I need real, a little experience, I need a little experienced help here on this one. Yeah, there's no real separate where I would, um, actually recommend just going through the recommended action line by line. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. That way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess, first of all, do we have any public speakers first? You do have four public speakers. They are Pamela Kamliulik, Marissa Coughlin, Norman Haney, Haney, and Ryan Embry. 
Pamela would be our first speaker. Okay, great. Hi, Pamela. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, so tonight I'm hoping that when you make your appointments, the, the for the last four or so years, we haven't had any diversity on the planning commission at all. And it's very um, disheartening. And I know it's hard for lots of women to want to be involved in this type of an environment because it's very difficult to watch. And, but I really hope that whoever is watching this tonight and as you guys are, uh, you guys and, and, and Karen, because you just said even, you said, let's get these guys appointed. That was from Steve. Um, I hope that you broaden into more a, of a reflective of our population, just like our president-elect is doing with his staff and his appointments, and really engage people who maybe don't look like you or maybe are different sex than you to get them to be active because I have a feeling once you do that, things are gonna change. More people that get involved, the more people who are diverse, they come together. When people go before these boards, they see diversity, they feel like they, as a woman, will be respected and listened to because another woman maybe has a different perspective than a man. And I um, just would urge you as you make your appointments, to ask yourself, what type of people am I appointing? Are they all the same? Do they all look like me? Or do they all look, are they different? So just, I hope as you move forward, you'll engage more people who maybe think differently than you, look differently than you. And I think it's gonna serve our city and, and harmonize us in ways that will greatly improve and people may even want to be involved in the city of Malibu instead of it. It is a public service. You guys are not being paid very much for how many hours you're putting in. And these commissioners, it's a volunteer, it's a volunteer organization. So you really got to treat everyone with respect and you've got to welcome them and treat them well. So those are my comments and good luck. Thank you, Pamela. Great comments. Our next speaker is Marissa Coughlin. Marissa, you there? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I can hear you. I can hear you. No, you're I'm there. Sorry. I dozed off because while you were taking care of business this <laughs> evening, I was able to complete a 21 page Coastal Commission submittal with all the underlying documents for tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you uh, for dragging your feet. Um, what I'd like to say regarding this is, uh, first of all, I read it when I read this, it came out to me and I read it in a bunch of other documents submitted by our new council member, Mr. Silverstein, the, the constant use of the word demand. Um, he uh, it says council member Silverstein has demanded immediate responses. I, th I, I think you're on the wrong agenda. The wrong item, right. Wrong item. Okay. Yeah, we, 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 we are doing 7A first, then going back to 6A. Oh, sorry. I fell asleep during the coastal application <laughs> process. Okay. Go back, check your work. Okay. I'll come. I, no, I'm on it. I'm good. I'll get to it when you get to me. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you in a minute. Our next speaker is Norm Haney. Gentlemen, I'm uh, as chairman of the Wastewater Advisory Committee. I'm only here to answer questions and um, to provide information if you're interested in hearing it. Um, other than that, uh, I can only say that the people that we've had on the advisory committee uh, have worked diligently uh, to produce uh, probably the best on-site wastewater treatment systems uh, in the entire country, if not the world. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, the appropriate appointments uh, and I can help, I'm here. That's it. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Norm. Our final speaker is Ryan Embry. Okay. Ryan? Uh, thank you. Um, I've, I've known all of you and Pam for an incredibly long time, and I almost laughed because I don't think that's what she meant to say exactly, but I think you should appoint based on qualification and not on fabulous female good looks, um, because that would obviously disadvantage a lot of qualified people. And I know Pam can appreciate my humor in that, um, but I, I think as a last minute ditch to sway your opinion, um, I know Pam's a lawyer too, so um, she can take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I would offer my service again to the city uh, to serve on a commission of the public works or public safety. Public works is generally more boring and you might have uh, less <laughs> application uh, interest in that commission. But the reason I say that is because at this time you don't have an operating telecommunications commission and those duties were saddled on to the Public Works Commission by uh, revised municipal code. And so that's where telecommunications issues are buried at the moment uh, or not buried, which is the point. They're all up on polls. But um, so I would offer that and you all have my information. So uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, do we have any more public speakers? That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, so we're we're back here, and um, let me ask just a procedural question on this. I'm reading item one. It lists the city council people that need to make appointments to a lot of different commissions. Do we go by city council person usually, or by com or by commission usually? Um, that's up to you, Mayor. However, you want to go through it. There's no required order, and I don't know that we typically done it one way or another. So, okay. If okay. one of them wants to just take the reins and say what they're appointing to each commission, that's fine. Or if you want to go commission by commission, well, let's probably have each person do what their picks are. If that's okay, Steve, you have a Good question. I I, I was doing. Ex officio members. There's a couple of commissions that allow ex officio members. Mm -hmm. And I got some information today that says basically the ex officio member was put in to allow people who don't live in the city to become a member of the commission. Uh, you know, basically looking for talent outside that maybe can help us inside the city. Is that correct? Uh, you know, as far as the genesis of why we have ex officio for a couple of the commissions that I don't know what predates me, but I do know that the position is um, appointed, the, the person that's appointed that to that position is within 90265, but specifically outside of the city limits. Okay. They're not a voting member and they can not serve as chair or vice chair. That's what I heard. I, okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul, I mean, uh, Bruce. Follow up on that. So, so does an ex officio member have to be a non city resident or it can be a non city resident? No, that they are specifically not a city resident, but they do live in within the 90265 zip code. All right. Well, um, let's do this. Um, Paul, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go first if you're ready to have me go first. Yep. Okay. For, uh, for Cultural Arts Commission, I'm nominating Fireball Lawrence. He, uh, he went, graduated from Art Center, uh, very talented artist, has publishing business, longtime Malibu resident. For Parks and Recreation, uh, I have Eddie Miller. Eddie Miller's family has been in Malibu for much longer than any of us. And uh, he's been a coach for a long time, very active in youth sports, raised his family here. Uh, for Planning Commission, I'm, I'm nominating Dennis Robert Smith. 
Uh, you'd recognize him from sitting in the front row next to Norm for the last 11 years at every city council meeting and planning commission meeting. Very knowledgeable guy. And he knows it's gonna cost him money to do the job, but he's willing to do it. For, for public safety, I'm nominating Josh Spiegel, who I've known since he was a teenager, longtime Malibu resident. He's been on, uh, I'm sorry. He's been on Parks and Recs before, but now he wants to be on public safety. And he's on CERT team with me. Good guy. For Public Works Commission, I am putting Brian Merrick in. He uh, was formerly put in by Skylar Peak. Uh, he is, I've served with him for four years and used to work with him at Coldwell Banker. And for the Wastewater Advisory Commission, uh, I'm nominating Kevin Poffenbarger. He's been on the Wastewater Advisory Commission, very respected guy and uh, very knowledgeable about that, the, the business and the how all that stuff is done. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Bruce? Sure, thank you. Um, so, my um, nominations are for Cultural Arts Commission, Peter Jones, for Parks and Recreation Commission, Judy Villablanca, for Planning Commission, Craig Hill, for Public Safety Commission, Daphne Anait, and for Public Works Commission, Jim Palmer. Each of Craig Hill, Jim Palmer, Peter Jones, and Judy Villablanca have experience on city council commissions. They've served with distinction. Uh, notably, Craig was removed after developers complained to city council members about um, questions, numbers of questions he'd asked. And personally, I view willingness to put in the time to dig into the issues and ask the hard questions as a reason to have Craig on the Planning Commission and not a re reason for him not to be on the Planning Commission. Uh, Daphne Anate is a new addition to the commission. Uh, Daphne is a partner at Burke Williams and Sorensen LLP, a law firm that has a concentration in issues of municipal law. She has personal experience dealing with matters involving contractual relations between cities and law enforcement, fire departments, and other providers of municipal service. And I believe Daphne will provide a new perspective to the Public Safety Commission that will prove to be valuable to Malibu, especially when looking into our relationship with the Sheriff's Department and possibly CHP. It'll also be good to have, as, as Pam noted, um, some further gender diversity on a commission to which the city council has currently appointed only men for the past two years. Um, in that regard, um, I'll note that, I, I'll join Pam in noting that ethnic diversity and civil, ethnic diversity as well in city government is sorely missing. Uh, and, and that, unfortunately, it's also sorely missing in Malibu for the most part. But, but it's, it, there is some ethnic diversity in Malibu. It's, it's just not in city government. I'm hopeful that we can do something about that with the Civil War more than 150 years behind us and the Civil Rights Act 50 years behind us. Returning to Daphne, I am both hopeful and optimistic that she will not only make a fine addition to the Public Safety Commission, but that she will develop an interest in running for a seat on city council at some point down the line as I continue to believe that the residents of Malibu will benefit from having more critical thinkers on the city council. Do you have a wastewater um, oh, appointment? Yeah, I, I, I don't. And as long as the, um, the current appointee is willing to stay, that would be my preference. Okay, who is, uh, who's your, who's, who would be that current person you know? I have to look at the list. Um, Maybe Heather could help fill in. I think they're all at large. Is that no, um, so the two oh, remaining, what now? You could, go that with would be Kevin Poffenberg. No, Poffenberg, go with Mullen's appointment. <laughs> I'll defer to Steve. That's fine. Steve Bramman. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Raven. I'll the, defer to Steve on that. I, does, I, did, does, I, did, I did some research and he was identified as a very capable and good. So it's not like I'm just making names up. I did. I did some work on the wastewater committee because they didn't know any of these people. So he, he was he was spoken highly of. Does Steve know he's being appointed? Not, well, I don't know. I didn't ask him. <laughs> well, he's he's serving right now. So, yeah. at least so he 
he maybe keep, he doesn't know there's an election and he'll just keep serving and nobody will know any different. Keep sending him agendas. Okay. All right. Well, if there's obviously, if there's an issue, we can revisit yeah. this. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Steve? Yes. Cultural arts, Lottie Charon. She's been on the commission, one of the founders. Uh, Parks and Rec, Suzanne Goldeman. She's a walking Malibu encyclopedia. Uh, Planning Commission, John Mazza. There's probably something I should say about John, but I'll pass for now. <laughs> uh, Public Safety Commission, Keegan Gibbs. Public Works, Scott Dietrich. Both Keegan and Scott have been on the commission, so they're repeat players. And Wastewater Advisory, Andrew Sheldon. Andrew worked for the city. He was part of our uh, Environmental Safety Commission. Uh, he was, I, when I spoke to Poffenberger, Poffenberger highly recommended him as somebody that could really help us out. He knows the way around the city, so he's my appointee there. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Karen, you have an appointment to Public Works? Yeah, I do, thank you. My appointment is Wade Major. Okay. Uh, number three, council may appoint or affirm appointments of an ex officio member to the Cultural Arts Commission, Parks and Recs Commission, and Public Safety Commission. Um, does anyone have uh, an, a potential appointment to ex officio to the Cultural Arts Commission? Yes, Graham Clifford. Does anyone else? How does that work? Is that, since it's a at large ex officio, is that something we, I assume we vote on? Yeah, you would roll call it. So if Steve wants to make that motion, you would need a second. And then I'd make that motion. Graham's been on, Graham was one of the people who started the Cultural Arts Commission. He's been on it as an ex officio member, and I'd like to keep him there. So that's my motion. Okay, and I think I saw Bruce made a second. Okay, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Yuring? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? You're muted, Councilmember Silverstein. Um, Councilmember Silverstein is. I'm sorry, muted, yes. Thank you. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Do we have an ex officio member for Parks and Rec? Do you have any nominations there? Uh, Steve? I'd like to nominate Christine Clark. Uh, Christine used to live here in Malibu. She lived over Ramirez Canyon. They sold that property. She moved. She's living in Monte Negro. I think that's how you say it right now. Uh, I did not get her application completed yet, Heather, but I will get that tomorrow and get that to you. Uh, to you. She, she has served on a couple of Cultural Arts Commission's over in Thousand Oaks. Um, she's familiar with Malibu, been here a long time, long term, you know, so I think she would do a good job on Parks and Rec. Point of order? Yes, Paul. I, I think that we heard from Heather earlier that they're required to be 90265 residents. Montanito is not, unless I'm a part of one Montanito I don't know anything about. I, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good, I don't know that. Well, can we postpone that, hold off on that one to next meeting, and let me go do some more work. Okay. Is that okay, Mikey? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Of course. We can make a, you know, that we can, we can agenda as I, I need to make an appointment soon, too. So, I, yes, that's fine. Um, any, is there any other appointment there for that position to Parks and Rec? Does anyone have an, anything? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, Public Safety Commission. Ex officio, uh, Brent, I mean, Bruce, I was getting tired. I'll be honest. <laughs> so I, just want, I just want to ask again, so I'll make absolutely certain I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it, that I'm correct in this. It cannot be a Malibu city resident. No. Okay. Then, then I don't have a suggestion. Um, I would, I would suggest Brent Woodworth, who is world renowned credentials and, uh, investigating disasters all over America. He's also been instrumental um, with me in bringing our fire follower program, which is coming to fruition soon. Um, he uh, 
I mean, his he's 90265, but he's way up last floors further. Sounds good to me. Um, oh, yeah. This guy, his resume was outstanding. Yeah, his resume is ridiculous. Um, and I think he'd be a, an interesting addition there, to be honest. So I'm, I'll second. A second? Okay. Um, Bruce? Yeah, totally support that. I'm amazed that he's got the time to be the time and willingness to do it, but he'll be phenomenal. Okay, thank you. Um, roll call. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, item number four, council to appoint or affirm two at-large appointments to the Wastewater Advisory Committee. I don't think those were filled before, or were they? I think they were. We have a council oh, they were. Large. Oh, I see. They were. They were. There's Barbara Bradley and John Yaroslavsky. Um, yes, Paul. I'd like to make a motion. We affirm both of them. I spoke to Norm Haney, who uh, spoke highly of both of them, and I've known uh, John for a long time also. I'll second that. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Well, well done. Um, we have a motion and a second. Can we have roll call, please? Yes, one second. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Yuri? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Number five, council to appoint or affirm five appointments and two alternate appointments to the Building Board of Appeals. So this one um, would have been the one you may have been thinking of, Mayor, where there were two alternates that are currently vacant. Oh, yeah, you're right. You are correct. Um, Paul? Can I nominate the five existing appointees to be uh, renewed? Okay. Can um, Second. Okay. We have a second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Can we have roll call, please? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Yuri? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And number six, council to defer appointment of members of the Mobile Home Park Rent Civilization Committee until such commission, until such time as necessary for the commission to meet, as you've probably seen, it has not met in a very long time. Um, I think that is everything. Did I miss anything on that, Heather? No, I don't think so. I think you're good. I think we're good. Uh, maybe the city attorney can weigh in. Do we need a motion on the deferment of the appointments to the Mobile Park Rent Stabilization Commission? Uh, no, we do not. But I would note on item number five, it asks for the council to appoint or affirm five appointments and two alternate appointments. I don't know if the council has a desire to at this time point, appoint two alternates. I don't have anybody. Does anyone have an alternate for the Building Board of Appeals? Nope. I'm yes. sorry. Seeing none, I and no nominations. I think we're we're good. I don't no motion needs to be made to do nothing, right, John? Correct. That is correct. Okay, just double checking. Okay. So we're done with seven A. We are now on to back to six A. Um prioritization of staff resources. Do we have a staff report on this? Mayor, I don't have anything else to add other than what's in the staff report, but uh, happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, thank you. Um, public speakers, Heather? We have 10 speakers on this item. I'm gonna read them all in order and then we'll call them one by one. Okay, thank you. They are Lynn Norton, Colleen Baum, Jonathan Kay, Mark Body, Joseph Patterson, Craig Hill, Marissa Coughlin, Ryan Embry, Rosemary Ives and Ro uh, Laura Rosenthal. The first speaker will be Lynn Norton. Okay, thank you.
You there, Lynn? Sorry, I didn't hear you call my name. I just saw the oh. thing. <laughs> um, I can hear you. So, uh, just I don't I don't know. Uh, this is an aside thing, but um, since there's so much of the agenda that it is not going to happen tonight, I wonder if you guys are allowed to continue the meeting to another date instead of waiting two weeks to finish up those items. Anyway, that's just a side thought. I think that's a very good point. I would doubt we get to any more items tonight. It doesn't, you know, it's hard to tell timing sometimes, which is a shame because we have a lot to do. So um, I don't do it and do it two days from now or something instead of like, cause I'm <laughs> sure by two weeks from now, you're going to have a whole other slew of things you're going to want to do. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer for that right now because it involves, you know, a lot of organization and staff and it wouldn't be enough of time to reschedule it. But, um, Let's, we'll get through this item and deal with that. Okay, so what I wanted to say about this is that, you know, there's a middle ground here between, on the one hand, thinking that there's a conspiracy at City Hall, and on the other hand, thinking that there's no value to investigating city processes. And um, I sent you guys a lot of emails. I sent an example of something that I thought was a terrible process that had happened, and, and it, it doesn't... Uh, have anything to do with Reva because it happened 10 years ago and she wasn't there, but it was when the staff started collecting TOT tax without any city council agenda, without any public discussion, without anybody understanding the ramifications of that or going on the record and voting for that. And it's just an example of how, you know, it's good to be aware of how something like that could happen. And I really think that the city council has to be controlling the city and not have the staff controlling the city, you know? And so um, uh, I think that um, I looked at the sub, you know, the list of the things that Bruce was asking for. And I also sent you guys like just my little assessment of the individual items. And I can see that a couple of things he's asking for are not practical. The things that he was asking for related to um, Jefferson's affidavit because his requests were just too unspecific. But the other stuff was mostly stuff. A lot of it was stuff that I could request in a public records request, you know, and, and like some of it is actually pretty easy, like finding, you know, interactions between the city and Malibu Times. And it's the kind of thing that I could just request and, and it would have to be responded to anyway. So I would just ask that you guys not make it overly hard for uh, council members to, you know, like, like in specifically with Bruce's requests, I, I think that I, it would be a good solution for him to just work out a timeline with staff so that it's not like he needs everything right now, but on the other hand, it's not like um, some restrictions should be made where council members can't try to inform themselves about things so that they even know what issues that they want to bring to the city. You know, you can't only inform yourself about things that are already on the agenda. You have to inform yourself about things so that you can, you know, figure out if there are improvements or, you know, that you want to suggest. So those are, that's my, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much, Lynn. Okay. Our next speaker is Colleen Baum. Hi, Colleen. Can you hear me again? I can hear you again. Ooh, I'm good today. Um, so 6A, uh, the first paragraph under discussion states, the city currently does not have sufficient resources to accommodate Bruce's demands. Bruce, does that mean anything to you? My criticisms of you are real, valid, and shared by many. Your document requests regarding the Malibu Times and KBU Radio? Tell me why. And what information might be revealed that has value to the citizens of Malibu? The city manager's phone records and texts for the last nine months? It's a witch hunt. I get it. You have 10 hours a day to devote to your vendetta. The city does not have the resources to respond. 
I am concerned about the well-being of the five of you I'm looking at right now on my screen. I am concerned about the well-being of Reva. I am concerned about the well-being of our staff. I don't see Bruce changing his ways. He does not care about us, the citizens of Malibu. He is singularly focused on this vendetta. I think the city has to hire someone to handle his requests for the short term, preferably someone familiar with the California Public Record Act. It's a bummer. Considering how strained our budget is now and for the foreseeable future due to fire rebuilds, Mike, you want an extension of comp fees, I agree. The pandemic, its effect on sales tax, short-term rental ordinance. Okay, the good news, eventually, it seems, Bruce will have every document created in the city for the last 10 years. This will not go on forever. Bruce gets to stay home, have his groceries delivered, and food delivered, and email staff incessantly. I imagine all these requests have multiple city staff reporting to the office more than they want during this pandemic. In honor of our, in honor of our city's essential workers, I wonder if I could start a fund. Keep staff same fund to raise dollars, to handle, to hire someone to facilitate a quick completion Colleen, of your time is up. record requests. Thank you. Thank you. It appears Jonathan K is no longer in the meeting, so we'll see if he comes back and we can circle back around, but next we'll hear from Mark Boddy. Okay. Thank you. Hello all, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mark. Okay, so I appreciate everybody sitting through this. Uh, I should clarify one thing. What, what I meant by rookies is Steve and Bruce have not been city council, council persons before, so they're new to this. And I think part of the problem here, the elephant in the room is, Bruce has made, made a campaign promise, which other voters and residents are now recognizing has become a vendetta. And... That doesn't need to be part of every city council meeting. It doesn't need to bog down every city council meeting. And Bruce, you know, as the rookie, as a lawyer who, you know, maybe left Delaware a little earlier than, you know, you wanted to leave. If you've never really done this before, it's important that you not address the community in terms such as I'd rather be right than pleasant. And the reason for that, Bruce, is you're not always right. In fact, you're repeatedly wrong, particularly on legal issues. You need to be candid with people about the legal issues. You're the only lawyer on the city council. You know that there's no right to record conversations. You shouldn't be saying there's a right to record conversations. The reason the law requires you to get consent to that is it's not normal. There is no such right. And it's not the way anyone conducts real business. The only reason 6A is here is your demands have become so repetitive, so burdensome, so time consuming that the city staff is having difficulty focusing on the work plan. This city has gone to hell and back in Woolsey and a pandemic. We're not interested in a new city councilman who gives us Shakespeare quotes, or who's an egomaniac or a narcissist. We want you to get your work done. These are dirty, low paying jobs and we count on volunteers like you to do them. That means you have to do that job with no ego. You need to remove half of your Public Records Act requests immediately to what's relevant. If you want to have a public hearing on the city manager's qualifications, you can do that but don't try to get somebody to quit with a hostile, repetitive, abusive, gender bullying approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Joseph Patterson. Okay.
Joseph, are you there? Hello. Yes, I can hear you, yeah, Joseph. Here, can you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, express, you know, that I, I I am not in favor of this item. Um, I do believe that city city council members should have access to the information that they request um, for whatever reason. And I think that if more time was spent just getting the documents and getting the information that's requested rather than fighting it and trying to block it, that, you know, it wouldn't be such a big deal. And I am, as again, I said, I'm opposed to this. And I think that we do want transparency. I know I do in our city business and we want to know what's going on out here. And I think we as citizens have the right and the city council members that we have elected have the right to work on our behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Our next speaker is Craig Hill. You there, Craig? Yeah, hi again. Um, well, first, I'm honored to be appointed again, and I appreciate Pamela's concerns. I share them. I hope to be mindful of them. And for now, I'll just confirm that I'm my own man and will be working solely for the public interest, the state and federal constitutions, and a bowling alley at La Paz. <laughs> now, tonight, I, I'm mindful of the frustrations on all sides and appreciate your collective efforts at comedy. I, I can tell a lot of you are really trying. Uh, but you know, Bruce has been asking a lot of questions. Many of them, not all of them, have been reasonable. And what has eventuated the extra workload is that the city manager's replies have been few and far between or non-responsive even, which has prompted Bruce to renew his requests and get more wound up. And there's been a positive feedback loop in which they each share some responsibility. So a word to each. Bruce, you're right about a lot of things and you have some good ideas, but I don't agree with your approach. I think sometimes you miss the forest for the trees. And Reva, when you're accused of not showing all your cards, it's not a good look to hold them even tighter to your vest. That's what this item is. The impression is to confirm the allegation and it plays like Trump refusing to show his tax, or tax records. Anyway, on the substance, the notion that some hours of staff time are objectionable is itself objectionable. At the admin and finance subcommittee special meeting on August 7th, the staff, including the city manager, we're quite pleased with the fact that revenues would be over $3 million greater than their projections from several months prior. They were happy to even begin thinking about what to do with the perceived windfall. I don't recall the city manager making any remark about the extra $3 million in any council meeting. Maybe I missed it, but I don't recall it. And that was only in the finance subcommittee meeting, which for some reason is not saved on YouTube. And incidentally, as part of the transparency initiative, videos of more meetings should be saved online, including all commission meetings. In the context of the $3 million windfall, the notion that Bruce, in the name of transparency, shouldn't be able to use some extra staff time, sends the message that transparency does not have much value or even that it's something to avoid, even while paying lip service to it. So I think you can ask Reva to allow Bruce to record meetings Whatever the legality of it, it seems like that would that would be a good uh, compromise, and it would record it, it would protect both of them equally. You know, transparency doesn't have to be painful. Um, I think Lynn Norton has written some great things on this, some very specific points. Um, I hope you have her letter to reference, and I'll just close by saying that you know Bruce is on the line now, but it could be any of you at some point in the future, depending on how the cards roll. So. Keep that in mind. I, I don't think we need to uh, do anything specific with this item at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marissa Coughlin. Hello. Hi, Marissa. Okay, um, let me try and be a little cogent here. Sorry, still working on the project. Almost done though. <laughs> uh, I just am concerned the gentleman just spoke about tone and some other speakers have done that too. I'm concerned about tone. I worked with the county for years before we were the, a city. And I don't know, I don't care who you were in this town. I have never seen so much hatred, vitriol, and condemnation of our neighbors as I have recently in 50 years. And that's a heck of a long time. And I just really 
think we need to tone it down and show the respect for one another is deserved. Now, regarding this agenda item, uh, if I had more time and wasn't in City Hall non-COVID seven days a week, and sometimes I was just there twice again today, I could assist uh, the council member on the learning base for acquisition of documents in the city. 90% of the stuff is on the city website. He just has to get used to searching the website. Uh, documents under the Freedom of Information Act, that's state law, and we know what that is, and we all get them. What he may not recognize is there are many professionals like myself out here for fire rebuilds and, and other things that we're doing in our community also have Freedom of Information Act requests that have to be addressed. Um, there isn't one staff member that has ever denied me anything, even when they know I'm right, they're right. We work as a team for our property owners and our and the betterment of our community, whatever the issue might be. I think any individual using our, Steve, come on, Steve, smile at me. Any individual that um, wants to use the council hearing like tonight as a learning tool needs to take a little more personal time and do that. And as for the uh, recording of information, I want to categorically have it set up front. No one has my permission at any time to record me at any meeting with any government official or anything. And I've stated that in Washington, DC and in every state I've worked at. If you want to talk to me, you talk to me to my face. You want my respect, you get my respect. And it, it goes the other way. I don't think we need, we need to be focusing on fire rebuilds, new developments, homeless, and the many other agenda items that we have. And as for um, this, I can't say enough about our staff. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that, that uh, our new council member is not, has not been on a committee or a board or something to recognize the quality of the staff we have. But I actually- Krista, had, your time is up. I had a relative that was turned down by Reba. <laughs> So, yeah, she didn't cut it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Our next speaker is Ryan Embry. Ryan, are you there? Council, yes. I can hear you. Um, I, I sent a, a request, um, just I was looking back in my emails for this um, because one of the council member items, and I'm using this as an example only because this is way before the election. And it had to do with the wireless telecommunications ordinance, this, you know, terrible ordinance we've got that's a decade old and uh, needed fixing in 2015. And I, I asked the planning department to provide me with a copy of the current ordinance, which is under review. And Patricia Salazar, who I've, I think I've known for 10 years and is a sweetheart and a dedicated worker was obviously um, overruled and I got a nasty response in the sweetest terms. It said, um, we don't have to give it to you. Uh, government code section 6254K exempts records that are protected under state and federal law. And it was a bunch of baloney recitals, which most of which didn't even apply to what I was asking for, but it was a slap in the face for something that um, residents of the city are volunteering, hiring experts and pleading with the city to get up to speed on. And uh, I didn't intend to speak on this tonight, except I got this document right here. The other one was a, a staff report on school separation issues where the city's been working on this for years and it's failed. And the report was to get more money to pay the negotiators more money and continue a negotiation based on a report by the consultant Ryland Group. So, and that report was not included in the agenda item. And I simply asked for the, the report to be uh, provided so I could read it. And I got the same nasty three page lawyer letter from uh, BBK to basically go jump off a cliff, mind your own damn business. This is potential 
uh, privy and deliberative process and just forget it. But see, the staff report was deficient because it was basing its recommendation on this report, which I believe was paid for with public funds. So the necessity to use that word demand has very significant legal consequence because if you don't use the word demand, the other party doesn't have to comply. So it's a necessary thing. You can respectfully demand, but it's required. And I've made simple requests of the city clerk and bless Heather's heart. She had to initially send me the same type of, you got to fill out a public information request. And I, one of my requests was, what years did John Harlow serve on the city council? He was one of our mayors. Brian, your time is up. Thank you, Ryan. And Mayor Pearson, the last two speakers who were signed up are Rosemary Ide and Laura Rosenthal. Neither of them are still in the meeting um, and Jonathan Kay has not come back either. We do have two people who have raised their hands, Pamela Conley Ulick and Scott Dietrich. If you would like to hear their comment, we can unmute them. Sure, let's, let's finish up these last two. Let's hear from Pamela because I believe I heard, saw her hand first. Okay. I was surprised you noticed that. I'm so grateful. Um, I just want to take a minute to, uh, to, to notice what you guys did when you were on the last item appointing the staff or the, you know, the volunteer and you worked together and you got through it and you were respectful you were dignified, you didn't fight. And it, it was nice to see that for a moment. And I'm hoping when you're, when I read this item, I didn't want to speak on it, but when I read the re response and the word uses of um, nefarious and I, so many, so many adjectives that were so, so hostile in my opinion, and I appreciate the word, you know, words, but we have to use our words, you know, in a way that we can get to the place we need to be. And I'm hoping that everyone, Bruce, you're new and, and you're going to learn that people are all here to help you, that you have a, a wonderful brain, that you can take all that, that 10 hours a day and help the city. We have other big issues like LAFCO. We talked about getting our property taxes back here in the city and some great things you can do. And I'm hoping like looking through the past, how much is that gonna help us with the, the future and the problems we're facing now? And I'm just hoping you'll spend that time and energy in a positive way because we need you to be helping Malibu. And so as we get through to this matter, I don't know what my time is, I can't see, but I just, I'm hopeful that um, you really, like all the time being spent on this one item and these 5,000 pages, and God only knows what more, like we can, you can really maybe focus on the present and the future and really um, help the city, uh, you're you you know you you're you're a lawyer you're trained you're a litigator and I can see that in everything you do and as a former litigation supervisor I was there fighting every day in and out and I hope that you can just switch that gear up, down a little um, and turn off that litigator and, and tune into that helper which I know you are and I know you have a good heart and so I'm just pleading to you to like take this energy and these additional documents and this hostility and kind of put that away for a little bit and let's focus on the here and now and how you can make Malibu better. So thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Our yeah. final speaker will be Scott Dietrich. Okay, great. Scott, are you there? Mute? Well, I hear you. I hear you now. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I thought I'd signed up for this and who knows what happened. Anyways, I, I think each of you, it's very, very important. If you need information to deal with an issue, 
that that's available. I understand that Bruce ran on a platform to uh, replace Reva. So I understand why, you know, she's not wanting to be very forthcoming. But I think that that's backfired. And I think that by not providing all the information that Bruce is requesting, um, we end up in, in a situation where we're fighting each other. And I, I, I think that's wrong. Um, I had an opportunity today, got on a jet ski that belonged to a friend of mine. He had another one. And we went from Marina del Rey up to Point Doom along the coast. And I'm looking at Malibu and I'm going, you know, this, how great it is. It's a beautiful winter day. It's a little bit chilly out there, but, you know, you're going 50 miles an hour. And what a blessing it is to live in this city. And we have an opportunity here. And if Bruce is willing to look over all this stuff, Great, more power to him. He's spending 10 hours a day. And, you know, as he said, he hopes he doesn't find anything. But certainly, it's his right to do so. He represents us. And all of us want to know if there's something that's not right. So I think having the information is appropriate. Could the tone be better? Yeah, and unfortunately, Bruce is at loggerheads with Reva, and I hope that that will end. But that means that the staff who works under the council's direction must answer to the council. The staff doesn't, Reva doesn't make up what we do. You guys do. And ladies, excuse me, Karen. Um, and they operate, the staff operates at your direction. And so they should respond positively, even if it's kind of a pain in the butt. So, and, and last, just thank you all for all the time you put into this, that, uh, man, it is so much. Thanks. And I'll end it there. Thank you, Scott. That concludes public comment on this item. Okay. Thanks. So. We're back at the council here and hang on a second. I'm having trouble seeing everyone. Okay. Um, I'm going to do my mayor prerogative and start this one off. So give me a second, everyone. Cause I think I really, really want us to work well together. I really want us to be a cohesive group, group with varying opinions um, that works together for the benefit of Malibu. And we have gotten off to a very rough start. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and I'm all for full transparency. And um, I really look forward to dissecting some of the uh, items in seven, I believe it's F, and seeing what makes sense there uh, that we can work with. Um, but I think too, it feels like in at this moment, in your haste to get this it's just it's overwhelming and i see it with the staff i see it certainly with reva and i and we got to find a right balance because we have a work plan and when the staff's not getting the work plan it's just that's that's hurting malibu that's hurting people doing fire rebuild and, and just it's just so many things we're trying to do and i think you're entitled to all the documents you want i don't have an issue with that we got to find a pace. This is, this is a, this is a, not a sprint. This is a, this is a, there's another name. I'm getting tired. This, there is a, this is a long race. Um, and of course, being subject to some of your PRAs, you know, I, 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 I just honestly worry and I've used the word before and you didn't like it. And I'm not trying to be offensive at all. I worry that it feels harassing because I know you're upset but I, I hope we can find a better pace and just, and work through it. And some of the requests, some of the requests were, were, were not legitimate. You know, they were, it was your, you know, I guess maybe anger or frustration coming out. And 
I don't, I, I, I'm going to read one that was aimed at me. And I just don't think this is what we're trying to spend city time on. This is part of a 15 item request. All, all documents concerning therapy purportedly sought by Mayor Mikey Pearson once he realized Bruce Silverstein had been elected to the city council to drain the Malibu swamp. Um, that, hey. Well, that's not my request. I have no, I've never saw it before. That's really good to hear then. So where did you get that from? I don't know. It's a PRA. I have, I have no idea where that came from. That's not mine. It's not anybody yeah. I put up to. I don't put anybody up to putting, make requests for me. Okay. Well, then I apologize if I have that wrong. Um, that's a problem. You think I would do something like that? Yeah, no, that's true. And I would like to correct that. But I would like to find a pace because I, none of us request 20 hours a week of staff time. Um, and I, yeah, I, I ask for stuff sometimes, but let's, let's find a pace. That's what I'm after. Um, and also I back in seven F <laughs> that we do have a special investigation. Absolutely. So a lot of these, a lot of these documents will come out and, uh, looking for any improprieties and I'm with you. I, I have zero patience for any improprieties or any corruption at all at city at city hall. So I just hope we can find a pace where we're not caught in this battle and we just, we're, we're going to be here a long time. We got a lot to do. So that, that's, that's my comments there. Um, we really, as a city council, we have a work plan. And right now that plan, we're having trouble. We have, I don't remember the number, over 20 council approved projects we're not even working on now. We have land we bought, we're not even having public meetings on. Uh, we've been through the fire, we've been through the pandemic, we're still in it. This has been tough. So I get it and I, I don't begrudge you at all that you know you have your opinions, that's fine. I just hope we can find a pace so we can really focus on on city work as well. Um, and and those are my comments. Uh, Karen, I see your hand. Thank you. I have a problem with the tone of the communications that I've seen. I have a problem with the volume of communications. I have a problem with wasting taxpayer resources. This is a fishing expedition and it's a witch hunt and you know it. This council works as a body, five people. No one here works unilaterally. We are not authorized to do that. In fact, Items have been removed from the priority list with the understanding that they, 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 that they would be reinstated as soon as possible. We took projects off the work plan in order to accommodate helping fire rebuilds, waiving fees, moving things as quickly as possible, hiring additional staff. What did we take off? Projects that we care about the solar power project at City Hall, the Sheriff's substation, the Dark Skies Initiative, the Basement Light Well Amendment, sustainability outreach, climate adaptation and resiliency, the Environmental Commission, a lot of projects. There's probably 20 more I could list. Instead, City Hall is being paralyzed by the demands of one single council member. To say that the city has been impacted doesn't nearly describe it. It's been crippled. No council member has the right to monopolize staff time. Not me, not anybody else. So I want to help you a little bit with some notes regarding the council, the council manager form of government, which is what we work under. 
City staffers do not report to the council. Scott Dietrich, I'm really sorry. I've got bad news for you. You're absolutely wrong. I'll say it again. City staffers do not report to the council. Only the city manager, city attorney, and treasurer report to the council. City staffers report only to the city manager and they take direction only from the city manager. Council members have authority only when acting as the council, as a body. Individual council members, including the mayor, have no authority to do anything other than as directed by the council, okay? Put those together and you come to the conclusion that it's a mistake, it's a disservice. It's probably legally problematic to allow any council member to directly require any action by any staffer. We're going down a bad road right now. We need a reset. So here are some things from an email from Bruce. Uh, he refers to Riva as duplicitous. He says he has heard rumors of criminality, corruption, and other wrongdoing. He again mentions duplicity and deceitfulness. He mentions Riva's arrogance and possible narcissistic personality disorder. He calls Riva a horrible person who should not be running our precious city. I'm not sure how precious it is to you, Bruce. You state that you think Riva has something to hide because honest and innocent people simply do not act this way. I have to tell you, there's a French expression that when translated states, a man only looks under the bed when he's hidden there himself. Those are my comments. Okay. Um, other counselors? Bruce? Steve, did you want to go first? Yeah, let me. And I think we're headed down a path that's going to get us someplace in this one. And, and I, I go back to Mikey's comments that say, Bruce is entitled to, entitled to get the information he's looking for. He's a city council person. And I'll tell you what, if, from the city's perspective, you much prefer to have Bruce asking for that information versus having a resident ask for that information because if a resident asks for it, before you can turn the documents over, you got to go back and redact all of the names and addresses and all the rest of that stuff, probably doubles the workload you're going to have. So, I mean, I'm not suggesting that, uh, I am suggesting if, if Bruce were to go back to the residents say, you guys ask, give me freedom of information requests for these things, he did get buried even more. I think what we got to do is, is and I, I'll go back to what Mikey said, I think we got to find a pace. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, you can't get everything overnight. Uh, so we're going to, I, 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 I hear you, I know what you're trying to do. And I, you know, there, there is, I guess, a, you know, I spoke to Heather. Okay. Uh, and you know, part, some of the stuff we've got in city hall is, is, is digitized. Okay. Which makes it easier to get to some of the older documents we've got in city hall are not digitized. So it takes longer to go get them. Moving forward, we're digitizing more and more stuff, so it should again make it easier to get a hold of. Uh, but there is, it's labor intensive. Uh, now, maybe the path says, you know, we hire somebody else just to deal with that for a while to clean those things out. Maybe we can find a way where you can, you know, modify a little bit what you're looking for uh, and give them a little bit more time to get that. 
It's up to you. I mean, you've got to give us an answer. You are entitled to the stuff. You're entitled to it. Uh, the, the real question is, how much of a burden do we put on everybody else to get that? Uh, and I listened, I heard Karen, you know, it's, it's a five person city council, except it wasn't when we, you guys selected John Cotty. That was only a two person city council, as I recall. Uh, so, I mean, look, every, you know, everything is, you know, everybody, we use a lot of words and we say a lot of stuff and we make it sound like we're on the, you know, the right side of history here. I think everybody's trying. All right. I, look, we, we had a good city council meeting tonight. Not Mikey, what do you think? Right. I mean, we got through a bunch of stuff. Uh, once we got past the, the, the starting gate there and got through that, I think we're reasonably effective in getting things done. So it can be done. And we've got a group of people that can do it. All right. Uh, we got to learn how to work together. And I think we're making progress in that direction. It's not going to, like I said, in my opening speech, the first couple of months, the ride's going to be a little bit bumpy. We got to get through that and get to the point where we're all moving in the same direction. So I hope we can do that. That's it. Bruce, up back to you. Well, Paul wants to go. He, I'll, I'll defer. I'll wait. You're, you're on mute, Paul. I've been on the receiving end of some of your lovely things in the social media. And once again, I'm going to remind you that AB 992 doesn't allow us to communicate on social media because we're still subject to the Brown Act there. And just as the Brown Act doesn't let us do that, that probably is the reason nobody was able to respond to number 11, where you wanted to demand that you and Steve be included in any conversation or writing with other council people because that's automatically three people and that's not during a city council meeting. It's not during a publicly held meeting. So that's, that's an excellent reason why that could not be complied with. The other thing I want to say to you is that you've, you've gone in with the, a very poor plan to, to accomplish things. I've been in Malibu for a long time and I've walked into the offices and filled out requests and handed them in and gotten what I needed, old plans, things like that. I paid whatever fees that were requested in private life and gotten the stuff. It doesn't come right away, it comes when it comes. But the other thing is that now that I'm a council person, I can call up and ask about stuff. And Reva has always been nice about getting on the phone and saying yes, or I can, for instance, when we we're talking about the warrants, I called her up with a list of about 20 of those things. And I said, you know, I'm a little puzzled by this. Can you give me a little background on this? And she was able off the top of her head to explain what those people had in common and where the money was coming from. And it was actually a refund to them for money that had been put up ahead of time, which included Scott Dietrich, by the way. And, you know, it all made sense. And then I asked about some other things. She had answers for it. There's no need to do a formal request for information unless you have a conversation with somebody and you don't get it. And, and your refusal to talk to her on the phone is not a good way to utilize the resources that the city has to offer you to help you become a better council person. You can't, you can't do it totally in writing all the time. You'll end up with a lot less useful information because conversations have a tendency to flow into adjoining areas. So, this is a team sport. This is not litigation. Thank you. Yeah, Bruce, of course. Okay, so first of all, pa Pamela, thank you for your remarks. I really, really appreciate them. And, and I know they came from a, a good place. And, and Mikey, you know, with the exception of the fact that you would have thought that I would have written that, <laughs> I appreciate what you had to say too. But, you know, I, I think that's, that's exactly the rub in what, what Paul just said. We're supposed to be a team. You don't trust me for a minute, okay? And that's a real problem. It goes back to what I said before about polarization 
And no matter what someone says, it gets taken the wrong way, or no matter what someone says, it's, it's gold. Okay? Um, you know, it's interesting. People keep talking about the vitriol. I hear the vitriol in certain people's voices. It's, it's it, the people that claim vitriol, usually the ones that have vitriol. And I feel like I'm living in a bizarro world here. I really do. Because First of all, Karen, I'm sorry. I, oh, first of all, I'll say the city council policies say we're not supposed to talk to each other. We're supposed to be addressing an issue. But every one of you is talking to me and telling me what I should be doing. So since we're there, I guess we'll just continue that for now. That's not the way we're supposed to be engaging. But Karen, full respect, you don't know what you're talking about. You do not understand what you're talking about, OK? As a private citizen, and that is the, I, I, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, sort of back up. Not a single one of you, except for Reva Feldman, has seen all of the correspondence going back to the very first piece of correspondence. Not a single one of you has done that. The statements that Karen made repeatedly, from what I have seen, you haven't seen it all. And because you haven't seen it all, you shouldn't be making judgments. That's it. That's an important rule is you get the whole picture before forming judgment. If you were to go back to the very beginning and see what I was saying and what I was asking for and the tone, you would understand why the tone has changed. Because I started off asking for a legitimate thing. I'm still asking for legitimate things. But I started off asking nicely, asking for some things. And I was stonewalled and given non-responsive answers repeatedly. You can look at that email about how the city council policies changed about the Zoom calls. You'll see exactly the type of thing I'm talking about. This report, the 6A report, is filled with misstatements and misrepresentations about what the facts are. And I'm going to come to a few of them as by way of example. I, have, I could go through... Chapter and verse, but I'll give you some examples. But the requests I made originally, before I ever became a city council member, were California Public Record Act requests. Now, anybody in Malibu has the right to make them. And I was told by a number of people I shouldn't make them. I should get proxies to make them. I'm not going to do that. That's dishonest. It may not be technically wrong, but it's dishonest. It's not integrity. So I made the request that I made under the California Public Records Act. And let's go back to what I started asking for. I wanted to see, because I was interested to understand what the city manager does on a daily basis, I asked to see her emails, what comes in, what goes out. And I said, I'd like to see them going forward, not just for the last week or two. I'd like to see them going forward. And I was told, you can't have them going forward. You can only have them through the day you made your request. So, OK, then I'm going to have to make a request every week, I guess. So I got the first download. And the emails received were 90%, maybe 95% junk mail. So the next time I requested, I said, don't give me the junk mail. I'm not looking for that. I, I, I went through specific examples of what I wasn't looking for. So just give me emails that are directed specifically to the city manager. I want to understand what kind of information she gets, what kind of requests she gets, what kind of work she's doing. And give me the emails she sends back, her emails. Now, I then started separating the requests into ones going in and ones going out, because I'm actually more interested in the ones going out. Ones going out were few and far between. City manager doesn't do much work in writing. And as I say in the paper I wrote that I sent you, and I, and I mean this, this, isn't, this is not hyperbole, okay? I've looked at the email accounts of hundreds of executives in large corporations, and I've never seen email accounts this dearth, maybe I'm not sure if dearth is the right word, this few correspondence in them other than where I have been looking at the email accounts of people who ended up being found liable for breaches of fiduciary duty. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but it's very troubling to me because I'm trying to understand what the city manager does, and I'm not seeing it. 
Now, in response to the Public Records Act request, which anybody can make, and you don't need to be a city council member, and I don't need the authorization of four other city council members to make them. In response to those requests, I would get a bunch of, as Ryan Embry said before, legal objections to privilege and um, deliberative privilege. So that was what I said, okay, now I'm a city council member. I would like to see what it is the public doesn't get to see. That's pretty much the only thing I've asked for with the exception of some other miscellaneous requests. The predominant requests I've made have been as a city council member now, I'd like to see what I couldn't see as a member of the public. And that turns out there's almost nothing different. I don't know, and, and it also turns out that much of what I saw, and I wanted to understand why the public doesn't get these things, much of what I saw is not deliberative privilege, hardly any of it's legal privilege. I don't understand what the basis is for the city withholding it at all. Now, oh, and I want, I want to just, the lawyer in the crowd, Mr. Bowdy, vendetta, trying to get her to quit, hostile, gender bullying. You know, you can use those words all you want. And again, if someone were to read all the correspondence from beginning to end and not cherry pick it, you'll see that's not the case. I'm going to pause for a moment. This is item 7F, but it has bearing on this. So I'll say, I, we, we all received an email at 4.04 this afternoon from Walter Zellman. I met Mr. Walt Zellman one time for five minutes in the past couple months when I was campaigning. Very brief at a distance with a mask. He wrote, I'm writing to support the proposal to improve transparency and accountability in Malibu city government. I have a good deal of experience with such measures. For 12 years, I served as an executive director of California Common Cause, a public interest group that worked on issues of ethics, open government and campaign finance in the nation, California and some local governments, including Los Angeles. I've seen, reviewed, and in some cases, been a co-author of similar measures, including those approved in the state of California and the city of Los Angeles. While I've not yet had the opportunity to review all aspects of this measure in detail, it strikes me as one of the strongest of transparency and ethics proposals I have seen. And in these cases, stronger is usually better. Most measures of this nature, while introduced by individual elected officials, are widely opposed by other elected officials and approved only after major efforts by citizen groups and the media. Now, this report, which is filled with lies, I'm just going to go over one or two of them. And I'll skip first to the end. There's a statement in here in this, city, in this council agenda report prepared by the city manager that says, second to the last sentence of the penultimate paragraph, Council Member Silverstein has refused to come to City Hall to review records that are provided to him and that are to review records that are not provided to him digitally. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I start again. Council Member Silverstein has refused to come to City Hall to review records that are not available digitally and is instead demanding that the city scan every document and provide it to him digitally. So this is the information you have that you're going by unless you've actually looked at the emails, the actual correspondence. And I'm sorry, I know it's late, but I'm going to go through the ones that deal with that specific question, because that is a misrepresentation, an abject misrepresentation. Couldn't be clearer, okay? So let's look at what was actually said, not what the city manager characterizes it. The answer there is, When I was first informed of the material being available to be reviewed at City Hall, I responded as follows. Were it not for COVID-19, I would be there today with bells on. As you know, and as Reva knows, this is an email to Heather. I am doing my level best to shelter in place as recommended, if not ordered by health officials. I've even stopped going to the grocery store and I'm now using curbside pickup as the pandemic continues to swell out of control. Because, and I keep being asked to come to City Hall. To me, that's absurd. Because of the pandemic, which appropriately has permitted and or directed the city's employees to work from home, I request that I receive the materials collected for my review at my home. If you want to avoid copying charges, I can be trusted with original documents. If, however, Reva prefers to maintain all originals at City Hall, which is a reasonable and prudent approach, 
I request that copies be made for me, which I will be pleased to return after I review them so that they can be available to other members of the City Council if multiple copies are not made at this time, and or the public to the extent they are not exempt from CPRA review. Now, yes, there I asked for the documents to be copied, but I'm going to continue. Once the, and I, also, I finished, once the pandemic is under control, I'll be pleased to visit City Hall to conduct this sort of review to facilitate the performance of my responsibilities as a member of City Council. Now, Heather responded, quote, we do not have the resources to duplicate these records and we do not allow original documents offsite. My response, given the limitations, please keep the material and any other material that is added in the days to come in a safe place. I will make arrangements to come to City Hall over the coming week to review the material. That's my demand, according to the city manager, that every document be electronically reproduced. I'm going to continue that, but I also want to go back a minute to the 5,000 documents. Remember I said, don't give me the junk mail? At the last minute, a week ago, the city manager directed the city clerk to give me all the junk mail. She said she was doing it to get me the documents sooner than later, which I'm going to tell you in a moment or two, I had said, don't bother doing, take your time. That was an obvious effort to lard up a production to make it look like I'm being unreasonable and asking for thousands of pages of documents. The actual documents responsive to my requests are less than 1,000. They're probably a very few hundred. Now, on the 24th of December, I sent the city clerk an email wishing her a Merry Christmas, and I included the following. I hope that you and other members of the city staff enjoy the holiday. I'm not expecting any work to be done on my requests while you do so. After the holidays are concluded, I'm hopeful that I will be receiving the information I've requested, which I need to satisfy, satisfy my responsibilities as a member of the city council. And every request I've made, I'm gonna go back and say also, stated, if this poses a problem for you, talk to me and we'll find an efficient way to do it. No one has ever spoken to me to try to find an efficient way to do anything. On December 31st, I wrote again to the city clerk and the assistant city clerk, wishing them a happy new year. I included the following. I know I have said this before, but I also know that praise cannot be provided too much. The two of you are a treasure to the city of Malibu and your presence and work do not go unnoticed and are appreciated. I know that much of your work is thankless, so I believe it's important to provide thanks when thanks are due. I know that my election to the city council has come with some turmoil, perhaps that puts it too mildly, and that burdens have fallen on you to address my many information requests. I not only appreciate the courteous and professional manner you have handled that burden, but I assure you that it will con not continue indefinitely I have a steep learning curve. I'm seeking to climb to satisfy my obligations and responsibilities and an elected, as an elected representative. And I made many commitments to the residents who voted for me to seek the information I'm seeking and press for appropriate action, if any, after learning what needs to be learned. I both hope and trust that you understand that and I apologize for any added burden this has placed on you as public employees. I am confident that the hard work we are all putting in now will lessen the long-term burden and pay dividends down the line. With hope, COVID-19 will begin to fade in the rearview mirror in the months to come, and we will be able to return to some semblance of a normal life. By the way, this is how I speak to somebody who speaks respectfully to me. On January 4, after the city manager instructed the city clerk to make a document dump, I wrote the following. I pre to, this is to the city manager. I previously told Heather that the city could take as long as it needs to make production of the material I've requested pursuant to the California Public Records Act. There is no need to produce hundreds if not thousands of documents I did not request, especially if your purpose is to try to falsely demonstrate that my requests are overbroad. Please direct the city staff to take as much time as it needs to produce the materials I've requested pursuant to the CPRA and only that material and promptly produce the information I have requested pursuant to city council policy number eight which is hundreds of pages at most, which is the one thing the city manager won't let me have. Now, one of the things I asked for was telephone logs. And the reason I asked for that is because telephone logs will not be provided under the CPRA. And I asked for telephone logs because they are very revealing. 
They will show how long conversations occurred, with whom they occurred, when they occurred. I'm not suggesting anything will be wrong with that, but it'll show me that because there's nothing in writing. Now, the city manager said, I'm not giving you my telephone lives. You cannot have them. What I will do is I'll give you my time sheets for the last couple of weeks since you've been elected. The city attorney told the city manager, I'm entitled to the information I've requested. And the city manager's response a week later was, I am not giving you my phone logs. Those phone logs don't take any time to collect. They're not a burden on the staff. They're just something the city manager doesn't want me to have. Now, I am hopeful that when I see these things, it will be meaningless. I'll look them over. I'll figure out what they say or do what they say, and it'll be a it'll be ho hum. Maybe it won't be. Again, when someone puts in so much effort to avoid scrutiny, it makes me suspicious, and I think it makes the residents suspicious. I, now, I think I, I think we get it, Bruce. I, I, I think are, there's now, two sides to this story. There, is no, there aren't. Okay? Yeah, there are because what you post. And you're and and we've had this talk, you and well, I, I on the can phone. I finish? And then you can I finish. Um, I, I know I'm taking long I'm finish. I am one hundred percent entitled to put under the first We're not amendment. talking about transparency. We're talking about the amount of time. And tr that's transparency is another issue. I'm I'm all for transparency. Okay. We're talking about I mean, the impact on staff is greater than you think. And Mikey, especially because of, of the things that you're putting out in social media. I, and I, we're just trying to find the balance here to move forward successfully. Okay. I, like I said to you before, you come across more intense than I think you think you do. No, and I know I come across intense. And, and I am, it, right now I am intense. And, that's, and that worries me because it has the impact to many people of feeling harassing. And I don't think that's your intent. It's not my problem. It's not right now. I, what I do on social media is complete. I don't ask for any documents through social media. I don't put any burden on the staff through social media. What I do on social media is actually none of the staff's business. I'm and not, I'm not saying it is. Staff. We're talking about the city manager. But I just read to you in writing repeatedly, day after day, take your time. And if it's too much work, talk to me and we'll figure it out. And then you say, you don't understand how much work you're making them do. No, they don't understand how much work they're making them do. I'm not asking for that work. I'm asking for a lot less. I'm asking for cooperation. The cooperation has been abjectly refused, not by the staff, by the city manager. And the reason the burdens become greater is because once you escalate like she's doing, I have to escalate in response to get what I'm entitled to. And I am entitled, and you are entitled, and Steve is entitled, and Paul's entitled, and Karen's entitled to understand. So if we all asked for this, we, the city would be and is, it's paralyzed. And that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about documents. We're talking about finding a pace here. I mean, city councilors are given an hour of staff time. You're, you, are you telling me you're asking for an hour of staff time? That's simply not not how it comes across well, and, and we have so many priorities to get to we'll get to the transparency part oh no, no i suggest you go back and read the whole chain of correspondence from the day it began until yesterday because you're acting on partial knowledge and i am happy to go through every single one of them from beginning to end my request the response the next response i'll read every one i'll go through every one and i will defend every one of them, because I don't think they're inappropriate. Are you willing to supply them to us? Mikey? Absolutely. But if I am allowed to ask, ask, ask John Cotty. And I want to say it is not correct that every city council member cannot be at a room where the city manager relates information. The Brown Act explicitly does not prohibit the giving of information by the staff to more than two city council members at the same time. You are wrong about that. It prohibits us expressing our views. It does not prohibit us getting the information. And there's also no reason for any information to be given to any of us that isn't city business. So since it's city business, if it were in writing, 
the public would be entitled to it under the California Public Records Act. But if it's done orally, that is evaded and avoided. And that is part of transparency. That's why this is all becoming so bogged down, because there's a desire to keep things secretive and away from the public. I don't see it that way, but I, I hear your point. Steve had his hand up first. Mikey, when, when you did your opening comments, okay, the, the thrust of those were to say, we've got to have a pace because we've, we've got to make sure that we're not doing stuff which is just burying people in City Hall. I, I think that was where you were going with that. Listening to what Bruce just said, it appears that he has taken, made an attempt to do exactly what you asked for. Now, I don't, I've not known Bruce a very long time. I mean, I knew we start, but I've never known him to lie. I've never known him to make stuff up. I think some things are perspective. When I call up Reva to discuss what's going on in the day and she says she's gotten, you know, email after email and it's just, it's hard to get her work done. I worry about that. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I, I had that conversation with her. I'm, I, and I thought the, the 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 path you were going down would have would be a solution to that. It says you're going to ask for something as long as Bruce is specific in what he's asking for, and it isn't asking for five thousand documents a day, uh, and he's giving the city staff time to pull those things together. He's got a right to get the documents. It just seems to me. That I that, don't that, disagree. I'm hoping to just, be. I'm not, nothing about the documents. I'm just hoping to find a pace where we can get work done. Too. I thought that's, that's what he just gave you. I thought that's what he did. Yeah. Uh, he did over the holidays. I think it was a bit paraphrased from what I understand. So. No, I, again, read everything. And, and, you know, all those things that Karen ticked off that haven't been done, they're all before this election. That has nothing to do with anything that I've requested. And the other he, thing is. <laughs> Lots of other people have requested lots of things, including whoever that person was that requested about what you read, which I never heard about. But I think the city manager says there's 100 or more requests a month or 50 to 100 requests a month. I've made 30 of them. And I'm telling you, 14 or 15 or 20, whatever, they're the exact same request that I just had to make a couple times a week or every other week because I was told you can't have a continuing request for email. And by the way, that could be satisfied so easily by just copying me on each email as it goes in and as it goes out it would take a second. And, and what and I think what's hard is it comes across as harassing because of your other actions. And you say you don't mean it that way, but your other words and, and, and writings show different. Okay. So are you telling me, do you think I'm, or do you think I'm lying? I think I don't know that we share perspectives. Do you think I'm lying? I don't know. I don't know if you're lying. I don't, maybe, maybe I'm not so sure if you think you're lying. And, but I don't, I think we've discussed before, you come across at times very intense and, and you admitted that. And I think that feeds into this with a lot of requests that feel like, that feel like you're just digging for stuff, whatever it is that, I mean, I mean, honestly, I, I don't I say it's not your right to have it, but no one's ever requested it, never requested it in this kind of volume. Look, Mikey, I genuinely would, would prefer to get along with you and with everyone else. I truly would. That would Me be too. my preference. Me too. And, 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 I know, and, I hear, and I hear you say that every time. But I'm telling you, I don't believe you think, I, I, I will call you on this. I don't believe you think I'm being honest. You wrote to me, you wrote to other people, you said you don't trust me. You've said that in writing multiple times. If I trusted and, you, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. That's exactly right. What's happening is the result of a lack of trust, not as a result of anything I'm actually substantively doing. And that is wrong. I disagree. I disagree. You're, you know, I, and I want to get an argument with you. I want to move forward, but you know, I, you, you don't see us on, on social media attacking you. And it's the other way around. It doesn't, it's not a good look and it's not necessary and it's not doing the city any good or the citizens in getting things done. It has no bearing on substantive issues whatsoever. I disagree. Um, 
Paul had That's his hand up first. I'd like Karen go first. Karen. Thank you. Bruce, would you appreciate it if one of us called you a fascist on social media? Would you take that as a compliment? You don't have to answer. I'm guessing that you wouldn't. I have been. By me, by Mikey, by Paul? No. By Steve? No. But I've been, I've been, I've been called that, and I've been called worse. You said it, not me. Okay. I just want you to know the list of things that I that I ticked off that have been taken off the work plan because the council voted to reprioritize, and you said that happened before you got on the council. I would hope you understand. This city exists before you got on the council. And I didn't know that. Excuse me? I said, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Well, now you do. We have a work plan. Yes. And it does not coincide with the election. And we reprioritize the work plan for the biggest disaster in the history of LA County. And now on top of that, we and everybody else are dealing with this pandemic which is grinding everything down, the county, the state, the federal government, okay? Everybody's impacted, I know you know that. But we have got, our work is getting farther and farther behind by the day. And this meeting is a perfect example. We went for over four hours to get through consent and that was only because we agreed to continue two of the consent items. And here we are now at 1230, excuse me, 1229. We've been meeting for six hours. And really, the most substantive items on this agenda, we have yet to touch. I've only been on the council two years, but that has not happened since I've been elected. I've been watching council meetings for decades. I've never seen anything like this. So this is an example of how much impact you are having. We can't get through an agenda. Someone asked if we could meet again in two nights. I think you know we can't because even if we were physically up to it, we can't meet the noticing requirement. So. What does that mean? We're going to get farther and farther and farther behind with each day. How's that supposed to work? Okay, I'm going to stop there. Paul? My complaints are similar to Karen's. I think I think one of the things that I was hoping to cover today with, with the, my first thing about requiring not only the council people who are already supposed to, according to the policy, treat each other with respect and, and kindness, but have that same requirement for the various commissions as well. And that's because I've seen commissions run off into the weeds like this one did, to, like the council did tonight, because somebody decides that they don't actually want to accomplish anything and they'd rather wander around in circles for a couple of three hours and not get through the agenda. And I, I feel like that's nothing that, that I'm hoping to be a part of. I, I tend to not speak much unless I have something to say that's positive and constructive. And if I don't like something, I, I, I just, I vote against it. And you know, I'm looking forward to reaching an understanding that we're all here and we all need to work together to accomplish what we've got to accomplish. And as far as the things that were set aside by the previous council, they were set aside because we didn't have them. We, we needed the money for something else. And then when we also had reduced the staff because we didn't know what was going to happen to our income. And so when Craig called it a windfall, uh, that we had $3 million more than we, we thought we were going to have, 
I, I, I was, I was offended by that. I mean, the city did a really good job of managing the problem. And, you know, plus we had a million dollars extra of traffic tickets because people drive like idiots out here this last summer. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we have a city staff that has, has reduced hours, has done everything they can to try and keep the city financially capable and moving forward. And I'd like to not blow it off and decide I'm gonna waste $3 million on, on fighting amongst ourselves. As you look around the, the, uh, the names on here, there's quite a few staffers who are still here. These people are all being paid to, to listen to this. And it's, it's not helpful to our budget to continue to pay people to, to watch us not be productive. And I would urge you to think about being productive. So I'm glad that everyone can mind read and know what my motives are because you're wrong. I would have much rather been productive tonight. I would have much rather done the four items at the end of the agenda, which are substantive and which, by the way, and which Steve and I spent a lot of time putting together as, as and I assume other people have too. And which would, and it's constantly being said, we, we're, we're getting bogged down doing only this transparency stuff. Whether you like it or not, I, I don't mean that in a, a way, whether you're gonna like what's being presented or not, we spent a lot of time putting together a very substantive effort to help the public safety through, a, through an ordinance. And there could have been a very healthy discussion about that, but instead, we're being forced to talk about my document requests and we're being forced to talk about them based on a false light. Now, the warrant issue could have been nothing, could have been a nothing. Again, if I had gotten the information before the meeting. Now, if this were approved, if this one hour thing were approved, I wouldn't even be able to speak, forget the recording, speak to the city manager for an hour to get information about the warrant, because that would be it. That would be the limit. That I can't. I can't even have. I can't have more than that. I'm now. I now exhausted my allotment. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. That that's actually not what that is. But uh, Karen, has anybody ever wondered of oh, all the previous councils? and this council have been able to get any business done sticking to the one hour rule on things that are not on the work plan? How was that ever possible in the past? It's been almost 30 years. I don't know what rule you're talking about. I think you do, Bruce. I think no, you no, I, I, no, no, Karen, I, I'm not being facetious. I do not know what rule you're talking about. Well, you can look it up later, but I'd like to make a motion and my motion is that staff may spend one hour per week per council member request on something that's not on the work plan. And that means staff as a whole. Uh, I think actually Paul had his hand up. I'll second it. Okay, uh, Steve had his hand up. You know, we better think real hard about what we're doing here, all right? We started this conversation off, and Mikey, you started it off, mm -hmm. where the process that says you're allowed to get whatever you want, all right? We just got to do it at such a pace that we're not slowing down the whole train to make that happen. Now, we heard from Paul, I mean, from, from Bruce, who provided us information that says that, in fact, is what he's been trying to do, all right? Now, from there, we went off on different tangents. People call, you know, look, nobody up here, well, I mean, let me take it back. I've been called names ever since I've been in Malibu. I got Paul Grisanti, okay, who has said, it's apparent that we have three extremely dysfunctional planning commissioners. And that's, that's one of pages of stuff he wrote in Malibu Times. I got Arnold York 
who's been dumping on me since I, I moved into the city, okay, that recently had to put a retraction in his newspapers because he got caught lying about stuff. We, look, that's not, makes no difference. The real question we have is, does Bruce have the right to get the documents? Can we come up with a plan that will allow him to get it without slowing down the whole train? That's what that's what we started off. And all of a sudden, we're all over the place on that. So I let, agree with you, Steve. I so agree let's with you. Back and focus on that. And if we can't figure it out tonight, maybe we got to come back and do it again. But limiting the stuff to one hour is sending a very, very bad message to the community. You know, limiting, that, limiting what to an hour? Limiting any request to an hour. Bruce couldn't have got his damn whatever, six, whatever, seven D, whatever item he wrote up. He couldn't get that done in an hour. All right. So, I mean, who's going to call the hour? It's on the work plan. Who's going to call the hour? Yeah, homelessness is on the work plan, by the way. Um, no, 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 I'm talking about his his thing about you. you what are the first one he had there? Uh, can, can I just make one small point? Look, I, I'm not playing a game. I really am not. But if you adopt a rule that says you can't get anything that takes more than an hour, as as Lynn Norton, I think it was, said earlier, if I wanted to use someone else, but I do it myself. I, and I'm not going to do this, but I could make public record requests for all kinds of stuff, and, and you have to satisfy that. California law mandates it, okay? And then I could say, it'll take two minutes. Give me what you didn't produce pursuant to the California public records request. Since you have it, you already, you already had to review it to decide what not to produce. It would take a second to then give me the rest of it. That's the kind of thing that's going on here. This hour limitation is something I could drive a truck through if I want to. And if you want to be act in bad faith, and I think it would be bad faith to create a rule like that, I'll just respond in kind. Okay, well, that's a, that's a threat. Um, <laughs> yes, Steve. Reva, do you have any suggestions on how we can solve this so that Bruce can get the materials that he needs, okay? And and not stop the train. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, and and if 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 Bruce is limiting his request as he says he is, okay. And if we, we just respond as specifically as we can to those requests, will that not make your life easier or the staff's life easier? Or do we need another piece on top of that to make this thing work? Okay. Can I say something since? All of you seem to have just disregarded the, the raising of the hand to speak. Sorry about that. I raised my hand. Uh, yeah, I, I might not have gone in the order. Sorry. Go ahead, Karen. At a certain point, what's left? How many more documents are there to produce? You seem to be creating a situation, Bruce, that is unsatisfiable. So I don't know when and where your requests will have been satisfied, if ever. That's why I'm suggesting one hour, because so much has happened already, what's left? Can we please, please get back to the business of the city? Again, tonight is a perfect example. We're not getting things done. And again, how did all previous city councils manage without these voluminous records requests? Again, I will call them fishing expeditions. I'm begging you to please get back to the business of the city that you profess to care about. Okay, so I'm sorry, Reva, I interrupted the answer you were going to give you remember it at this point now that it's getting close to 1 a.m and we still have six agenda items that we're not going to get to i don't think um, we did have a motion on the floor mayor i don't know if you you want me to answer you want to continue with the motion but um i think you know what what uh karen has suggested is a reasonable start i am completely bogged down not only in um, the public records uh 
Act request, which of course we are mandated to comply with and we are doing so, um, but they take a lot of time. Um, for example, one of the requests that uh, Bruce made was for everything I have done for the past two years. Um, and that took probably about seven hours of my time to go through. And um, I had to have staff also assist me with it because I just couldn't uh, uh, complete it. Um, so, you know, there are just things that just do take a lot of time to, to look for. I'm happy to produce any document anytime. I have absolutely nothing to hide, but I do work at the direction of the city council. And so when one council member asks me for things that the council hasn't authorized or directed me to do, um, I will always say no. And I, I know you've all heard me say that, uh, Mikey and Karen, uh, uh, to you on, on other items. So uh, producing my phone records, unless the council asks me to do that, I, I don't feel that that's something that's appropriate to, to provide. Um, but I think if we could start with the one hour uh, per council member per week uh, for items not on the work plan, that would be a good start. And if we feel that that's not working, we can always revisit it. Okay. So, so does, does that mean if we adopted that rule and tomorrow I said, okay, the only thing I want this week is the phone records, which take 10 minutes to get me. I'm not going to get Bruce, I'm not going to be producing my phone records right. unless the council as a whole directs me to turn that over to you. There's no need for you to have my phone records. Okay. If you'd like to know what I do, you're welcome to meet with me or speak with me. I will not be recorded, but I'm more than happy to spend time with you and explain to you what I do and what the city manager's role is. City council members, with all due respect, the city manager doesn't get to make that decision. Ask um, the lawyer. I would have to get advice of a lawyer, absolutely. Well, he, already, he already wrote to her and told her that was not the way it works. Well, we can discuss that later. Um, Karen? Karen? Has anyone ever wondered how any of us managed to get any business done on behalf of the city? And I'm proud of the work that I've done on behalf of the city. Has anybody ever wondered how we managed to do it without requiring discussions to be recorded, without requiring all these records, without requiring. No, lots of people, lots of people understand how it gets done and lots of people want more transparency to understand how it gets done. I wasn't asking you, Bruce, specifically. Listen, we already have a policy in effect that each counselor gets an hour of staff time a week. Um, or for not, I'm sorry, for non work plan items. Um, I mean, I, I think the idea is to try and get the city's business done. I understand you want these records. I, I don't care. I don't think there's anything to hide. I'm not worried about it, but I am worried about the workflow and that's all. I'd like to restate my motion. Okay. Go ahead. Just as I said before, that staff may work one hour per week, and that is staff total, not each staff member, one hour per week on any council member's request for something that's not on the work plan. It's worked for me for two years. I don't know why it wouldn't work for others. And I thought that was already a policy, so. Uh, maybe I'm uninformed if it's not. Well, that's what I said. It is a policy. Bruce hadn't been familiar with it. Maybe you will be later. Maybe you don't understand the policy. What's your inter what, what, what's, what do you see different about it? It's, we're talking about policy number eight, correct? You tell me. You're the one who says I don't well, understand. Well, there's, there's no policy that says what Karen keeps describing, but there's policy number eight, which I think she's confusing for what she's saying. I made a motion and we had a second. So basically, Karen is making Paul Grisanti's 7E motion now in the guise of 6A, and I object to that procedurally. I don't think I follow you on that. So you 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 just want to have free reign to take as much staff time as possible for stuff outside the work plan. Is that a yes or a no? No. Okay. That doesn't quite jive with what seems to be going on. 
I mean, and it's hard to believe that you're, here's why I don't trust you at times. It's hard to believe you're authentic when you're continually attacking um, the city manager and everyone knows it and everyone sees it. So it's, it's hard not to think that you're, it's hard to think you have these pure motives that you keep saying. I mean, I want to trust you, but the actions and the words don't seem to go together. I don't, I don't know how I could be more clear. I believe the city manager is deceitful, duplicitous, and unethical. I formed that view after analyzing what's been going on for the past two months, reading documents, and assessing the responses to my requests. It also involves some things about the um, Bell lot. Got That's my personal view. I'm entitled to that view. You don't agree with me. That's fine. We can, we can agree to disagree. I get that. I have no problem with that. And I also know that that's not a cause for removal. And I also understand that it's not going to, that, that the three, that Paul, Karen, and Mikey are not going to vote for removal. That's fine. I get that. And I'm content to accept that. Okay. I don't have anything up my sleeve. I genuinely am trying to understand as much as I can about how business gets done in this city so that I can be a productive member of this council. I'm not, I don't have a hidden agenda. I'm not lying to you. If you can't accept that, I, there's nothing I can do to change your mind. This is where we go back to where you stopped talking to me a few weeks ago. But I'm telling you honestly, and I've been straightforward about everything I've done. That's, that's what's going on here. I stopped talking to you because you kept attacking me on social media after we talked and I was, what was the point? Okay. I mean, it, who wants to do that? What kind of relationship was that, Bruce? You know, I have, and you know, in I, the legal world and in the legislative world, which I have been involved in in the past, I have seen people who are absolute enemies outside the courtroom or outside the legislative room, and they put that aside and they get the work done. And they I'm willing to, I'm willing to do the that here. Animosity that's outside infect their decisions inside. And I'm capable of doing that. I'm capable of making rational decisions as a city council member, separate and apart from however I might think of other people outside this realm. Apparently, that's an issue for others. And I'm sorry that's the case, but you know, that's just the way life is. John, I have a question. Is uh, passing a policy on one hour of staff time per week for items not on the uh, work plan is that a permissible motion to pass? Yes, it is. The city council as a body directs the use of staff's resources. I don't see a problem with that type of motion. Okay. I would note, however, that the discussion is waving beyond the Brown Act's requirement for this specific item. We're, we're moving beyond issues that relate to this specific agenda item. Um, I, I don't see a problem with the motion and the city council is always uh, has the ability to prioritize staff resources. Okay. So just, then I'm going to ask for a roll call. I just have a, a question of the John. So are you, you're saying that the city council can adopt a policy in response to a agenda item that says direction? They can direct the use of city resources. It's not necessarily a policy. It's direction to city staff to spend no more than an hour on items, not on the work plan. I'd like to call for roll call, please. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. No. Councilmember Uring. No. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're not going to get to some items that are very important. I I think we should stick with some of the combining that we did before. I do believe that 7E is, is incredibly large. I think we should discuss that. And I think we should break it down into priorities because I think there's multiple, I mean, we, I think it's a lot of hours to go through it all. And I would suggest Bruce that we, uh, to me, and I'll, I'll, we can talk offline about this, but I would uh, say that uh, the investigation should be probably a high priority to get going. Um, that's, but we can talk about that uh, as we get ready to re-agendize. 
Yes, Bruce. Okay, so two things. First of all, I, I, I would be in support if we can do it within a couple moments of approving a special meeting that you would ask for, because to me, that's a no brainer. I don't know if we can do that or not at this point. The other thing I'll say is I, I understand, Mike, I'd love to have conversations with you about what you just said about how to formulate things for the next meeting. My understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, is that since Steve and I are co-sponsoring that, we can't talk. You and I can't mm. talk about it, full stop. I wish we could, but my understanding is legally we can't. Yeah, that's probably true. I think so that's Mikey, probably true. Um, yeah. Are you are you going to be moving on to item seven B, or did you want to continue the remainder of the items to another meeting? Yeah. Now we're Where we're done for the night. I do. I would agree with Bruce that we agree if we could do a vote on uh, scheduling a special meeting on homelessness. I think that's fantastic, and it, if we could roll in Bruce's uh, item, that should Mayor be a part of it. Pearson? I do want to just note that for 7C, there were eight speakers signed up if you do plan to hear that item. Oh, boy. And also, I'd just like to point out that um, we um, do not currently have an administration and finance subcommittee. We do have our mid-year budget coming back at the next uh, council meeting so that if we do not hear item 7B and uh, get an ANF committee uh, subcommittee, then we will have to bring the uh, mid-year budget forward without that review, which um, is solely up to you, but I did want to point that out. Yeah, I think it's late. I'm exhausted. I think it's time. I mean, I think it's hard, past time to make rational decisions at one in the morning. We city councils have discovered that for years. Um, Motion to adjourn. I will think say. we're there. Yep. Okay. So um, let's we're, just make sure that we're, are we continuing items or do you want to, what, what would you like? Yes, to? we're going to continue the items as I think we agendized. Um, to, to a date uncertain. Right. At this time. Okay. Why would they be continued to a date uncertain as opposed to the next meeting? Yeah, we should. They have to be at the next meeting, I would think. That's We're correct. Definitely. So we already have a, a very full agenda. I believe I have where's two appeals that have already been noticed for that meeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, again, it's it's one in the morning, so I don't want to, to misspeak about uh, our ability to add things to the agenda. Um, right. If you can uh, give me some time to look at that tomorrow, we'll figure out how to, to make it all happen. And if uh, we need to call a special council meeting, we'll, we'll reach out to each of you. Okay. okay. Uh, Paul? If we're going to do a special council meeting, can I suggest that we try something different and start at like three o'clock? And uh, perhaps we'll all be a bit fresher and mm -hmm. maybe we'll be able to send staff home at a decent hour. It's a good idea. The problem we've had with early meetings is we get a lot of complaints from people who are working. So it's, it's, there's no great answer. Maybe we could well, we're split all working it. from home now though. <laughs> Maybe we could split it and start a little earlier is what I would say. I would say three might be a little early for some people, but uh, it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea in general. Um, okay, well, obviously we've got a lot to figure out um, and we got, we may well need to do a special meeting. I can see that and, and uh, I apologize to everyone who stayed late to get to these items and I appreciate um, the public's involvement and um, and I thank you all counselors. Mayor, Mayor Pierce, we have a motion and a second on the motion to adjourn. Yes. Um, real quick, Mikey. Yes. I add in um, adjourning in memory of. Of Bill Conacher, yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for that. And are you ready for me to call the roll on that motion? Yes, thank you. Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries and you are adjourned. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Adios.